Good evening, good day, good morning, wherever you are. This is the second day of the grand jury investigation. This is a model proceeding which will take a very close look into the entire corona pandemic. How it started, the details of the PCR tests, but we will start today with a closer look at the uh, historical and at the geopolitical background. So let us start with our first expert, and that is uh, Matthew, it's not you, it's, um, it's Alex, Alex Thompson. Alex, please introduce yourself, and then we will go right into uh, uh, medias res, as the Latin speakers say. You're mute. You're muted. Thank you very much, Rainer. I am Alex Thompson, and for eight years I was an officer of Britain's Signal Intelligence Agency, GCHQ, the partner agency to NSA, and there I was a desk officer for the former Soviet Union and a transcriber out of languages including Russian and German of intercepted material, and in the latter half of that period I was also a member of GCHQ's cross-disciplinary team for chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear threats, CBRN, in which capacity I came to know something about how the Anglo-American intelligence and military establishment regards its state of dominance in knowledge uh, in all matters that can affect health on a mass scale and the potential for weaponization of such agents. Uh, but you've asked me to give uh, something like a 20 minute uh, summary of the geopolitical situation as it was in the world in the crucial period leading up to the post Second World War period, because most of the testimonies this evening, and I understand in subsequent uh, sessions of the grand jury, will concentrate much on the post-1945 world and that really being the uh, time when a lot of plans for uh, unification of world government began in anger, including the health issues that you are concerned with. And my contention is that the dominant power in the world, namely the City of London, the financial heart of the British Empire, uh, readied itself for that situation from roughly 1870 and that the modern world, the monopolization, the cartelization of the world begins in anger at that time. Uh, everything that we do, and by we I mean UK column news, uh, I am also joined this evening by Brian Gerrish, the joint editor who will testify later, Everything that we do in investigating the corruption emanating from uh, British Crown monopolies and City of London money uh, does seem to point back to this period from around 1870, in which, in a nutshell, there were several revolutions by the British elite, and they all revolved around containing productivity and preventing a growth of uh, intelligence and uh, intellectual property uh, among the native peoples of the British Empire and in competitor nations. So there was a revolution in what you might call mind space, which since 2010 has been an uh, explicit term used by the British government's central department, the cabinet office. A revolution in the quality of education offered to British and later other Western school children. A revolution in the theft of intellectual property by the elite. A revolution in the model of healthcare and free access to it. And at home, a constitutional revolution uh, from the classic British uh, liberal democracy model, which I know that the continent of Europe and its law schools have uh, explicitly copied from Britain, to a model in which there is close control of what happens in parliaments and in agencies under the control of governments uh, using the whipped party system. This all happened, as I say, around 1870, and at home in Britain, it was largely complete by the crucial year 1947-1948, when Britain had a unique, uh, other than Canada, a unique situation of a national health service, uh, and was pushing the way towards the military unification of the European continent and the whole of NATO, and in many other ways, including planning law and citizenship, was leading the world in reinventing how it managed its population. The centre node here is the City of London. That is the square mile uh, at the very heart of what is now called Greater London. 
why this is important is because the City of London and the Church of England are the only institutions that have endured every constitutional revolution in the British Isles with their privileges and their vast wealth intact. The City of London is distinct from other world metropolitan areas, uh, megalopolises, in that it chose to keep itself geographically small as the urban area around it grew. The City of London still has a legal status apart from the 32 under other London boroughs and does not really form part of Greater London as, uh, as such. Its privileges were entrenched as early as Magna Carta 1215. Its self-government has never been challenged. It has at many times in its history had power over the British crown and hence over a large slice of the earth during the British Empire, uh, notably during the civil wars of the mid 17th century, uh, when the city of London continued as the financial power rivaling the crown and even in some ways abolished the crown for a decade. And after the restoration of the crowns and ultimately the English Revolution, uh, just six years after that with the Dutch Dutch King William III coming to the crown of Great Britain, the Bank of England was set up in 1694 with a 12 and a half million pound uh, injection of cash into the crown uh, by these private shareholders, uh, which uh, we are reliably told forms the basis of all the debt which has been leveraged since to this day. And the current descendants of those shareholders and others entitled uh, to shares of the Bank of England are kept secret. Uh, the City of London also has control over the so-called Mother of Parliaments, the Westminster Parliament, notably in the form of an official of the City of London known as the Remembrancer, who sits in the House of Commons where not even the monarch is allowed to enter and records what is being said against financial interests. It's too complicated uh, to give a definition of the Crown in the British model. Uh, but what is important is that the cabinet office, uh, a, a department which was set up in the early 20th century, is the repository effectively of crown prerogatives. And so when people outside the United Kingdom think of the crown, uh, they often think excessively of the old situation with the monarch standing on the coronation oath and being responsible to the people. Uh, in practice, uh, in this period from around 1870, the constitutional revolution has ensured that financiers controlling political parties uh, actually pull the levers of crown prerogatives. Uh, behind the scenes, the model of government Britain still has, and which it has exported to the Commonwealth and the whole world, is that of an inner sanctum, the Privy Council, which actually governs in the name of the Crown, and it is only for show, as the main constitutional writers have admitted since the 1870s, only for show that Parliament and government departments are consulted as if there were a separation between executive, legislature and judiciary. At Privy Council level, this is not the case. Uh, in this crucial period about which we are speaking, the preeminent English constitutional writer Walter Bajho admitted this in the, 17th, in the second edition of his book, The English Constitution, written in 1873, just when the modern whipped party and behind them the think tank were coming into their own to establish the will of monopolists in the city of London. Walter Bajho wrote in one paragraph there about a distinction between the, quote, dignified parts of the government, that is, the parts that are there for show, uh, the crown uh, in its personal sense and the quote efficient parts in the sense of the working parts of the machine and he admits that the attractive parts do have a purpose but that is only to attract the force of national support to the really working parts behind the scenes. Now to simplify this as much as possible uh, what I think is important to point out is that uh, the uh, history uh, academic at Georgetown University, Carol Quigley, that's C-A-R-R-O-L-L -L -L Quigley, who was the tutor of Bill Clinton, among others, uh, uh, wrote quite frankly in his book, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, that there have been four industrial revolutions. Yes, that familiar language coming from the World Economic Forum uh, was being written about in the 1960s already by Quigley. And we will not understand this unless we see that the perspective which is being assumed here is that of who owns the population, first in Britain and then in the British Empire. In the first revolution, 
uh, the ownership of land, of agricultural means, uh, provides wealth. Then there is a mechanical industrial revolution, a second revolution, then one in which financial capital dominates the world. And it's from this period, period around 1870 onwards that the smart money in the city of London realises that even that bubble is going to burst and that the really important way to own the world in future will be to own the mines and the productivity and the thoughts of those uh, in the model to make to stop them running away uh, and becoming and out producing their bosses so the modern era of cartelization in both industry and geopolitics began around the year 1870 in the space of just a few years around that date the world underwent a fundamental shift from a situation in which the city of london and the british empire lacked any serious competition <clears throat> to a world in which several industrialised economies were able to outcompete Britain. The British Empire and its financial hub in the city of London had massively overextended themselves across Asia in the previous generation, especially with the Afghan wars and the Opium Wars in the 1840s and the Crimean War and the Indian Mutiny of the 1850s. One of the City of London's most powerful banks, HSBC, dates, in fact, from the time of the Chinese opium trade. Uh, there is quite a lot of criminality involved in the City of London's banks uh, in the outset. In Europe, the post-Napoleonic order imposed by Britain at the Congress of Vienna in 1815 had begun to crumble with both the successful and the failed socialist revolutions of 1848. Russia and Austria-Hungary were the Eastern European countries with the most powerful land armies at that time, and it was they who safeguarded Europe by restoring the crowned heads. Therefore, the obsession of British foreign policy from the midpoint of the 19th century, uh, and this is something I saw when I attended Chatham House meetings, the, the uh, supreme, the world's supreme geopolitical think tank in many ways, which tells the Foreign Office what to do. The obsession of British foreign policy from the midpoint of the 19th century was a new strategy, namely to ally with the arch rivals of the past, France and even the Ottoman Empire, against Britain's historic allies in Northern and Central Europe in order to prevent any future Russo-German alliance from becoming the world's dominant bloc. And a secondary strategy there was to prevent the meteoric rise of American intellectual productivity and democratization of invention, uh, and to try to capture that. As early as 1812, British troops invading Washington, D.C., notably spared the patent office because they knew that if they burnt that, they would be shooting themselves in the foot and stopping themselves from being able to continue to dominate American invention after the American Revolution. Now, in the years around 1860, under Bismarck, Garibaldi and Tsar Nikolai I, three major European nations which previously had been great only in cultural terms had suddenly become politically unified and economically modern states. And with the Großdeutschland, Kleindeutschland debate, there were serious indications that Germany might ally with Austria into a single Germany-speaking state. And it was obvious to the British elite that within a generation or two, all three of these countries, Germany, Italy and Russia, would become great powers at roughly the same level as Britain and France. The United States emerged from its civil war in 1865 and began a staggeringly rapid rise to industrial supremacy. Britain's elite correctly foresaw that by around 1900, all four of these new powers would begin to have navies as strong as France's or even as strong as Britain's, and foresaw that the land armies of these European powers would be far stronger than Britain's, so that only a previously unthinkable Franco-British alliance in the name of human rights and the spread of liberal democracy would be able to hold these powers in check. By 1880, the so-called scramble for Africa was in full swing, which allowed even territorially minor nations in Europe, such as Belgium and Portugal, to acquire substantial resources from colonization of the African interior and to become serious rivals to British industry and commerce. This was a severe embarrassment to the city of London because, for example, Portugal was Britain's oldest ally and Belgium was a state that owed its very existence to British negotiation in 1815. Serious arguments have been made by historians that the, well, the wave of assassinations in the Edwardian era, including that of the Portuguese royal family in 1908 and the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914, were engineered with secret City of London connivance. There was also an Asian country, 
that became a great power in both industrial and military terms at the end of the 19th century, namely Japan, which to the world's frank astonishment beat Russia in 1905, thereby giving many colonial populations in Africa and Asia the inspiration that there was no reason why they too could not assert themselves against European rule in the way that the Latin American republics already had against Spain. The following year, 1906, was the year of the naval race, the dreadnought crisis, which perhaps inevitably started the countdown to the Great War, the First World War, because both the British and the German elite were now determined to achieve Weltherrschaft, world domination. Both were rightly suspicious of each other's motives. Both were technically capable of achieving world domination, both industrially and in the mind space, and both had powerful blocks of allies for the first time. In a nutshell, the change brought about by the existential crisis of the mid to late 19th century was that the city of London's trading model, as described by Quigley, the successive waves of monopolies, uh, this model came to emphasize the importance of controlling not just military force or physical assets anymore, but the minds of people, now known as human resources, in the British Empire and further afield. And this is why science fiction starts speaking about ownership of man's genetic makeup from this time in order that the city of London could sell goods and increasingly services to the rest of the world, which would never catch up in the mind space. It is the consistent finding of UK column and of allied researchers and commentators that the city of London and Britain's very wealthy soft power institutions, the ones that Tony Blair even this month has once again told us we must keep and become world beating using, such as the British Council, the BBC, British Academia and the Church of England, that these institutions continue to regard that battle for the mind as their top priority for world domination and that they regard health as a subsector of that battle. We are also fully convinced from repeated findings that the British elite regard themselves with some justification as still the world's leading power in mind space. In other words, the city of London gets other nations to do its donkey work and its dirty work for it, and it does this above all by pulling off the trick of making its, its own population, Britain and the Commonwealth, and the elites of other nations assume its perspective and its narrative, rather than their own perspectives and narratives. This is the concentration that I had in my British elite education, and this is the concentration that the British intelligence agencies have had through both World Wars and the Cold War. It is not a formal strategy that is taught in boarding schools or universities or officer training or intelligence agencies, but it is very much the credo of the leading so-called bloodlines of elite families that run the city of London. And it is the modus operandi of the Anglo-American tax-exempt foundations and of the think tanks, such as Chatham House above all, which push the agendas of those bloodlines upon the Western governments. Uh, a key figure from the year 1870 is that uh, of John Ruskin, uh, seemingly an innocuous figure because he was the first professor of art at Oxford, uh, but he brought the doctrine that the uh, British elite really had a duty to export its own worldview to the rest of the world in very broad brush terms. And his key student whom he inspired was Cecil Rhodes, who of course became fabulously wealthy in Southern Africa. Cecil Rhodes, and this is all documented by very many historians, uh, wrote secret diaries and formed secret societies. In 1891, after 16 years planning, his main secret society was formed. The Rhodes Scholarships are part of that society. Um, Oxford members of the Rhodes Network were the likes of Lord Toynbee and Lord Milner, well-known geostrategists. In Cambridge, there was the future Foreign Secretary Lord Grey and Lord Isha. In London, there was the leading journalist of the time, W.T. Stead and initiates and members of the executive committee of Cecil Rhodes were the above-named men, plus Lord Rothschild. After Rhodes' death in 1902, other leading English bloodlines that repeatedly plagued a city of London history, such as the Astors, came into the same circle. The outer circle uh, to achieve the will of Cecil Rhodes, this uh, seemingly benign vision of Britain forcing the world to accept its liberal democracy and accept its way of, of viewing the world, the outer circle became known as the round table groups, still functioning in the United States and seven other countries set up from 1909 onwards. Uh, this group regarded the uh, success of the Canadian Federation 
1867 as its leading case study. You'll be hearing more about that from Matt Ayrett later. Canada was effectively politically unified and later the other white colonies, the white dominions, in order to prevent there being a spread of different views, uh, different uh, English-speaking democracies in the world. They must instead all be traced back to the city of London's control. And this is very contemporary too, because uh, among the many Rhodes scholars uh, of, uh, that dominate world politics and push the world towards globalism are the aforementioned Bill Clinton and from the World Economic Forum, uh, the New Zealand lady, uh, Professor Nairi Woods, who this year became very well known for her saying at the WEF that the elite can do beautiful things if they come together and if the people of the world simply accept that they are in the lead. Rhodes wrote in one of his secret diaries, quote, why should we not form a secret society with but one object, meaning with only one object, the furtherance of the British Empire and the bringing of the whole uncivilized world under British rule for the recovery, that means recovery for Britain, of the United States and for the making of the Anglo-Saxon race but one empire. He also wrote, let us form the same kind of society, a church for the extension of the British Empire. This is mind space, my comment. Rhodes continues, <clears throat> a society which should have its members in every part of the British Empire working with one object and one idea. We should have its members placed at our universities and our schools and should watch the English youth passing through their hands. Just one perhaps in every thousand would have the mind and feelings for such an object. This is what Rhodes scholarships are for. He should be tried in every way he should be tested whether he is endurant, possessed of eloquence, disregardful of the petty details of life, and if found to be such, in other words, a psychological test, then he should be elected and bound by oath, that is sworn to secrecy, to serve for the rest of his life in his country. He should then be supported, if without means, by the society and sent to that part of the empire where it is felt he was needed. And in this view, vision, of course, the United States is part of the empire. In another of his wills, Rhodes described his detail, intent in more detail, quote, to and for the establishment, promotion and development of a secret society, the true aim and object whereof shall be for the extension of British rule throughout the world. The colonization by British subjects of all lands where the means of livelihood are attainable by energy, labor and enterprise, <clears throat> and especially the occupation by British settlers of the entire continent of Africa, the Holy Land, the Valley of the Euphrates, modern Iraq, the islands of Cyprus and Candia, that is Crete, the whole of South America, the islands of the Pacific not heretofore possessed by Great Britain, the whole of the Malay archipelago, those aboard of China and Japan, meaning offshore of China and Japan, and the ultimate recovery of the United States of America as an integral part of the British Empire. This vision did not remain the ra ravings of a particularly wealthy Englishman, uh, but they nativized themselves in the United States, in the so-called Eastern establishment, the Eastern seaboard, as the United States became the world's dominant power. The key testimony on this is that of Norman Dodd, the ODD, given shortly before his death in 1982 to G. Edward Griffin, easily found online uh, as Norman Dodd on the tax-exempt foundations. Dodd was the key staffer for uh, Reese, the congressman from East Tennessee, R-E-E-C-E, -E, um, who in the 1950s carried out on behalf of Congress an investigation into the effect of these tax-exempt foundations in the United States, which implemented the City of London's and Cecil Rhodes' vision for world domination. Uh, now, I'm going to uh, read what Dodd said uh, in this interview. He speaks about having hired a sceptical, level-headed practicing attorney in Washington, uh, this is in the 1950s, and sent her up to the library of the Carnegie Foundation, one of the key tax-exempt foundations, uh, where she was given access uh, with a dictaphone belt, the technology of the time, to record efficiently what she was reading, uh, to, uh, to scan the library and see what was being said in the years 1906 that I was mentioning earlier and 1908. And this initially sceptical woman, quote, un unsympathetic to the aims of the Rees Committee, found this to her lifelong horror. <clears throat> she dictated into her belt, according to Dodd, we are now at the year 1908, which was the year that the Carnegie Foundation began operations. And in that year, she reads as she is in the Carnegie Foundation's library, 
the trustees meeting for the first time raised a specific question which they discussed throughout the balance of the year in a very learned fashion. And the question is, is there any means known more effective than war, assuming that you wish to alter the life of an entire people? And they conclude that no, no more effective means than war to that end is known to humanity. So then, continues the lawyer with her dictaphone belt on, in 1909, the Carnegie Foundation raised the second question and discussed it, namely, how do we involve the United States in a war? I could go on, but I don't have the time on that strand, but I think that is enough in itself to establish the key insight in people's minds that it is not enough to be by far the world's greatest military and economic power, as the United States has been arguably since before the First World War, certainly after it. If your mind space is still controlled by this uh, argument that the Anglo-Saxon liberal democrat democratic model is the only game in town, if it's still controlled by the unexamined assumption that everyone at the top of that model is paid up to uh, liberty, uh, then you are still going to find that a club with self-interest is going to run the world. And even in areas such as healthcare, which Britain, uh, first of the first country in the world, socialized in 1948, you're going to find that people uh, wrongly and blithely assume that their best interests are, uh, are kept at heart. Uh, in perhaps two minutes, I will make the other point that I wish to make, uh, which is regarding the City of London and its offshoot in Manhattan, in Wall Street, uh, funding both sides of both world wars. Now, this is not, again, an original claim to me. Uh, serious academics such as Anthony Sutton, who was at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University in California, have written whole books about this, entitled Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution and Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler. Uh, this is well known to those who bother to find out about these things. Um, the, um, there was a whole trail of documents which was uh, recovered by Anthony Sutton. It cost him his tenure at Stanford. Uh, he put this all uh, in his books. Uh, and what he found was that, uh, in a nutshell, both the Soviet Union and the uh, Third Reich were brought into being for the interests of the City of London and more particularly its Wall Street end. So if you could bring up briefly the first slide which I uh, asked you to uh, put on screen, you will see just one outworking of that, which is that IBM had a uh, monopoly subsidiary in Germany called the, uh, the Hollerit uh, company. Hollerit was the name of the German owner. Uh, can you confirm whether that is on screen at the moment? It is or, on the well, wait in a moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. So you can see here uh, that uh, Hollerich, the nominal German owner of this IBM subsidiary, is offering the Third Reich Übersicht, or oversight, using punch cards, uh, an American te technology uh, licensed to the Third Reich. Uh, at the bottom, you can read Übersicht mit Hollerich Lochkarten, uh, total uh, information awareness using Hollerit punch cards, and the company name at the bottom is Deutsche Hollerit Maschinen Maschinengesellschaft, or uh, Dehomag, uh, which was in Berlin, Lichterfelder. Um, the second slide which I have is just one example of the total reach of British intelligence in areas which it's not constitutionally able uh, or, or, or permitted to, to have, which is that you can see a Christmas tree symbol here indicating that uh, MI5, even before the Second World War, was vetting who got onto the uh, airwaves of the BBC, who got promoted and who got transferred. This was all done uh, checking with MI5 uh, in very brief, uh, brief terms. British intelligence, uh, OK, it nominally is there for the nation, but it was set up uh, by the uh, bloodlines of which I speak to further their private aims. That's certainly how they regard uh, the running of British intelligence. The third of my four slides shows how this breaks surface in 2010, where the British Cabinet Office is, uh, with a, together with a think tank, the Institute of Government, is openly speaking about its control of the world's thinking and the thinking of the British people. Uh, they're labelling parts of the brain under the label of mind space. And on the right hand side, you have, uh, I can see the, uh, you've put the key text from pages 66 and 67 of this 2010 document. It says, even if people agree with the behavior goal, this is about nudging to get people to behave uh, as was wished by bloodlines rather than uh, to uh, mandate their governments to act on their behalf. Even if people agree with the behavior goal, 
they may object to the means of accomplishing it. The different mind space effects will attract different levels of controversy. There are several factors that determine controversy. In other words, they are foreseeing that they will be told this is a reversal of the aims of government, <clears throat> including in healthcare, of course. Uh, they go on, as noted, mind space effects depend at least partly on the automatic system. This means that citizens may not fully realize that their behavior is being changed, or at least how it is being changed. Clearly, this opens government up to charges of manipulation. People tend to think that attempts to change their behavior will be effective if they are simply provided information in an above board way. People have a strong dislike of being tricked. This dislike has a psychological grounding, but fundamentally it is an issue of trust in government. A lack of conscious control also has implications for consent and freedom of choice. First, it creates a greater need for citizens to approve the use of the behavior change, perhaps using new forms of democratic engagement. You see that in this model, democracy is the highest good that's sold, but the levers of manipulating democracy are in the hands of the cartel. Second, if the effect operates automatically, it may offer little opportunity for citizens to opt out or choose otherwise. The concept of choice architecture is less use here. Any action that may reduce the right to be wrong, the right to refuse treatment, for example, will be very controversial. Of course, some traditional attempts to change behavior are not explicit, and these have attracted controversy, but they rarely attract the charge of manipulation because they are based on conscious actions to supply and register information rather than relying on unconscious reactions. Uh, I think that establishes the point well enough in principle that uh, we are trained in the modern world, dominated by the City of London and its soft power institutions, to think uh, that we are in control of our destiny because liberal democracy is held up as the paragon on the correct argument often that all other systems are more tyrannical and less desirable. But the whole strength of the City of London's model is that it can even operate uh, at arm's length through other countries, such as the United States and Germany, as uh, demonstrated here, uh, to persuade people that what they wanted before is not really what they want now. And it's the, the filling of the mind space, uh, which is, the, I think, the most powerful weapon uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, on, that's, that's available there. Now, I can see that I've gone over the time allotted, so I will leave the rest of these details. I could never have hoped to be comprehensive here, but I trust that I have given people a small taster of the long track record of solid historical research that there has been by people well familiar with the British establishment uh, in establishing this, that the, that the British establishment hasn't been fighting fair since about 1870, and that most of the revolutions it wished to bring about, uh, control of democracy through party whipping, uh, control of health care uh, through compulsory uh, states provided health care in the British and Canadian model, were all in place by the post-war period, which is the time at which I understand Matt Eret is going to pick up the testimony and take us into the post-1945 era. Thank you very much, Alex. This is a perfect overview of how we got into this. Um, if I may, uh, I would like to ask just a few questions. Uh, of course, my learned colleagues will do the same, but um, is it correct that uh, the City of London is the real powerhouse in, in the UK? It is unquestionably the powerhouse. This is something that if you've had my background, uh, you learn at boarding school, let alone at university. So rugby and Cambridge in my case. And by the time you get into the civil service, uh, there is a lot of eye rolling if you ever suggest that the people of Britain or any other country in the Commonwealth have self-determination. No, the City of London is understood to own the population, body, mind and soul. Ultimately, and this seems to have started uh, fairly early, um, I don't know if it started, I forget if it, if it was in 1870 or in the early 1900s, but ultimately it's the control of the people's mind that the city of London to further their goal of world domination that they really wanted. Is that correct? Yes, and it is not a specifically Anglo-Saxon problem anymore because there are countries on the European continent <coughs> which 
certainly since 1949, Germany is one of them, the Federal Republic, of course. Uh, Belgium is another, which, as I said in my testimony, uh, was set up by British uh, insistence in 1815. I translate uh, at quite a high level government communications from supposedly the uh, national health agencies of these countries to their citizens. I translate them into English for expatriates in those countries. And the Belgian and German, to name these two examples, governments are explicitly following a City of London view here. They write to the population in terms of health management, uh, telling them that the way that they exist is not good enough. Their bodies, their minds, their genetics, their intelligence have not been optimised. And therefore, this livestock, this population is not competing as it should in the world. So that is an extension of the City of London model to the European continent, where it's turned out in many ways to fit in just as well to codified civil law jurisdictions with high respect for the rule of law as it does in a common law jurisdiction. So ultimately what we're seeing is a very powerful, financially powerful and therefore powerful um, institution, City of London, which bridges the Atlantic because as its fifth column, as some people claim, uh, they have Wall Street. Those two powers united used to be or still are the, mo the, the center of power in this world. Yes, I mean, you, could, you can take many twists and turns, especially in the mid-20th century period, but what you have said is a useful diagnostic summary of the whole of the, the 20th century. Uh, that There are struggles. For a long time, there was the completely non-trivial Cold War, with uh, branches of the aristocracy in the City of London being both pro- and anti-Soviet Union. I could talk for hours just about that. But that is secondary to the determination that there must be only a German bloc and a Russian bloc in Eurasia, and that both of these ultimately must be controlled and hemmed in by British or Anglo-American sea power and Anglo-American soft power, setting the paradigms for them. Another thing that I wanted to clarify is you mentioned that it is just a few families who really run the city of London. You mentioned the names of Rothschild and Rhodes and Astor. Uh, is it true that it's just a few families who are trying to dominate the world through the city of London? Yes. Um, I have never found better material than that of a writing duo, which is Dutch-German-American. The Dutchman is Robin de Ruyter, R-U-I-T-E-R. His American-German co-author is Fritz Springmeier from South Carolina. They have the rather shocking book titled Bloodlines of the Illuminati, but their work is solid and they consistently show that uh, the city of London, Manhattan, the European continent are very much dominated by a small number of families. Often 13 is given as the top level of these families. Obviously, there are levels below that. The French, for example, often spoke about les 200 familles, the 200 bloodlines that run the deep state. Uh, but the senior ones terrorize the junior ones in this model. And the, the, the highest you can get up before you disappear into uh, nebulous claims of Satan running the world, which ultimately I believe he does, but the highest level you can get up to is a level at which Central European Germanic bloodlines uh, have an uneasy truce with British Isles bloodlines, uh, most of whom are now based in the United States. Uh, that is the, 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 the largest model. And all the geopolitical frustrations of the 20th century ultimately are to do with one or other wing trying to gain ascendancy, should we uh, go with the city or overturn the city, and that have to do with the frustration of uh, emerging superpowers, notably the Russians, trying to play on level terms with, the, with that bloodline cartel and failing. Mm -hmm. And one of the major means through which these very few families are trying to dominate the rest of the world seems to be through mind space, which sounds a little bit like mind control. Does that mean through psychological operations? Very much so. Uh, no nation got into the game of psychological operations earlier than Britain. As soon as there were formal uh, intelligence agencies in Britain in the Edwardian era, just before the First World War, it was a major concentration but uh, they borrowed a lot of their insights from Vienna and from Germany, uh, which were leading in the psychological space at the time. So this is a transnational interest 
in, in both the Anglo and the Germanic uh, areas of world domination at the time to use the tricks of mind space. And these were largely perfected when America had unchallenged hegemony after 1945 using, as in so many other areas, such as Operation Paperclip for technical areas, using a lot of the Third Reich and Soviet minds actually brought over to the United States surreptitiously. Uh, it's, it's been regarded as, since the days of Edward Bernays and Freud, as the most powerful way of controlling action in the real world. Because if you cannot perceive of there being a valid way of doing things other than what you're told is the right way, then that's obviously the supreme power that you can have. If you have that power, you control people who are more numerous, more intelligent and stronger than yourself. Did I hear correctly that you use the term livestock? Is that really the view that these people have of the rest of the world? It is explicitly the view that certainly in the 1990s, when I was at a senior British boarding school, this, this term was used uh, explicitly to describe by the grandsons of City of London seniors to describe the British population uh, who, who, went, who walked under their own windows on the way to, um, uh, as we went to lessons, they were going about their business in town. Uh, the, the terms that were used for them revolved around the idea that they were cattle and did not deserve a place in the world other than under the direction of the British elite. Thank you very much, Alex. I don't, um, I, I don't want to keep my learned colleagues from asking questions, so please uh, go ahead. Good day, Mr. Alec Thompson. Thank you so much for your evidence. Can you hear me loud and clear? Perfectly well, thank you. Excellent. Mr. Thompson, I would like to know, and you have actually touched on uh, the African continent, and specifically, you've mentioned Sizzle John Rhodes. I would like to know from you, what role does the city of London play currently on the African continent? Can you please just uh, elaborate on that? The role that it plays is a very dark and complex one and is largely seen when coup d'etats and revolutions occur in former British colonies. Of course, there is a whole band of countries formerly coloured pink on the map, famously from Cairo all the way down to the Cape, where Britain nearly installed a railway and a single colony. And in, in these countries, you see it most clearly. Um, Mrs Thatcher's son was involved in a failed coup attempt in a non-Anglophone African country, Equatorial Guinea. This is just one example where the attempt was bungled and the City of London sponsors left Mark Thatcher to, 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 um, to dry on his own, as it were, when this failed. Um, I think most particularly what we see in former Rhodesia, now the nations of Zambia and Zimbabwe, is that there's been a, a node where the City of London has retained financially corrupt and powerful people and the local SAS contingents from the era of white rule, uh, who have done a lot of the dirty work, even in, in London itself, in the post-war period. And this has been done on the basis of having, uh, on paper, ownership of uh, rich mineral assets in Southern Africa. That's the most general way in which I could talk about it. Um, there, there are even suspicious deaths as late as the 1979 Lancaster House Accords, paving the way for ZANU-PF to take over from the Smith government in uh, Rhodesia as it became Zimbabwe, uh, with um, lawyers falling supposedly to their deaths out of windows. Um, it, it's, it's an extremely dark picture. And the more you look at some of the companies involved, Kroll Security is one that comes to mind, the more you see that there is a nexus between MI6, SAS and the City of London, and that it regards Southern Africa in particular as its prime asset. Thank you very much. So will you then agree with me, uh, Ms. Thompson, that when it comes to financial dominance, when we look at COVID-19, that is at the core. So you will agree that financial dominance is, is at the core of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, I would. And I would qualify it very slightly by reminding you that uh, in Carol Quigley's summary of the Anglo-American elite establishment's worldview, he points out that the ownership of financial assets is already outdated by the 1960s. And he knows that the, the great brains, not necessarily the good brains, a century prior to him already saw this coming. They were regarding the real wealth as human minds and human health and the ability to uh, alter and to copyright in time uh, the human uh, being into a new model. 
that would behave as expected. Uh, that is the great wealth in the world. But with that caveat, if we call that wealth, and in extension we can call it financial, then yes, that, that is the greatest prize there is. The whole point about the City of London is if you are somewhat intellectually gifted and come up from a, uh, a privileged British background into Oxford and Cambridge, you really only have the choice between money making in the City of London or some branch of its national service such as intelligence or officership. And the difference time and again I saw between myself and those who went the other way in my cohort was principle. Uh, that neither group doubted that the real power in the world was ownership of capital. It's just a question of whether you wish to serve that by being an intelligence officer who reports to the City of London ultimately, or whether you wish to be part of the action making the money. There is no higher ideal than that in the Anglo-American model. Okay. Thank you very much. No further questions for me. Thank you. Any questions from Anna or uh, Virginie or Deepali? Okay. No, I think this was quite excellent. The only question I would ask is, how do you turn this, uh, you, you mentioned various things like copywriting the human mind, copywriting the maybe the genetics even. Uh, do you feel that there is a link between the current vaccines, so-called vaccines, the shots from Pfizer, Moderna, uh, Janssen, AstraZeneca, do you think there is a relationship between those and this goal of copywriting the humans? Uh, I very strongly believe that I'm not medically or biotechnologically qualified to explain how much truth there may be in this, but I've seen time and again that where there is hype and where there is a, a, a pseudo-theological belief among the elite in Britain and America that you can achieve a certain aim by pulling a certain trick, such as by editing a gene and stamping uh, a copyright on the human body, as it were, that is enough motivation in and of itself to fuel uh, a serious attempt to go that way. And I know that when Debbie Evans takes part of Brian Gerrish's testimony slot later this evening, she will be talking about that. I think that the very heart of it is the idea that genetic editing will allow de facto sneaky copywriting of the, 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 the number of souls and bodies in humanity that are affected so that they're no longer under the creator. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then that concludes Alec Thompson's testimony. Um, now we will listen to Matthew Eretz's testimony. Yes, thank you. I have to say that that presentation was was more than I expected, though, and that I think sets the tone very well for uh, the torch that I'm I'm being handed right now. Um, I would just make maybe push back on one single point, which is that no matter what the oligarchy might wish legally or formally be uh, the claim of who owns the soul or the, the, the body and, and freedom of people, it has no bearing in reality. There is a natural law uh, that is higher than the law that they wish to impose onto the universe. And that's part of the problem with ivory tower thinkers, right? They always want the universe to conform to their mathematical models. And they kind of go into uh, conniption fits of rage when uh, they discover that the universe is much more creative and nonlinear than they want it to be. So it's this sort of God complex, which is ultimately the downfall, I think, of empires historically. Every time you see the oligarchy sort of self-cannibalize and melt down under its own self-contradictions, it's a natural thing that should happen the way it does. Uh, the question is, are we willing to tolerate that level of folly and immorality uh, to the point that we go down with it? Right. And that's always the, the challenge for every generation. This isn't a new thing. And obviously we are at the end of a system. Um, I'm going to do something uh, a little bit uh, different. Um, I will deal. Well, originally I was going to talk a lot more about eugenics. Now I, I understand that in, in February 26th, we're going to focus a lot more on eugenics. So I won't do that. I will uh, carry on uh, the theme that Alex raised, but I will do this by first dealing with about eight minutes of the present situation, uh, just to get across what is the British hand in global affairs today in a little bit more detail, using a, a little one minute video from uh, Justin Trudeau here in Canada, where uh, we have this shadow of a shadow who's been a, you know, imposed onto the people to carry out a policy that really doesn't come from him. And I think everybody recognizes that there's nothing really there. He's kind of like a young version of Biden. Um, his whole life has sort of been handled. Um, but the question being, well, obviously, if this guy is too, uh, too much of a Ken doll without a brain or a soul to actually carry out or make decisions, then what is the power behind the so-called throne? 
Um, so I'm gonna start with a video. Then I'm gonna go back after uh, dealing with the present a little bit more into uh, the 18, uh, the 19th century a little bit uh, with a Canadian focus, just because this is something on people's perspective right now being <clears throat> being what, what is happening is currently happening in, in Ottawa. And then we're gonna carry up uh, to the battles in the post-World War II age, just to see how this thing transmogrified um, and recalibrated after World War II. So we'll just do this in a summary way. I'll try not to oversimplify too much, but obviously this is a complex issue and I, I will try to do justice and rigor to what needs to be understood. So the first thing is the video that I promised, um, which I'm going to play here. It's about a minute and a half. Um, oh, share sound, share sound. All right, I hope people can hear this. This is not the video, I'm so sorry. Let's try that again. Okay, can people see the, uh, the Canadian press? Yes, we can see it. All right. I, Justin P.J. Trudeau, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors. So help me God. I. Justin P.J. Trudeau, do solemnly and sincerely swear that I shall be a true and faithful servant to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II as a member of Her Majesty's Privy Council for Canada. I will in all things to be treated, debated and resolved in Privy Council faithfully, honestly and truly declare my mind and my opinion. I shall keep secret all matters committed and revealed to me in this capacity or that shall be secretly treated of in council. Generally, in all things, I shall do as a faithful and true servant ought to do for Her Majesty, so help me God. I, Justin P.J. Trudeau, do solemnly and sincerely promise and swear that I will truly and faithfully, and to the best of my skill and knowledge, execute the powers and trusts reposed in me as Prime Minister. So help me God. Okay. Uh, no one can hear anything anymore, right? No. The video no. is over, but we can hear you. Great. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so that is a little bit of a confusing thing for some people who saw this in 2017. Um, not your typical thing you would expect a, a so-called democratic head of state to be doing um, when he's declaring his oath of office after an election. But then again, he, Trudeau is not really the head of state. As we've come to see, he's both a member of the Privy Council office, which you have to be if you're going to be in a cabinet position in government or in the opposition. Um, and uh, the actual head of state is the governor general, that older gentleman standing next to him, who is the appointee uh, carrying out the emanation of the powers and authority of the, the crown to give royal assent um, to any law that becomes law in Canada. You have lieutenant governors, a position in every single province. You have a privy council office. You have this whole weird Byzantine structure above the apparent um, public aspect of our so-called democracy in this monarchy of the north. Uh, which is, again, very confusing It's for a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go into a little bit more of what this is. What is this anomalous thing and what is it a part of internationally? How did it come into being? Um, so here I've prepared a series of slides uh, just to get across. The Canada is, is, after all, a part of the Commonwealth, the British Commonwealth. This is something that was set up in the late 18, uh, 1930s in preparation for... Um, well, essentially the, the transformation of the British Empire's outward image. Today, there's about 40, 54 countries in the British Commonwealth, with the center being the United Kingdom. The head of it is the, uh, the Queen of England. Um, you have uh, this thing occupying about 12.2 million square miles of territory. 2.4 uh, billion people are represented within territories here. 21% uh, of the world's land area. And, you know, people celebrate this thing as if it's somehow a democratic institution. And it's a bit weird. Like, what is what is this thing that also, if you look at a lot of these territories, a lot of it is, is the Caribbean, uh, the uh, the Latin American uh, areas aren't so touched. But a lot of the Caribbean is um, a lot of Africa. There's 19 African nations in sub-Saharan African uh, Africa. There are um, 
eight Asian nations, India being the biggest, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, obviously the five eyes minus the United States. But let's just compare this to the, the old British empire. This is a, a screenshot from uh, an 18, a 1920 map. It looks pretty similar, doesn't it? So people say, oh, the British empire just, it disappeared after World War II. It, it let its territories go free. And now the empire is the big bad American empire. That's the mythology that's been passed down to us, and it is a mythology. As Alex went through very concisely, the real power the, the, that controls the fifth column inside of the United States, which has always been there since 1776, um, has always been centered in London. Uh, we're going to flesh this out a little bit more, um, but it never disappeared. No, no empire of this sort ever just willfully gives liberty. Liberty is something you fight for. Um, just quickly, the issue of... Uh, current mining interests today. I mean, this is not something that just occurred in the 1880s, 1890s with the, the land grab for Africa and Cecil Rhodes's creation of De Beers and, and Lonerhoe and other, other mining interests. This is something, this is a 2016 report. It's a, it's a fantastic report by a nonprofit that conducted audits on the, uh, the British uh, interests, those interests that are controlling mining in Africa um, with headquarters in either the UK or within Commonwealth territories uh, measured on the London Stock Exchange. And just a small quote here, it's a new colonialism, Britain's scramble for African energy and mining resources. It says 101 companies list, listed on the London Stock Exchange, most of them British, have mining operations in 37 sub-Saharan African countries. They collectively control over $1 trillion worth of Africa's most valuable resources. The UK government has used its power and influence to ensure that mining companies, British mining companies, have access to Africa's raw materials. This was the cause, uh, the case during the colonial period, and it is still the case today. This report is available for free online as a PDF. I'm not going to go into details. Um, it is upwards of 70% of the mining interests, which also include uh, refining materials uh, by companies that are in British uh, controlled territories. Um, how, what is the infrastructure carrying this out? There's something that a lot of people don't even know about. This is an organization affiliated with the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the World Bank uh, called Crown Agents. It was set up in 1833 as a, on its official, uh, uh, you know, self description as an emanation of the crown. It's not part of the government, but its authority comes from the fount of all honors, the crown itself. That's the way the sort of Byzantine structure is, is emanated, the shadow government. There's a sort of hierarchy of authority. It doesn't come from the consent of the governed. It's, it comes from the singular, singular sovereign, the crown, whoever that may be. Um, as a hereditary institution. So this was set up in 1833 as a branch of the British colonial office to manage the infrastructure, hard and soft, a lot soft, of the colonies internationally of the empire. It did a few name changes over the years. And in 1996, it uh, went through another name change called the Crown Agents for Overseas Government Administration, where it also has been managing the, uh, the health infrastructure, including COVID protocols of Eastern Europe, especially Ukraine. Um, it manages many African countries, uh, South Sudan, Myanmar, and it deals with governance. It helps these countries adapt their, uh, their governing mechanisms according to World Bank and IMF standards. It's been there and doing this for a very long time, and it's a very strange thing. And again, they call themselves crown agents. It's not me slandering them or calling them. And this has been around, as I said, for a very, very long time. So that's one aspect of this thing in terms of the maintenance of the shadow empire. Now, one thing about the <clears throat> about this uh, Commonwealth City of London managed system is that the Cayman Islands and offshore banking is the center of this. There was a wonderful documentary that people can watch called The Spider's Web on Britain's Invisible Empire uh, that is available on YouTube even. Um, it goes through this in a, in a nice way, um, but it just gets across that internationally, um, you have 24% of the financial services moving through a lot of, the, uh, of British controlled Cayman Islands, um, Caribbean and other um, offshore uh, tax havens. But also within these is the center of global drug money laundering and terrorist financing. People think, oh, drugs, it's just a natural plague of our society. Terrorism, it's just a natural thing that just happens. And it's like, no, no, this is very artificial. This is not the way human society just na comes up with these plagues of sociology. These were created diseases that are geopolitical in nature, not even religious in nature. Um, 
that are cultivated from the top. This is a 2012 uh, Senate report uh, conducted over many, a, a long period by the recently deceased Senator Carl Levin um, on US vulnerabilities to money laundering, drugs and terrorist financing, the HSBC case, whereby in the course of this, it was discovered that HSBC was the primary number one offshore account um, money laundering bank in the world. As Alex pointed out, they were set up in 1865 in order to enforce the, uh, or manage the opium trade to destroy China. That never stopped. Um, they were found guilty. They were slapped on the wrist with a, uh, a certain fine of $1.9 billion. They were allowed to appoint their own auditor to sit there for five years. And as far as I can see, they're still doing what they do. They have a huge stake in Air Canada as well. Um, anybody who takes a plane to Canada will see HSBC signs everywhere. Um, that is a huge piece of infrastructure as part of the silver triangle um, that's been underway for the whole of the 20th century. Um, other than, you have, you have there a picture of the queen with Bank Kruz. That's the, that's the queen's personal bank, which was also 2012 found guilty for drug money laundering. It paid its own little, I think maybe $10 million fine. And the, uh, <clears throat> the bad publicity resulted in the Bank Kruz's offshore accounts that were conducting the, uh, the laundering to be sold off to the Royal Bank of Canada, um, which currently conducts the same operations. So that's, that's that. Africa as well has $177 billion of debt holding it hostage. Meanwhile, about $944 billion of revenue from the extraction of wealth sits in British offshore accounts. So it is not a debtor, but a predator nation en masse. Um, this, is, uh, this is a whole story unto itself. The city of London, as Alex pointed out, it's a separate entity. Even the UK government can't really do much legally to stop it. They have their own courts, their own police. Uh, it's a weird structure. Um, so, okay, I just want to throw that out. And I didn't even talk about Iraq, the Iraq war, dodgy dossiers being justified and created by British intelligence that justified the bombing of Iraq. Uh, Libya as well, that was n more MI6 intelligence. Uh, I didn't talk about that. I didn't talk about the Syrian uh, dodgy dossiers of chemical weapons that were never actually proven to be used by Assad, but that have been justified for sanctions and justifying the regime change that has been attempted now for seven years. I didn't talk about that, um, but all that to say, it's everywhere. The British hand, everywhere you scratch a little bit, even in, in the course of the dodgy dossiers to try to put uh, Putin as the uh, the big bad guy controlling uh, Trump, those dodgy dossiers were brought to us by people like Sir Richard Dearlove, the guy who brought us the original Iraq war yellow cake dodgy dossier. That was always a fraud and the Chilcot Commission report proved that to be the case. Um, so, and also the question of Rhodes Scholars, people like Strobe Talbot, uh, who was a Rhodes Scholar, came in with Clinton and uh, and has been there running Brookings for a very long time. This is also, be, he's been behind Russiagate with many other Rhodes Scholars currently managing the Biden administration like Jake Sullivan, Sullivan Susan Rice, um, Eric Lander, the science czar, Rhodes Scholars. So, I mean, they're just everywhere and I won't go into that. Um, so, okay, some historical context. I'm Canadian. So, uh, the question of Justin Trudeau, I hope that that's still an imprint in people's uh, mind is what the hell is that? So the Privy Council office, unlike the United States Constitution or Declaration, the Canada was founded in 1867. The original conference with our founding fathers was not something that was a part of a fight for freedom, unlike the US. This was something where these were all British loyalists, anti-Republican. They were all like our, our founding father uh, who's standing up there in the painting, Johnny MacDonald, was an Aryan, complete race patriot wanting an Aryan Canada. And who said a Britisher I was born and a Britisher I will die. He was a, a filthy, filthy immoral scumbag. Um, and these are the people celebrated as our sacred cows that we're supposed to honor in Canada. Now, unlike the US, which enshrines the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence, as well as the idea that the principle of the general welfare, both now and into posterity in the Constitution, the Canadian founding document um, says literally, Whereas the provinces of Canada, at the time there were four of them, uh, have expressed their desire to be federally united in one dominion under the crown of the United Kingdom and of Great Britain and Ireland, with the constitution similar in principle to that of the United Kingdom, which is itself a bit of a fraud since the UK doesn't really have a constitution. Um, so it's sort of a, a, a mirroring of a shadow. Um, and whereas such a union would conduce to the welfare of the provinces and promote the interests of the British Empire. So that's our, our so-called preamble is to promote the interest of the British Empire. That's why we were created. We were also created, this conference that, that drafted that was 
It occurred three years earlier in 1864, while the Civil War was just winding down, it was still being fought. The British had put a lot of resources into breaking up the Union, as I, I've gone through in previous presentations. Uh, a lot of this is in my books as well, on the clash of the two Americas and the untold history of Canada. Um, the point that the British were afraid of, as, as I demonstrate, was that Canada had pro-Lincoln statesmen in positions of leadership who were fighting to create an independent country at that time. Um, there were also uh, the people who were working to create an American Zolverein uh, with the Canada and the United States together in one customs union based upon industrial development with the type of policy not like America today, but it was a different policy of the, the Lincoln McKinley orientation of, of a real long term thinking where human beings were seen as uh, a good a, a creature that money had to serve by virtue of investing into large scale infrastructure, science and technology, but also working abroad with Germany doing the same thing under Otto von Bismarck with Russia. Uh, that had just sold the Alaska territory to the United States with the intent of, of building rail through the continent into Eurasia. So this was seen as being a, a vital territory that had to be kept under the control of the British Foreign Office. And so this constitution was drafted, Lincoln's allies were ousted from power, and uh, it was kept as a wedge between the danger of a US-Russia collaboration. Um, except one Lincoln admirer did become prime minister at a certain point, Wilfrid Laurier, and he did by 1911 organize to create a customs union finally. All the bills had been passed and it was about to go into law, finally. And unfortunately, he was ousted in a, uh, a coup d'etat that was orchestrated by the round table and some Orangemen Freemasons that have the queen, the crown, the, the head of the, these different Freemasonic outfits. Uh, a paper was written that I've, I've published on the, the Canadian Patriot site going through those details. But just two years later, Wilfrid Laurier writes to his close ally, O.D. Skelton, that Canada is now governed by a junta sitting in London known as the round table with ramifications in Toronto and Winnipeg and Victoria with Tories, that's conservatives, and Brits, that's liberals, receiving their ideas from London and insidiously forcing them on their respective parties. So um, that was an admission directly from the man himself who he had a vision for turning Canada into a Lincoln modeled nation um, with a population of 60 million within a generation based upon large scale electrification and industrialization. That was all ousted, uh, ended. And again, the round table took control. Robert Borden, who was the, uh, his replacement was a round tabler who, who ended up controlling the Chatham House of Canada at its inception as its first president. Um, <clears throat> by 1918, the round table had already initiated a takeover of the British government. They had ousted Herbert Asquith in uh, the Labour gov uh, government in 1916. Not that he was such a great guy, but they really wanted to have their full controls on the terms of the Versailles Treaty and the end of World War I. One of the problems they needed the United States, they really needed the power of the United States behind them. And that's been always the objective of the Cecil Rhodes design. Lord Lothian, who was a leading round tabler at the time, he was the ambassador to the United States, had written his other name was Philip Kerr. They always have names that sound kind of like uh, Star Wars villains. Um, he wrote the problem of the American psyche that had to be dealt with is that there is a fundamental different fundamentally different concept in regards to the question between Great Britain and the United States as to the necessity of civilized control over backward, politically backward peoples. The inhabitants of Africa and parts of Asia have proved unable to govern themselves. Yet America not only has no conception of this aspect of the problem, but has been led to believe that the assumptions of this kind of responsibility is iniquitous, iniquitous, I can't say that word, iniquitous imperialism. <laughs> Um, so it's a problem, right? The Americans have this damn, they don't get that there's a white man's burden that they have to impose, you know, because they're just scientifically better than the darker skinned people. They have to morally and scientifically impose an Anglo-American control over the backward peoples and they don't get it. And that was a problem. Not there were Americans that did get it. And that was, again, part of the American deep state problem that I had mentioned that Alex went through a bit. Um, but what had happened? So there were several attempts at, at new world orders, okay? What we're seeing today is not a new thing. I alluded to this in previous uh, presentations, but in 1919, you had the, the creation of Chatham House, you had the creation of the, the Versailles Treaty, the League of Nations, all orchestrated by, by Lord Milner, who at this time was a leading figure controlling British foreign policy along with many other round tablers. Um, the idea of the League of Nations was to get, create a, a, a collective security pact 
Article 10, get rid of national sovereignty over, over economics and military affairs and create effectively a one world government. Part of this was also part of the, the Imperial Federation, uh, kind of like what the European Union is, is what they wanted for the, all of their, you know, basically the world. That failed. Why did it fail? Because people, both in Canada, the Laurier Liberals were, had made a comeback through the 1920s and they resisted it. Irish free state movements resisted it. People like Warren Harding, who was assassinated. I say assassinated. I've never seen evidence to the contrary. The American president uh, from eating poisoned oysters uh, died. But point being is you had nationalists that, didn't, that resisted and didn't succumb to this pressure at the time. So it petered out and they tried again. 1933, there was the International Bankers Conference in London centered around the Bank of International Settlements, the Bank of England, and 66 nations had been a part of it, all with the design that the Great Depression would be solved by moving sovereignty economically from nation states into officially a central bankers coterie under the Bank of England. And the only reason after six months that failed is that Franklin Roosevelt pulled the US delegations out of all participation and the thing just fell apart. Um, I wrote about that in chapter seven of my uh, Clash of the Two Americas in detail. Then there was another attempt in 1944. Again, Roosevelt had not yet died. John Maynard Keynes was assigned this time to represent the British Empire at the Bretton Woods Conference with the idea of a one world currency run by the Bank of England called the Bancor, an international exchange rate that would be, again, uh, effectively a one world currency um, with the idea of the Americans who had come out of World War II as the only unbroken country to be the battering ram or the enforcers of an Anglo-American reconquering of the nations of the world, many of whom had fought during the war and many had ideas of independence and freedom alive in their hearts. That was not acceptable. At there, I, I just have a little quote by Franklin Roosevelt, which I really like, where he, uh, he made the point that they who seek to establish systems of government based on the regimentation of all human beings by a handful of individual rulers call this a new order. It is not new and it is not order. Um, that was a sharp quote. So to pick up here a little bit now where Alex is left off, um, there's a book called uh, As He Saw It, written in 1946 by Roosevelt's son and his assistant, his personal assistant, um, Elliot Roosevelt. And he documents a lot of the battles between Roosevelt versus the, the Churchill gang uh, that were trying to always pull the U.S. into a brotherhood of control a la Cecil Rhodes, right, a la uh, five Eyes, which is already what was creeping up and happening from the Black Chamber being transformed into the NSA uh, in 1930, um, which became integrated more and more into this British Five Eyes thing, which was, again, always the Cecil Rhodes will orientation. Um, but in this book, it's a great book. Uh, people can find this on online. They could buy it. They should buy it. It's on archive.org. I use it extensively. Um, but he talks in 1944 after a battle with Churchill, I think at the Turan conference, I'm not too sure which conference, but he speaks to Elliot um, saying, you know, any number of times the men in the State Department have tried to conceal messages to me, delay them, hold them up somehow, just because some of those career diplomats over there are not in accord with what they know, I think they should be working for Winston. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the time they are working for Churchill. Some of, uh, stop to think of them, any number of them are convinced that the way for America to conduct its foreign policy is to find out what the British are doing and then to copy that. I was told six years ago to clean out the State Department. It's like the British Foreign Office. So <clears throat> the OSS had not been cleaned out and the OSS had a lot of problems, but there were still a lot of patriots and nationalists embedded in American intelligence within the OSS that were problematic for those trying to take control who had pretty much occupied most of the State Department by this time. Um, Within Elliot's book, there's there's another wonderful battle between him and Churchill that was documented um, over what would be the post-war uh, era, what what type of operating principles would would govern it, um, where FDR's vision for the greening of African deserts, the extension of the Tennessee Valley Authority, the rural electrification projects that pulled people out of poverty and backwardness inside of the USA, that would be extended. Uh, through long, large scale loans internationally to help other countries have their own industrial programs, their own Tennessee Valley authorities, and really to extend the principle of the four freedoms to the world that were not just about supposed to be just, you know, nice flaky words, but real active, like active, which is why Bretton Woods, the, the Keynesian team lost out and um, Harry Dexter White, who became the, the first director of the IMF, also dying under mysterious circumstances, uh, the American delegation under him had won out and and made sure that even um, 
China, India, Africa, South America, all the many uh, Russia would uh, all be participants in receiving Tennessee Valley Authority projects that were all approved by the U.S. delegation. They were all resisted by the by the British delegation. And even at that time, when Roosevelt had a Russia, China, U.S. alliance as his bedrock, Russia was a subscriber for a billion dollars into the IMF originally before the Iron Curtain uh, caused them to be forced out. All that to say, I, I ramble, but <clears throat> in this uh, small extract I selected, he's describing now the evening talking with Elliot after the fighting with, with Churchill saying, I'm talking about another war. He's warning about World War III. I'm talking about what will happen to our world if after this war, we allow millions of people to slide back into the same semi-slavery. Don't think for a moment, Elliot, that Americans would be dying in the Pacific tonight if it hadn't been for the short-sighted greed of the French and the British and the Dutch. That's the colonialists. Shall we allow them to do it all, all over again? Your son will be about the right age, 15 or, tw or 20 years from now. One sentence, Elliot, then I'm going to kick you out of here. I'm tired. It's this sentence. When we've won the war, I will work with all my might and main to see to it that the United, United States is not wheedled into the position of accepting any plan that will further France's imperialistic ambitions or that will aid or abet the British Empire in its imperial ambitions. So <clears throat> tragedy strikes, right? Um, Wallace, uh, I don't know. I, got, I, I mean, it's a long story, but Wallace is replaced by Harry Truman, who's a, a, a George Bush sort of prototype, uh, banker's boy, Anglophile. And he's brought in now as the new vice president. So Wallace was the vice president who was completely online with FDR's vision. F Roosevelt dies April 12th. No autopsy is ever done. Um, and immediately within the preceding months, nuclear bombs are dropped on a defeated Japan by Truman. Um, September 20th, the OSS, the American Intelligence Agency, is disbanded and a purge, a massive purge begins of anybody who had, had an understanding of the Wall Street London uh, financiers behind fascism's rise and eugenics rise. There was a lot. There were reports on this. Um, these were all purged in the ensuing year. And at this point, the Iron Curtain speech is launched and people think, oh yeah, that was the Americans who did the Iron Curtain, which turned Russia and China into their enemies. No, it was Winston Churchill who came to the United States, stayed at the White House for a sustained period and uh, delivered his speech where he said, neither the sure prevention of war nor the continuous rise of world organization will be gained without what I have called the fraternal association of the English speaking peoples. This means a special relationship between the United, uh, British Commonwealth and empire and the United States. Henry Wallace, uh, just before he gets fired, he's now Commer Commerce Secretary fighting against this insanity uh, that was brainwashing the American people into these, you know, paranoid uh, mobs uh, afraid of commie infiltration and conspiracy. I mean, yeah, the whole McCarthyism thing was a real atrocity run by the FBI as a dictatorship, which it was. The U.S. became a dictatorship under the FBI. Um, he says fascism, he warns, in the post-war inevitably will push steadily for Anglo-Saxon imperialism and eventually for war with Russia. Already American fascists are talking and writing about this conflict and using it as an excuse for their internal hatreds and intolerances towards certain races, creeds, and classes. Obviously here there's a, there's a, a, a complete racist backlash again sponsored by J. Edgar Hoover, another 33rd degree Freemason uh, running the FBI for like seven American presidencies um, that, that's supporting the rise of racism, the, the dismantling of, of civil liberties for African-Americans and others, but also coordinating with the, the CIA that is soon recon reconstituted to create um, a new management system much more in alignment with British foreign policy. Things like MK Ultra, that was originally using a science crafted by Tavistock, the British uh, intelligence branch of psychological warfare. COINTELPRO infiltration that also mirrored Operation Gladio in the uh, UK, uh, in Europe. These were all things deployed, justified by the, the terms and conditions of the age of mutual assured destruction. So it continues. Wallace is now fired after giving this speech. Uh, the Truman Doctrine is announced again. Who was the main? Uh, organizer of the Truman Doctrine. One of the key guys is George McGee, a Rhodes Scholar. Um, you have the central CIA is created in September 18th now, completely so a new reconstituted cleansed intelligence agency. Harry Dexter White dies. IMF is hijacked. That was the guy who was on Roosevelt's team who is now in at that point in 1948. He was fighting to get 
Wallace elected under the Progressive Party leadership in the 48 elections. Um, you'll find many great patriots of the United States uh, either died or had their careers annihilated who were part of this network. Um, <clears throat> and then you have this famous uh, July 50th NSC National Security Council 75 memorandum to, to save the British Empire. Um, I kid you not, this is literally a protocol issued to under the logic that if the British weakens its imperial economic interests, then the Soviets will take and fill that space. So the US foreign policy interest has to be to preserve uh, British interests abroad. And this is where the IMF, the World Bank, increasingly became rewired to use ec economic colonialism wherever needed uh, to, to, you know, if you can't stop the political independence of a nation, at the very least sabotage their economic independence. Um, one guy who's an interesting figure, is Clement Attlee at this time, who's uh, you know post World War II Prime Minister, and he makes a, a, a strong point that over and over again we have seen that there is another power that it, than that which is has its seat at Westminster, the City of London, a convenient term for a collection of financial interests, is able to assert itself against the government of the country. Those who control money can pursue a policy at home and abroad contrary to that which is being decided by the people. So again, you, you have even British, so it's not the British government, right? Um, the British people are also as much victimized by, as well as many figures within the British government are victimized by this power above uh, the official um, visible branches of government. Throughout the Cold War, again, if you can't understand the architecture of the Cold War, of mutually assured destruction, the asymmetrical warfare, game theory doctrines, the application of systems analysis to manage the geopolitical uh, overthrows of governments, things like the Vietnam War, if you don't look at people like Dean Rusk, Rhodes Scholar, uh, Walt Whitman Rostow, uh, who ran the NSA for three years, who was a Balliol Rhodes Scholar, S. Scott Reed, who was the architect of NATO to, to break Russia out of any, any, any influence in the Security Council over military affairs. NATO, that was S. Scott Reed, Rhodes Scholar. Uh, William Fulbright, Rhodes Scholar. I mean, there's so many that uh, overlap. You can't, so again, you can't really understand what is this thing that JFK was pushing back against and trying to fight against. What was, what was the thing that, that Eisenhower was warning about in his military industrial comp complex speech? Um, you can't understand that if you don't look at these ideologues who have been penetrated over decades. There's been 3,000 so far in the 20th century who've been processed through the halls of Oxford. Not that they're all bad. I think Chris Christopherson is an okay actor, and maybe his, his movie choices are not so great sometimes. But I don't think he's a bad guy, though he's a road scholar. So you'll find that you, know, you can't be guilty by association, but you can't understand anything unless you understand this uh, very controlled centralized hive that also coordinates with the, the American Roundtable Movement, which is the Council on Foreign Relations, the thing that uh, Hillary Clinton referred to as the mothership in a 2011 speech. That has always been since 1921, the British Roundtable in America. And even people who you think of as being American geopolitical uh, grand designers, like Kissinger, Zbigniew Brzezinski, Samuel P. Huntington, Clash of Civilizations, a Canadian, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who did his own martial law in 1970. Um, and really reorganized the entire government as a technocratic uh, cybernetic system. Um, they were all processed under William Yandel Elliott in Harvard, who ran something that some have referred to as the Chatham House of Harvard. William Yandel Elliott was one of these guys who just liked having talented young sociopathic boys brought around him, and he just trained generations of these geopoliticians who were processed. Um, talent, you know, it's like a talent searching thing, as, as Rhodes describes. It's exactly what they carried out and then brought back into positions of um, ideological authority to carry out a policy that they themselves were not the originators of per se, but they were put into positions to make it happen. Um, we did have pushback, and I just want to have some counter voice, because it's not like they, they're they godlike creatures, right? There was real human beings, real statesmen, um, especially throughout the 1960s. You have Enrico Mattei, the Italian industrialist. You have uh, Dyke Hammerstold. Uh, the, the Secretary General of the UN, who had a grand program to end imperialism and promote industrial development in a variety of countries, especially in South, Af South Africa. Uh, Charles de Gaulle had avoided 30 assassination attempts. John F. Kennedy, obviously. Um, you have Patrice Lumumba. I, I, I've, I didn't put everybody on here who was either assassinated or overthrown in CIA MI6 directed coups. But all that to say, it was a major period of potential where the common theme was cooperation and breaking out of the mathematical ways of governance. 
right? Introduce new technologies, new discoveries that were not monopolized and do it through a way of looking for win-win cooperation, points of common interest. That's why JFK offered the Russians the ability to work with the United States on a joint space program together. So that would be something to break away to liberate us from this mathematical, you know, balance of terror uh, way of governance. I'm ending up now, I think maybe three, four more minutes. So after the age of assassinations again in the 60s, very parallel to the thing that was happening after the 1890s to World War I, again, age of total assassinations and color revolutionary coups, you have a, the stage is set now for a full economic recolonization of the United States. Um, especially the focus has always been take back control of the United States. Um, you have this with several things happen. And Kissinger is a key figure in much of this. Um, you have the creation in January 1971 of the Inter Alpha Group, created under the blueprint of Lord Jacob Rothschild, who had the was running NM Rothschild and Sons, but also has been a, a major banking financier interest as a part of a mercenary dynasty since the 1700s. Um, so the Inter Alpha Group of banks um, was a coterie of. There's a picture of it there of the member banks with key major banks set up in each of the focused European countries to advance a new doctrine of deregulation, uh, central, take, centralizing power away from nation states, especially in Europe, and moving it into the private supranational uh, coterie of uh, corporate and financial interests above national authorities. Um, <clears throat> so you, I won't go into, I don't have time to go into detail there. That was 1971, that group was founded. It has since grown in number since its original founding six. Many of these banks were all tied to uh, you know, financial activities supporting fascism's rise, whether Franco, Mussolini, or Hitler earlier on. Um, a lot of that whitewashed. Then you have same month, the World Economic Forum is founded by one of Kissinger's prodigies, um, who we all know and um, despise, Klaus Schwab. Um, also, one of the co-founders was Maurice Strong, a, a Canadian oligarch who was picked up by the Rockefellers and was a co-founder of the Canadian uh, Club of Rome, um, major player with Prince Philip, who is the guy calling, who is called for being reincarnated as a deadly virus who ran the World Economic Forum. In my February 26th presentation, we're going to go into detail in, in that, in it'll get gory. Um, so Maurice Strong, another figure um, who was a co-founder <clears throat> and insp inspirer of Klaus Schwab. Then you have the big deal here, which is the August 15th, 1971, U.S. dollar is floated. Kissinger and Schultz, running the Nixon administration, uh, orchestrate the removal of the dollar from the, the, gold, the gold reserve, the, the gold exchange system, or the, the, the fixed exchange rate system that was preventing speculation on currencies and commodities. That, you know, as long as you didn't have speculation, it was difficult to conduct the sorts of economic warfare against nations trying to develop their infrastructure and their industrial base, which has always been, even going back to the 19th century, a, a tool used by empire to keep nations destabilized, this economic warfare. So the fixed exchange rate had to go. It, it guaranteed too much stability. You were able to think long-term, five, 20-year projects could be conceptualized when you had relative stability of currencies. Um, and that was floated onto the, the floating markets. So all of a sudden the markets became the determinant of the value of the dollar that became increasingly embedded again, under Kissinger's lead to the price of oil on the spot markets. So all of a sudden this created a, a degree of very, of, of uh, chaos in, so you could no longer really build or maintain or improve your infrastructure, your capital intensive part of your economy that you need to always have as the basis of your economic value in the system. That became atrophied and increasingly the age of deregulation, speculation was upon us. Uh, I mentioned here for good measure, uh, the Trilateral Commission founded in 1973 under Brzezinski, Kissinger, and David Rockefeller. Um, again, the, the hand of the Council on Foreign Relations, which is the, again, the round table movement is always there as well as the Bilderberger Group, which is always there. Many of these figures are overlapping with this other thing that I'm gonna talk about on February 26th in more detail. So this is what takes over under Carter, the Trilateral Commission. Uh, nearly every member of Carter's cabinet is a member of the Trilateral, Trilateral Commission. People like Paul Volcker, who becomes the Fed chair, calls for a controlled disintegration of the U.S. economy in 1979, which is where the interest rates are raised to 20% or more for two years, destroying small and medium businesses and only leaving these multi-behemoth multinational companies able to survive and thrive and gobble up under mergers and acquisitions. Um, 
Hen Henry Kissinger delivers at this time a 1981 speech at Chatham House in the UK describing uh, the difference between Churchill and Roosevelt's views of the post-war age and describing, people can read this, it's an appendix in my volume two, uh, the, full, the full speech. Um, but he describes how he preferred the Churchill way of thinking about geopolitics over the Roosevelt idea, which he saw as obsolete and incompatible with reality. But in it, he also describes his time as Secretary of State under uh, Nixon, where he says the British were so matter of factly helpful that they became a participant in internal American deliberations to a degree probably never practiced between sovereign nations. In my White House incarnation then, I kept the British Foreign Office better informed and more closely engaged than I did the American State Department. It was symptomatic. Total admission. They don't even hide this as saying like, oh, he didn't really say that. No, they, they just admit it. They just, associate, they just assume that we're too dumb to put words and actions together. Um, Lord Jacob Rothschild in 1983 delivered a speech calling, saying that two broad types of giant, giant institutions, the Worldwide Financial Services Company and the International Commercial Bank with a global trading competence may converge to form the ultimate all-powerful, many-headed financial conglomerate. What he's referring to is the breakdown of the division of bank activities from commercial investment, trusts, insurance, all of these had formerly under Roosevelt originally been designed in separate compartments. So you couldn't speculate with people's savings. You couldn't legally do that. He was talking about taking that away so that you can create a new type of universal banking that does everything. What today we might call too big to fail. Um, this was done originally in, in Britain under Margaret Thatcher's big bang where the first wave of universal banking was created and London again sort of restored even more of its control than it had formerly enjoyed. Uh, you have a near total collapse of a speculative bubble that results in 25% collapse of the, 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 the stock exchange in New York. Um, as a response to avoiding the collapse, Alan Greenspan is brought in and immediately normalizes creative financial instruments, otherwise known as derivatives, that had formerly been illegal for the most part of that, that, I mean, these were known as like junk bonds, securitized debts and that were worthless, but that were still securitized and then gambled upon with insurance that became also securitized so that people could, I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's complex, but it's insane. It's not a way that you make any value. And it became kind of like a cancerous tumor that grew up in the economy to the point that by 1992, when the Maastricht Treaty was, was affected, creating the European Union as a new consolidation to get rid of nation states and get rid of the right of nations to emit their own and control their own credit in Europe, um, there was about $2 trillion of derivatives. That same year, you have the Soviet Union dissolving. The end of history is being celebrated. George Bush says in 1990, uh, at the opening of the Kuwait War, that we have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order where we are successful and we will be. We have a real chance at this new world order. Um, so this is a point where Margaret Thatcher is bragging that she put the, the steel in the, into the spine of Bush who was wavering on the, on the issue of Desert Storm. Um, but again, the idea was always, it's the end of the nation state system now. Finally, it's the end of the Cold War. It's a unipolar era of, of what today might be called the uh, neoliberal world order. Um, Soviet Union is totally privatized, destroyed, targeted for destruction, overseen by Strobe Talbot, who is the point man on the ground, Rhodes Scholar, uh, working closely with the IMF. Um, NAFTA is signed to again, get rid of more powers of nation states in North America and move powers into the hands of private corporations above nations. World Trade Organization, and then big time Glass-Steagall, the separation of US banking commercial from speculation is broken down by Clinton, Rhodes Scholar, uh, last act in office. And then from that point forward, you have um, the ushering in of just the biggest cancer of derivatives, going from two trillion in 1992 to 70 trillion in 1999. By that point, overlapping the U.S. global global GDP to the point that only 10 years later, you have the deregulation completely of over-the-counter derivatives because Glass Steagall is now gone. Too big to fails become bigger than God, they, or so they want us to believe. So we have to bail them out. It's like a gun to the head if they go bankrupt. And by 19, uh, 2007, when the, the next collapse hits, there's $708 trillion of derivatives weighing down the system, far outweighing the $15 trillion of the US GDP. Strobe Talbot in 1992 made his manifesto saying um, all countries are basically social arrangements, no matter how permanent or even sacred they may seem at any one time. In fact, they are all artificial and temporary. 
Perhaps national sovereignty was not such a great idea after all, but it has taken the events in our own wondrous and terrible century to clinch the case for world government. That's from his birth of a global nation. Just uh, two last slides here, I'm done. Um, just to get clear, the, the, the takeover of financial services over the, and the collapse of the real economy, the real part that has value, that sustains life, that has been the trend. You have the crossover of the, uh, uh, which, what you have there is the, uh, the real estate, rental, leasing, finance, speculation, uh, overlapping in 1987 with the physical manufacturing base. That's just one of many graphs uh, put forward. To, you know, and this is a real economy only works if you have the financial side always servicing and improving upon the real side, manufacturing, infrastructure, science. If, if the, the financial side is not servicing that, it's a fake, it's a bubble and the bubble will pop. And that's why the bubble that was created today, which is popping, was a planned disintegration. It was always designed from 1971 to disintegrate. The question is, when would be the pinprick? The pinprick has happened. Point is, why is there an encirclement of China, of Russia, by the US military, by the British? Why are there all these psyops? Why are these, there are so many um, different types of CIA connected operations to destroy and destabilize Eurasia right now? And I mean, I, I've talked about this in my last presentation and there's, this is well documented. What's going on? What are they afraid of? Um, I just, I'm gonna end with this last quote by Putin. Uh, people might feel feelings of rage when they see Putin's face because they've been fed a lot of propaganda in the media, I don't care. but. In a recent speech, Putin just said, only sovereign states can effectively respond to, to the challenges of the times and the demands of the citizens. Accordingly, any effective international order should take into account the interests and the capabilities of the state and proceed on that basis and not try to prove that they should not exist. Furthermore, it is impossible to impose anything on anyone, be it, in the, be it the principles underlying the sociopolitical structure or values that someone for their own reasons has called universal. After all, it is clear that when a real crisis strikes, there is only one universal value left, and that is human life, which each state decides for itself how to best protect based on its abilities, culture, and traditions. I went over my time. I'm really, really sorry I did that, but I really wanted to just drive home a few key lessons of world history. And uh, if there's any questions, if there's time for that, I'll, I'll happily answer. Thank you, Matthew. Let me just... Um verify that I understand you correctly. The main point is that um, the British Empire has never ceased to exist. It is still there. Colonialism is still existing, except it's, uh, it's existing under a different name. It has never stopped to um, try and pull the United States back in, um, but for some reason, it hasn't really been successful. Uh, is that is the outcome of, outcome of this? Is that what we're seeing with the um, with the uh, deep state idea? Is the deep state that part in the country that tries to uh, uh, reintroduce the United States into the Anglo-American system and uh, into well the city of London, basically? I have no problem with what you just said. Um, yeah, I have no problem with that. Okay. Um, now, it, it has not, as far as I can tell from what you're telling us, it hasn't failed in Canada. Their attempt to keep Canada under control has been very successful. Uh, I mean, just from listening to how Justin Trudeau uh, 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 took his oath of office, he uh, swore allegiance to the British crown, to the, to the Queen of England. Um, doesn't, doesn't that bother the uh, Canadians? For those who know, it's a paradigm shifter. It's a, it's a big, but there's a big cognitive dissonance that's been put there by years and generations of conditioning um, of, I mean, here's the thing. I, I, in, in one of the chapters, I go through the, the creation of a synthetic nationalism in Canada, arranged by none other than Lord Milner himself, who ran the Rhodes Trust in 1909 and came to Canada with, with Mackinder, who is at the time, I mean, he's the founder of, of geopolitics in its modern form, but at the time, he was the head of the, 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 the Fabian Society's London School of Economics. Now, he quit his job as the head of the, the London School based upon an offer made by Lord Milner, who is from the Round Table, right, who runs through Oxford. So you have 
the LSC and then the, in Oxford. So he quit his job to come to Canada with Milner to formulate a grand strategy to figure out how the hell do we keep Canada as a wedge between Russia and the US and also with Germany, because at the time Germany was still, uh, it is not, it wasn't um, a fascist state at all. Like there was still a lot of anti-colonial, anti-fascist impulses in very high positions of power um, around the Frederick List Society and, other, and others. So <clears throat> Milner actually, there's a quote where he says, of the three greatest dangers to the British Empire, uh, the, the preferred thing is greater cohesion. So the, the first, the top three scenarios for the future regarding Canada is number one, be, greater cohesion and integration into the British Federation. That's probably not going to happen. Uh, you still had Wilfrid Laurier, Lincoln admirers, other things, right? So it was not going to happen. He said the greatest danger is greater cooperation with that United States of 1909. That's the greatest threat to the British Empire. Um, the, the, the middle ground is the growth of a Canadian nationalism. Um, and he says the, and he actually says the Canadians are so wonderfully ignorant to the longer forces of history, and they are even so uh, they feel that they're superior to the to the Americans in almost every way. It's bumptious and it's it's fantastic. Those are his words. It's just fantastic how ignorant they are, and we should go with that angle and really craft a new um, nationalism for them. And that is exactly what became the entire trend of the 20th century leading up to the creation of the artificial Canadian flag with a maple leaf that doesn't mean anything, unlike other countries who have flags that mean something. It's literally just a maple leaf. Um, that's what it means. And uh, people like Vincent Massey, who was his, uh, his prodigy, became our first Canadian governor general who ran and managed much of this. Uh, these were all eugenicists. Um, they created the Canadian Fabian Society as well, which is a whole story run by five Rhodes Scholars in 1931. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, Canada has been, there's a lot of, of uh, cognitive dissonance and um, myths that have been created that are sacred cows that are, our minds are afraid to walk to. But now that we actually see the system demonstrating its true tyrannical hand, which it always has had, right? It, we just didn't push on it, so we didn't get to feel it. But now as soon as you demand something human, like liberty, um, you actually see the, the mask coming off. Um, now people, I think, are much more receptive to figuring out, well, what the hell is really going on? What, what is this thing called Canada? Um, and I think that overall, the, um, the, the, the lessons of great patriots who were ousted in Canadian history. I mean, we had our last national government in 1963 that was ousted in a Rhodes Scholar run coup. Um, 1963, that was our last national government. So... Um, <clears throat> you definitely have a hunger. And I think if the more people see and think about what Justin Trudeau just said in 2017 and look at what has happened, it'll piece, and it does piece a lot of things together. Um, the thing that is very important is a sense of, well, what should a true sovereign nation be? We know we, what it isn't now, but what should it actually do? Because we do have some serious objective crises, right? A, a breakdown of food production, supply chains, infrastructure. How do we actually manage coherently to make sure our children not only don't become slaves under this dystopic system, but that they actually have a life that can thrive, where we can invest in, in, in a national bank that serves the interest of the people with other nations organizing themselves in a common you know, way. Uh, that, that's a whole discussion that has to really take hold. And I think the current protests in Ottawa are a good start spark plug. Like there's a hunger now like I've never seen for these bigger ideas. That is Canadian national National, uh, nationalism, rather, asserting itself against the British crown, in essence, right? In essence. Okay. In essence. And, and it, I mean, it's based on something principled. It's not course. artificial. It's really based on the right yeah. to feed our families, to work, to have a life, and, you know, the basic fundamental things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. one, one final question. Um, mm -hmm. The power of the City of London combined with its fifth column, Wall Street, is it really true? Did I understand correctly that all that money, all that power was capable of starting two world wars, World War I and World War II, with these financial behemoths financing both sides? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, I feel like I've taken up too much time, but yeah. <laughs> Okay, Certainly. that's that's. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't un, didn't misunderstand you. And uh, finally, um, the uh, 
Two world you know wars. What? Anyone Sorry. who can anyone who can start two world wars uh, probably has no problem because I wrote this down when you said it to create diseases like terrorism and drug uh, trade. So that, in essence, is also um, started or was started by this financial behemoth, uh, City of London plus Wall Street. Yeah, and I would just add one quick thing on that, which is that um, the British, I, I conducted an interview with Alex Craner uh, based on a, on a wonderful trilogy he wrote on um, the, uh, the original British design for a new world order uh, under um, uh, people like Lord Halifax, the, uh, the appeasers of Britain uh, that were like people like Neville Chamberlain, who were part of an operation which all the way up until 1939, 1940 still wanted to have an Anglo-American fascist alliance with Hitler mm -hmm. um, and Mussolini and, and others to manage a, you know, the, the, the world as, as a new world order and, and be enforcers of a eugenics policy of population control under a, a scientifically managed society from the top. That was a design all the way up until the ouster of Neville Chamberlain when Hitler became a, a Frankenstein monster that was no longer sort of behaving according to its commands and had bigger ambitions to be sort of at the head of the helm instead of a secondary you know, enforcer for the will of a banker banking class. And they had to sort of change strategy and, and abort that plan. There's a whole story there, but yeah, the, the oligarchy, the lesson I carry out of, and I want everyone to carry out of this is that the oligarchy is, they screw up a lot. They're not as powerful as they want us to believe they are, which is a, 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 a you know, an intimidation of the mind. Every time you, you look at what they're trying, the thing that they're trying to do today is not new. They've tried many times mm -hmm. and usually they, it blows up in their face Mm -hmm. and just like undermines them too. No, so then they have to reorganize and try something new. Um, I do understand now, however, that uh, uh, Vera Sharaf, a Holocaust survivor, says that mm -hmm. she can't believe that she's fighting the same people, the same structures again, mm -hmm. that she fought uh, 75 years ago. Because it looks as though what happened then is happening again. Um, Matthew, I don't want to keep uh, my esteemed colleagues from asking any questions, so uh, please go ahead with your questions. Hi, uh, uh, Matthew, thank you so much for your evidence. Matthew, uh, the onset of uh, the statement, your evidence that you've given, you were talking about natural law. Um, as we all know, the substantive law that we are using in this grand jury is natural law. So I would like to find out from you, based on all the research that you've done, how important is natural law for humanity's survival? And most importantly, how is it related to constitutional law? Thank you. Dexter, that's an amazing question. That's, that's a very good question. Um, in my understanding, um, all of world history um, has been shaped by a battle between either artificial law. I mean, man mankind is the only species that we know of that that creates and improves upon the laws of the systems that we self-organize around other animals are um ordained by their genetics by their environment and their wiring to be what they are and that's great but human beings are uniquely able to craft conceptions and apply those conceptions to manage willfully our own existence and then again identify problems with the so-called invisible metaphysical machine of uh, statecraft and improve upon them but upon what standard do we improve upon? What, upon what standard do we judge our man-made laws to say, okay, this one squares with something that is uh, designed by God and which ones are out of whack, out of harmony, uh, that we have to correct, that are illegitimate, or as Thomas Aquinas would say, forms of violence. So if a law can actually dis destroys, deprives you of your innate ability to express your, your uh, life, liberty, happiness, creative powers, if if that's what a law is doing, it's not a law, it's a form of violence. It does not have to be respected. And that's what the founding fathers, from if you read the writings of, of Benjamin Franklin, uh, Thomas Paine, um, they, they were very sensitive to that fact that there is a, a higher law. It's, 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 it's not even separate from scientific law. That's why Benjamin Franklin was both a scientist who discovered principles of electricity that he shared. But in his mind, his discoveries of the laws of electricity were not separated from the metaphysical moral laws that became the foundation of his life's effort to create a republic of self-governance premised on the inalienable rights of the individual and not the hereditary institutions that had governed society for thousands of years. That was the first time it was done. And, and again, in his world, it was two sides of the same thing. Real science is not mathematical description. We're trying to impose a, a formula onto the universe and expect the universe to abide by it. It's, it's about tuning 
our own creative reason in harmony with that universe that is always going to be more discoverable. And every time we transmit those new, new Eurekas uh, in any domain to our fellow mankind and then apply it to the, tre the, the productive process, the universe responds by giving us greater standards of living, right? We can sustain more people at a higher standard of life than we could have if we didn't have electricity, if we didn't have knowledge of fire, where we were like living kind of like, you know, whatever, cattle in caves. So, but it, this, this reciprocal nature of the universe having this quality that mankind is made in the image of that universe under certain conditions, if, if, we, if we abide by those, those certain principles, as Benjamin Franklin and, and others understood, we will have greater emancipation. The empire, the oligarchical system of a hereditary elite will lose its um, claw, places to put its claws, like a parasite that it is, into the host. It won't have much to grab onto, and it will lose its power, and it will self-implode, as I think we're seeing right now. May I add something very briefly? Um, what we are now seeing in the jurisdictions of the United Kingdom, there's the jurisdiction of England and Wales, jurisdiction of Northern Ireland, jurisdiction of Scotland, the court systems in all of these uh, realms, which are basically common law, are starting to uh, uh, arrogate to themselves at judicial level the power to decide mens rea. They are further ahead than any common law or civil law jurisdiction in our repeated findings now in asserting that even if there is a jury there for show and they are, seem to be trying to get rid of them now under the spurious claim that international uh, treaty requirements require them to dwindle the use of juries, even if a jury is there for show, um, they, they re reserve the right to de determine what was in the mind of the perpetrator and very often now it's a drafting which comes from the tax-exempt foundations, such as the Carnegie Foundation that I spoke about earlier, via the House of Commons Library, tells the legislators in Britain, which then will lead other countries in the same way, the legislators are told there is an ersatz version of the public good or the, the public welfare now, it's called collective well-being, collective welfare. That's what the foundations were doing all through the 20th century, creating enemies for that very purpose. And now the courts are saying, if you have offended against society, then there is no redress. You are guilty. And that is the, the furthest towards getting rid of natural law that I've seen anywhere. It's gone further than any European totalitarian state, any international court. It's now coming through that the British national level through legislation, ultimately from the think tanks, the abolition of the, the concepts that natural law uh, decides whether you're guilty or not. Can I ask, um, like your opinion, if because we're seeing this not a 100% lockstep step constellation right now. We have this like still very strict uh, regulations in Australia and in Canada and these places. But, but then sort of you're saying that in England, it's basically they're preparing it like uh, from a different angle. So it's seemingly like uh, more relaxed at the moment. But I mean, they're preparing to to uh, you know, finalize the totalitarian grab from through a different angle, basically. Yeah, I, I am absolutely convinced of that. That the United Kingdom is in the lead, the Anglo Commonwealth is second, and the resistance to this will actually be largely in central european countries because they uh, have, give more weight to the rule of law uh, and to the institutions of courts than they do to uh, juries for example uh, they will show more uh, resistance welcome resistance to this idea it is definitely uh, britain or british based think tanks that are pushing on our legislators more than anywhere else in the world this idea that if someone meets the requirements in a code they are convinced they are convicted with with no defense possible so it's this spurious idea idea behind it of you offended against the interests of the common good that I'm afraid it, and you could from what Matt said you understand but I think now in some detail who is saying that why that what they are afraid of uh, they don't want any threat to their narrative any further questions from Anna or Deepali or Dexter or Virginie I I have one question um, is it possible that not only in Europe, but also in the United States, there is a movement that 
having understood what is going on, is trying to distance themselves. I'm talking about the United States, trying to distance themselves from the uh, Europeans and in particular from the city of London um, because we are simply buried under debt and we carry too much dead weight with us. Uh, I'm saying this in layman's terms. What do you think, Alex and, uh, and Matthew? For my part, absolutely, and I, the recent testimony I gave to you, I spoke about that, that, that there is a, a large bell, a belt of uh, Heartland America that has woken up to this and now sees uh, what they regard as, the, as an Anglo or an Anglo-European problem steering them. And I think that they are getting heartily sick of it all because of the amount of treason involved. I mean, just as codicil to Matt's uh, testimony about 1971, when the financial coup was pulled off, one of the indications that the Americans were being used as hapless pawns in this is that that very year, Kissinger is said to have said that the military, by which he largely meant the US military, were brute, dumb beasts sent to do others' biddings. Uh, and in that same year, being the new St Secretary of State under the, the incoming Nixon administration, he got a Massachusetts-based manufacturer, the only manufacturer in, in the world that could produce precision ball bearings, Bryant Chucking Grinder, uh, to supply the ball bearings to the, United, to the Soviet Union to allow them to develop multiple independent re-entry vehicle warheads which I know that one of our uh, extra uh, testimonials uh, this evening from Jim Bush, uh, well, he, he personally was involved in the American side of that. So the, the amount of treason involved is such that where the United States had even a military or an economic lead, uh, the cabal we're talking about deliberately abolished that. And I get a very strong sense from my extensive US contacts that a large swathe of the Americans do not wish to abolish their Anglo heritage, their common law heritage, but they have completely had it now with British and European intellectual leadership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. I, I don't want to say, I don't want to speak too much because I know I've, I've gone, we're going far beyond schedule here, but just to say quickly, uh, there are fifth columns in, in, in Russia, in, in every country has their own fifth columns. They've got their own battles between legitimate forces who represent these cultures versus these other parasitical penetrations. Um, I would say in Eurasia, you actually have had, um, Serious, more serious pushback in a serious way to the point that there is um, a genuine, um, I don't think this is a game, I think there is an actual genuine alternative uh, strategy that has been deployed uh, outside of the framework of the cage of NATO that is imploding and design, always, it was always designed to implode. Um, and I think you've got forces within the United States, I, I see it more currently on the state level, um, that don't want to go down with the sinking ship. There's, there's forces all over Europe. Um, Unfortunately, the federal executive branches of most of the transatlantic governments have been in large measure captured, uh, not entirely always, but in, in a depressing level. Um, so I don't, I don't have a, 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 I'm not an expert in geopolitical planning, um, and I do hope that the creative uh, forces are able to utilize the self-contradictions um, and insanity of the empire to their benefit, um, since again, this empire is, is it can only, once it succeeds, it can only destroy itself as well. Um, and I do see that there is, re there are people that want to have a future, that want to survive, and that are organically organizing. And I just think they need to sharpen up their, their game plan of what they understand the world to be. Because a lot of people still think, especially in, in America, and, and a lot of the patriots who don't like the Great Reset, um, they tend to have fallen for certain uh, traps that have put, given them a narrative that it's the Cold War narrative, that the real enemy behind everything it's not the British Empire, it's not the oligarchy, it's not that, it's, it's the Chinese commies that want to destroy your freedoms. That's who's behind everything. And, and you know, a lot of people fall into that. And I, I think that to the degree that they hold on to those uh, Cold War narratives, they're going to self-sabotage their overarching desires to have a successful battle against this oligarchical thing. Yeah, that's, that's what I threw out there. Thank you, Matthew. Any further questions from Anna or Dexter or Virginie or Dipali? No further questions from me. None from me either. Thank you. What a wonderful presentation. Yes, thank you, Matthew. If there are no further questions, then this concludes your testimony. Matthew, thank you very much. Now we will turn to Brian Garish and Debbie Evans for their presentation to us. 
Uh, Roger, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, do this. Um, you asked for a little bit of an introduction, so I'm going to say that uh, uh, my first career was as a Royal British Royal Navy officer. Uh, I was specialised in anti-submarine warfare, so I spent a lot of my time uh, finding, tracking Russian nuclear submarines. That was at the heart, height of the Cold War. And of course, I'm going to say that uh, as time has moved on and as I've got older and wiser, I realised that uh, much of what I believed at that time is incorrect. But just to give part of my experience was very much uh, within the military system during the Cold War time. And when I left the Navy in 19 1993, uh, I was to discover that uh, all was not as it seemed within society in UK. And uh, as a result of tracking mainly fraud and corruption in my own city and getting in contact with people who were seeing fraud and corruption in other major uh, UK cities, I then started to look at organisations which I could see were controlling events, but those organisations were not well known to the public. And uh, where did that take me? It took me ultimately meeting up with a great group of people. Uh, and uh, now we are running the UK column, producing news three times a week. Uh, previously, we produced a written newspaper, uh, but uh, uh, we are constantly analysing uh, what's happening. So it's on the basis of my previous military experience, my experience in the civilian world, including analysis through the UK column, uh, that I can give my testimony uh, to you this evening. And I'll also add, I'm delighted to be joined by a lady called De Debbie Evans, who's been doing some very de deep research uh, with us. And I felt it was only appropriate that she should be able to give uh, firsthand some indication of what she's found. Now, I've only got 30 minutes, so I'm going to try and move very quickly. And the first thing I'd like to do is try and bridge the scope of what our initial speakers um, had to say in their evidence. And I believe an analogy would be they have described the founding, the startup and the growth of a, an organisation of gangsters. And uh, we, we've heard about the history, we've learned something of the people, their networks, their mode of operation. Uh, we've had some evidence of world events that show us that these groups are, are operating. But then I'm going to say that uh, if we look back on how um, gangsters were dealt with and successfully brought down in the past. If we look at Al Capone or uh, other gangsters, probably America is a good place to go for that sort of image. Uh, they were brought down by looking at the crimes they carried out and ultimately collecting the real evidence of the crimes, whether those were murders or it was uh, drug running or prostitution. There had to be the real evidence of the crime. There had to be the intent. There had to be the named persons who were involved in those crimes. And it was only when that evidence was brought forward, they could be brought into court and subsequently found guilty or at least brought before the law and then ultimately serve their time. So I'm going to say that for our jury, which is a world audience, uh, the first two speakers have done a great job of saying that there is a uh, there's a conspiracy, there's a a group of gangsters that are operating. They've got huge power and wealth. What are those gangsters trying to do? I think the aim for those gangsters is world dominance. They want to control everything, society, uh, raw materials, methods of production, people, politics, everything must come under their control. And uh, ultimately, we then say, what are their crimes? Well, the crime, I was jotting them down while I was listening to the speakers. Uh, we're looking at oppression. We're looking at slavery. Uh, we're looking at poverty, hunger. We're looking at human trafficking and ultimately we're looking at death. And at that point, I believe that 
we now have a very important major world event happening, and that is the so-called COVID-19 pandemic, followed by a vaccination program, because in my mind, the overwhelming evidence is showing that these gangsters are killing people. So we are here as a as a call to law to talk about the crime. What is the crime? In my view, the crime is death. In previous years, we've seen people dying as a result of their created wars. Uh, but in more recent times, we're seeing people dying as a result of, of the introduction of a pandemic and how that pandemic was handled and uh, how it is being treated, in inverted commas, with a vaccination program. Now, both speakers mentioned something which I think is very important. Um, Alex talked about they want to control our minds, said that they want, quote, civilised control over politically backward people. And that latter quote uh, absolutely shows the arrogance of these individuals, these gangsters, because they believe that any opinion they hold is the correct opinion, the correct value, and anybody who challenges them is a left being who I would jest ultimately they want to remove uh, from their field of operations. And what does that mean? Ultimately, they would like these people to go away and die. So let's just uh, remind ourselves and bridge across to the fact that uh, Alex said that this is a battle for our minds, and this is very true at the moment. Rhino, when I gave you uh, my initial uh, thoughts on what was happening, I said we need to be aware that alongside the COVID-19 pandemic and the subsequent vaccination programme, we need to be aware that there is a battle for our minds by an applied political psychological attack. So if I bridge the gap, I happen to have a couple of papers with me. The first one is entitled Mental Health. Uh, the subtitle is Strategic Planning for Mental Health. It was by a certain Jail Reese. And interestingly enough, the date on this paper that I hold is October 1940. So in the middle of the Second World War, or the, the start of the Second World War, I should say, we had a group of people who were later to become very powerful within the World Health and World Health Organization system, discussing how they were going to implement what they called mental hygiene in the new society. And they didn't mess around because they said that in doing it, they were going to infiltrate social organizations. They were going to attack the professions they were going to infiltrate social activities and, um, and professional societies, and that they were going to unleash a long-term uh, plan of propaganda. And I'm going to reinforce that 1940 paper by saying very quickly, I have another one in my hands, which I'm, of course, happy to uh, share as evidence. Uh, it's entitled Psychiatry. It's part of the Journal of the Biology and pathology of inter interpersonal relations. It's dated February 1946, and it's talking about the re-establishment of the peacetime society. And the uh, author is a certain G.B. Chisholm. And if people re research that name, they'll find another figure who's deeply connected with the sort of societies that Matt has very concisely put, put in front of us. Why should we pay attention to this second? Uh, uh, because it's talking about the use of the psychiatric system in order to implement, yes, this program of mental hygiene. And if, uh, if our jury wishes to know what mental hygiene means, it essentially means that you're not fit to be a human being unless you adopt the views and values and opinions of the gangsters uh, that we've already uh, determined have a plan for domination. So I'm going to say that when I began to uh, research what was happening in in uh, UK from a, um, a point of view of crime and fraud, uh, threats and bullying at local level, 
I quickly established to my astonishment that there was a charity, it was called Common Purpose, that was acting in a very political way in creating future leaders. And I was fascinated that these people were installing themselves in UK cities and effectively manipulating, taking control, you could say, of politics within those cities. So here was a group of people uh, recruiting people they considered to be future leaders, uh, starting to take over the control of cities within UK. Well, if I broaden that out, within a few years, that organisation was operating overseas in countries like Germany, Holland, uh, India, Australia, where they were recruiting people in those countries in order to bring them um, within an agenda of change agents to change the way we think and conduct our business in society. And if, if we say, where did this uh, organisation come from? Uh, well, it was started in about 1985 as a result of uh, one particular um, lady, the chief executive at the time, Julia Middleton, coming back from, I believe, Chicago, but certainly America, saying she'd learned some amazing things about how to change society. And the interesting point was that a large sum of money was collected from a number of banks. And remember, the monetary power has been central to the first two speakers' dialogue. Uh, but Common Purpose was able to get going with funding from major banks that were never disclosed. However, I can uh, say with great confidence that Deutsche Bank was one of the key banks working with that organisation. Now, why have I brought in Common Purpose? Well, Common Purpose was a key example of an organisation you could track, you could see the documents, you could see the people, and you could see that it was unleashing a plan to change our society uh, without the average member of the public understanding this. So where, where do we need to come to now? I, I think really we need to just do a little recap on what... Um, Alex mentioned, because I'd like to bring you back to the Mindspace document, which is my slide number one, if we can bring this up on screen. And this, this document produced by the British Cabinet Office uh, was a document where they had been working with psychologists for a long time to learn how to change the way that people thought and behaved without people understanding this was happening. That's not an opinion by me, because if we go to the second slide, hopefully it's coming up on screen. Uh, if you read the text on screen, it says that the government, the British government, would be able to change the way people thought, the way, the way they believed their behaviour, and people would not necessarily recognise that this had happened. It would be subconscious. Their behaviour, their thoughts would have changed, but they would not know. But the document further qualifies it by saying that if people did realise how their uh, behaviour had changed, they would not necessarily know how it had been done. Now, let me connect that more or less right up to date with the COVID-19 pandemic, because if we bring slide three uh, onto your screen, uh, these are the minutes of um, the spy B, as it's called. It's part of the British government's wise scientists group, SAGE, who were commenting on how we should be, quote, fighting COVID. But spy B was a team of specialists, including behavioural specialists, who were going to use applied psychology to get people to adhere to the British government's policy on COVID-19. And why, what I draw people's attention to are really two paragraphs. One is at the bottom of the left-hand page where it says the perceived level of personal threats, sorry, the perceived level of personal threat needs to be increased amongst complacent using the hard-hitting emotional messaging. So here was a government team advocating the use of applied psychology in order to make people fearful. 
And I would say that it's no wonder that we now have trained psychologists and psychiatrists pointing out the danger of making people fearful, particularly if you use techniques which mean they have no way of grounding where that fear has come from. This is not my opinion. I'm quoting directly from the British government's own document. And what is equally concerning is uh, a later paragraph, paragraph seven, talks about coercion, in which it says consideration should be given to the use of social disapproval, uh, but with a strong caveat around unwanted negative consequences. What they're talking about is using people to police each other, people to say, I'm wearing a mask, you're not wearing a mask, you're a bad person, get out of my way. But the caveat that they introduced to this was because they recognised that this psychological technology could unleash violence in communities. Now, I have taken in one quick step discussion about how you can dominate people into an area where we are seeing the British government in, 29, in 2010, which is the original document, but also through to the present day, boasting that it could use applied psychology to, way, to change the way people thought and the way people behave. What did they do with that psychology? That psychology was actually um, uh, was sold initially to America and Australia look at what is happening in Australia in relation to COVID lockdown at the moment. But ultimately, the technologies, as Debbie will indicate in, in a few moments, uh, was actually sold off worldwide. So now we have world governments able to use this applied behavioural psychology to change people's views, values, behaviour, and they simply do not know this has been unleashed on them. And just to reinforce this point, if I can bring up on screen slide four, uh, this is a document which I've only found very recently, but it's entitled uh, Behavioural Insights Applied to Policy, Germany, Country Overview. This is an EU document which is effectively boasting of exactly the same thing, how applied behavioural psychology can be used to change uh, community, public, political opinion. Um, and it's giving a whole list of German organisations, which I'm sure will be sorry, I'm sure will be uh, much more significant to the panel than to me, but a lot of them are universities and research organisations. This document is effectively simple proof that these political psychology techniques have certainly been spread throughout Europe. So uh, I'm going to suggest it's very clear that we have a team of gangsters in power, whether we're talking UK or the European Union or the US. And in the hands of these gangsters, uh, we have got a very dangerous weapon of applied behavioural psychology. Let me now jump to the subject of um, COVID-19 and in particular uh, vaccine effects. In the United Kingdom, we have the Medicine and Health Products Regulatory Organization, the MHRA. That organization supposedly is tasked keeping the public safe with regard to pharmaceutical products and vaccines. And as part of the vaccination programme in UK, they've been collecting data on vaccine adverse reactions, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which they call the yellow card system. And uh, to date, uh, if I can just find the, the figures, because I noted them down, to date, their own statistics say that there have been nearly one and a half million adverse effects from vaccines and there have been close to 2,000 deaths with a caveat they have made themselves to say that they believe it likely that only 10% of the vaccine adverse effects that have actually occurred have indeed been logged. 
So, of course, that takes the number of deaths from 2,000 to 20,000. And what is interesting when you do this is we're now starting to see vaccine deaths outstrip the dangers of COVID-19. But we have to remember that the MHRA as a government department is perfectly prepared to use the same skills in applied psychology that the British government has boasted they can use to mislead the public and change their behaviour. So when we approach the MHRA and say to them, we ask them a simple question, where is your quantitative risk assessment to show that the vaccine adverse reactions are not a result of the vaccinations themselves, the MHRA stalls um, fails to answer, produces uh, very um, uh, confusing replies. But the number of it is that this key organisation, the MHRA, has not conducted a quantitative risk assessment into the adverse effects of vaccinations. And I'm going to put it to the uh, panel. Uh, we're, in a, we're effectively in a court uh, that the MHRA, who holds the duty of protecting the public from dangerous pharmaceutical products, know, <coughs> excuse me, knows uh, that people are dying as a result of the vaccination campaign. And I'm going to add that the British government certainly knows that, but is prepared to use psychology in every single verbal, written and media response around the dangers of the COVID and the vaccine policy. Now, just before I hand over to Debbie to, to get into some of the, the way that the system works, I just wanted to point out that, of course, the, the whole of the control uh, of COVID-19 policy and the so-called health care policy around COVID-19 and vaccinations has been carried out by the British Cabinet Office who have an embedded applied behavioural psychology team with them. So we know what they're capable of, they're boasting of it in their own document, and ultimately we're seeing the real evidence of people suffering and dying. But I'd like to just hand over to Debbie, because if we follow this trail on, we come to how the system works in UK, at least, where we're seeing a form of medical fascism uh, between government and the global pharmaceutical industry working alongside universities and charities within what has been named the, the Golden Triangle in UK. So if I could just hand over to Debbie just to take the last 15 minutes. Thank you, Brian. Um, good evening, everyone. My name's Debbie Evans. I'm a retired um, state registered nurse. I trained at the Royal Free Hospital in London, where coincidentally, um, they're now nursing Lassa fever as of today in the UK. Um, and I did postgraduate training at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in the City of London. And I was a government advisor at the Department of Health for the UK government for five years. And I'm a medical researcher. And um, Brian led us very, very nicely there into um, what we call in the UK, Locks Bridge Triangle or the Golden University, the Golden University Triangle. And um, there is a screenshot of a map of the UK, if, if you can put it up, just to show the locations of Oxford, Cambridge and London in the triangle. I don't know if you're able to see it or not. You can see it, fabulous. Um, Cambridge is the highest digital tech center in the UK. It's ranked 12th in the European Digital Index and it's actually known as Silicon Fen. Um, it's got a huge biomedical campus on site. There is a screenshot of the biomedical campus which will tell you um, what is on the biomedical campus and what's on it 
uh, amongst other things, is uh, Papworth Hospital, which has been moved to the biomedical campus, which specialises in heart and lungs. Uh, we've also got Adam Brooks Hospital, which specialises in donation, donated organs um, and transplants. Um, we've also been told by Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister, that there will be a cancer research hospital being erected there as well at a huge cost, despite the fact that cancer rates in the UK have been falling. We're to have a cancer research hospital. Also on that campus is the Medical Research Council, Cancer Research UK, which I'll come back to in a minute, the Anne McLaren Regenerative Laboratory, and the NHS Blood Transfusion Centre. Um, so that's, uh, and amongst other things, that's at Cambridge and AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca's headquarters with GlaxoSmithKline too. Um, what's interesting about um, Cambridge is that uh, Cancer Research UK, which is meant to be a charity, but would appear not to be a charity at all. Um, Professor Robert West, um, is a consultant for Cancer Research UK and he's also on the SPY B team, the behaviour team that uh, Brian was just talking about with regards to SAGE. Professor Robert West's wife, uh, Professor Susan Mickey, is the head of the behavioural insights team at the Cabinet Office. Um, she's a long uh, she's a, a lifelong communist and it has designed the behavior change wheel and has rolled that out into many countries. Uh, the behavioral insights team appear to be global now. Um, with regards to going back to the Golden Triangle in Oxford, we've got one of the most dynamic digital tech economies in the UK um, with a big campus there with Oxford Nanopore, um, very, very high tech biomedical campus. Um, we've also got um, Milton Keynes is mentioned in this Golden Triangle because it's the UK's first smart city. Um, using sensors, which I'll come on to, and big tech innovation. So going down into London, uh, there is another slide, uh, Med City, um, if you can see that, which is a knowledge economy. It's, see, it's um, meant to be the digital cap capital of Europe, and it's been named by Tech Nation, attracting 2.1 billion billions worth of investments. So the golden triangle within the UK is where all the attention seems to be focused on. And the UK government has actually just announced it's um, investing 5.5 billion into infrastructure around the golden triangle, which is sometimes known as um, the Locksbridge Triangle. Um, and the brain, uh, the brain curve, I think it's known as as well. So when we look at the Golden Triangle and the universities that are involved, um, we can see that the Golden Universities, Oxford and Cambridge, I've also got attached to them the Russell Group, which are 24 universities within the Russell Group that work very closely alongside the Golden Triangle universities and receive a lot of funding. Um, where I'm seeing, um, what I'm seeing really is two things coming up ahead. One is that the MHRA in the UK um, would like to become the global regulator. On their board sits Raj Long, who's the deputy director for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, she specialises in safety and pharmacovigilance and also the chief scientist for Microsoft. So we see huge conflicts of interest there. We also see um, some conflicts of interest with regards to the British government to, to ministers and some of the ministers interests are into the big four audit companies, KPMG um, and Microsoft also, Deloitte, um, AstraZeneca, Goldman Sachs and the European Investment Bank. So a lot of our ministers have conflicts of interest within those, within those areas. What we can see coming up um, is that Deloitte 
in particular, I just focus in on Deloitte for a minute because um, Deloitte, Ernst Young, KPMG, and PricewaterhouseCoopers um, take up 67% of global accounting. All four are based in London, um, and they Deloitte's have been central to the test and trace. Uh, Lord Bethel, who has now resigned, um, had a company that was purely for lobbying on behalf of Deloitte for, for, um, for bids. And it's very concerning to see that when you see all of the, these people intertwined with one another, what could be coming up in the future. And I just want to go back very quickly to how charities seem to be involved in this as well as government organisations and um, what, what I would call in, in fact a quango. Um, Cancer, Cancer UK, I can just find my notes, I'm so sorry, I've got a book of notes to try and, to try and be very quick because I realise we haven't got very much time. Um, Cancer UK is uh, funded by many pharmaceutical companies. In fact, I would say it's the research and development centre, actually, for pharmaceutical companies, AstraZeneca, GlaxoSmithKline, Bill and Melinda Gates. But also advising uh, cancer research is Professor Robert West, who's Professor Susan Mickey's husband, a behavioural insights team, funded by Pfizer and funded by Cancer Research UK, who are also right in the middle of the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. Um, as well as that, with regards to the UK government, they published a vaccine hesitancy guidance with interventions on the 27th of September 2019, way before Wuhan was even mentioned. Um, they are also looking at, and I'm, I'm very concerned with regards to antimicrobial resistance. The UK government has its own UK envoy, Dame Sally Davis, who used to be our chief medical officer, who is the chief envoy, the UK envoy for antimicrobial resistance. And what I'm seeing coming down the line is we appear to see um, people being tested for HIV, but according to Forbes, the next pandemic um, would be expected to be tuberculosis. I know that Professor Montagnier, um, I'd like to send my, condone, my sincere condolences to his family and all those that know him, by the way, um, extremely, extremely sad um, that he passed recently. But Professor Montagnier was mentioning to one of his colleagues with regards to the BCG vaccine. And it would appear that Professor Chris Whitty, our chief medical officer, was giving a presentation at Gresham House three nights ago um, and was linking also tuberculosis and HIV. Um, and the World Health Organization is very keen on eradicating antimicrobial resistance and TB, we've had BCG for TB for a long, long time. And it's thought that the TB um, levels are rising um, exponentially, including here in the UK. And we're now seeing new vaccines being developed for TB and new testing facilities for TB. So I'm looking down the pipeline and seeing a reference to tuberculosis. I'm also looking at cancer and dementia because that would appear to be on the rise as well um, in particular with regards to cancer obviously we don't know the long-term side effects of the vaccine um, and or whether it could be carcinogenic carcinogenic but certainly one of the antivirals that they're using here in the uk and the uk alone molnupiravir would appear to be carcinogenic uh, teratogenic and mutagenic we're using it here as on a clinical trial with panoramic. So patients that are receiving it are immediately hooked up onto the trial. Um, I'm also seeing um, all of these things that we are now seeing unwrap now. Um, in I don't know if you're aware of SPARS pandemic 2025 to 2028 which was a futuristic scenario. Um, I think Brian could probably show up a copy of it. I think he's got one handy. There it is, SPARS pandemic 2025 to 2028, which was a futuristic scenario 
from the John Hopkins Center on what would happen if a coronavirus, um, a coronavirus infected the world, basically. And it takes you on a month to month basis. Um, so what you could expect from the media, what you can expect from the pharmaceutical companies, what you can expect from governments with regards to lockdowns, with regards to testing, with regards to antibiotics and also um, antibiotic resistance. So antimicrobial resistance is a really, really big subject, one that pretty much everybody's looking at, the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, the UK government, and pretty much every government in the world is looking at antimicrobial resistance. So I'm um, looking at thinking, well, maybe possibly we could be looking at superbugs in, in the future. Um, with regards to going back, sorry to go back to the big four again, but it would seem that we also have conflicts of interests with regards to those. The CEO of Deloitte um, has now left, Deloitte retired, but is now on the board of Pfizer. Um, we also had the UK government, um, the UK government Hansard, I think I've actually got the Hansard numbers in, in May 2014, um, there was to be a merger between Pfizer and AstraZeneca, but the UK government were very undecided about it. So there is a reference in Hansard in volume 753. It was debated on the 6th of May, 2014. And again, in column 161 on the 7th of May, 2014, um, with the past Secretary of State, Matt Hancock, um, talking. So... Um, our British government are in it up to their necks, I believe, with regards to pharmaceuticals. We seem to be um, heading for global life science superpower um, since we've left Brexit. Uh, most of the agenda is with regards to life sciences and how we can be the global life, life science partner. Um, Cancer Research UK and the Francis Crick organization work together and they purely are funded pretty much by public donations but also by big pharma there's also uh, mainstream media adverts going out for a company called omaze o-m-a-z-a-z-e -A and it's a competition line where you can win a three million pound house but donations and proceeds go to cancer Cancer UK, Cancer Research UK. Um, some of the funders of Cancer Research UK, which are based on the Cambridge uh, Biomedical Campus, are the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Google, the World Economic Forum, Imperial College, Cambridge, UKRI, Bank of England, AstraZeneca, Crick Institute, CQC, and the and the BBC. So they are very, very heavily funded. And I don't think the public know this when they're jumping out of aeroplanes trying to raise money for cancer research. Professor Witte and all of our experts um, tell us that cancer rates are falling. However, um, we appear to be testing healthy people in the UK for cancer using Bill, um, uh, Bill Gates's company, Grail, uh, which was um, a joint venture with Jeff uh, with with Bezos, Jeff Bezos. Uh, it's now been contracted to work within the National Health Service in order to genome sequence using it by genome sequencing uh, for cancer. We're we're testing healthy people, and I would ask why we're testing healthy people. The reason that the government are giving is that the cost, the burden and the cost of cancer and aging and dementia is so high that we need rapid acceleration of diagnosis, rapid acceleration of treatment. So basically safety goes pretty much through the window as in the vaccine development, which is now going to be under Bill and Melinda Gates and Patrick Balance's 100 day mission. So any other pandemic that could be called you can guarantee that you'll have a vaccine within 100 days according to the 100 day 100 day mission um but um i don't know if anybody wants to ask any questions i'm very aware of time and that you're running over so i don't want to take up too much of the floor i would like to ask questions of each of you please uh pertaining to the uh psychological 
manipulation that's been going on. I'm Anna Garner from New Mexico, the United States. Um, and Ms. Evans, you mentioned that you had been a government advisor to the Department of Health. And this is very pertinent here uh, because I feel that this has been going on in the United States extensively. As an advisor to the Public Health Department, have you been aware that they use the behavioral psycholo psychological techniques that Mr. Garish discussed uh, as a way of enforcing their agenda uh, of coercion and social isolation, uh, coercion of uh, people undergoing experimental uh, medical interventions. Have you noticed that that is part of their uh, operating mo modus operandi, shall we say? When I was an advisor at the Department of Health, um, what was becoming blatantly obvious was that um, any advisor was really there as a tokenistic approach and that we weren't actually being listened to. Many of us uh, were ignored. Um, I wouldn't say that we were coerced. I certainly don't feel as though I was coerced into saying or doing anything. I, I'm pretty strong, so I did, I did challenge. In fact, probably my challenging people was causing more of an upset because I wasn't compliant, um, but it was purely tokenistic. Um, but as coercion, yes, I could see um, huge problems within the civil service many personal problems, many bullying. I, I, I was got very close to one of the senior civil servants on our particular board um, that was run by the, uh, by the then Norman Lamb, who was the Secretary of State. And there was a huge amount of bullying. There was a huge amount of competition within the civil service. We did notice that. But as an advisor, I, I, I wasn't part of the civil service, so it was just my observations. And, and not to um, interrupt you or anything, but what I was referring to was the psychological techniques of basically coercing the people um, as opposed to people who were involved in um, the advising, but rather the public. Could, uh, could, I, so, could I help here? Yes. This, can, I, can, can I respond? Um, as part of research that the UK column did, we did through the UK column, um, one of the areas that we were very interested in was um, training within our National Health Service by this charity, selecting future leaders. So this was common purpose. Uh, so we saw manipulation of people and their values by uh, this particular organisation. And it morphed into a specific sector of the NHS called NHS leaders. And these supposedly were fast-tracked people who were going to lead the NHS into even better healthcare. But what, what we see is that as these leaders with their newly acquired uh, values were unleashed, um, the management style in the NHS became increasingly domineering and bullying. And the ideas became less and less about the, treat, the care and treatment of, of people who were ill or injured. And it became much more about the um, importance of, of profits and money within the NHS. And uh, I'm going to say uh, it was apparent that the psychology of people was being manipulated. Uh, we, we have up on the UK Column website an article uh, which is entitled Towards a Million Change Agents. And that was not our title. That was the title of a paper written by an NHS common purpose trained individual who said that the NHS, in order to reach, my words, a future utopia, was going to need a million change agents. And what do they mean by that? People who were going to disrupt the performance of the NHS in order to get it to transition, to transform into what was supposedly to be a world-class uh, health provision. So I can give that to you as one specific example where we were looking at how the the, the management and leadership inside the NHS had cha changed. But I'll give you a very simple one about applied psychology in the NHS during the COVID crisis, because 
uh, mantras were introduced. Instead of medical decisions, uh, nurses and doctors started to follow mantras. And one of the ones that we were told out by a fully qualified, a highly qualified doctor in the last few days is um, and, and uh, relatives of somebody who'd suffered was that um, the mantra was COVID unvaccinated death pathway. COVID unvaccinated death pathway. And that is simply if the person was deemed or labelled as having COVID, if it was determined they were unvaccinated, the only result of their healthcare treatment was the death pathway. And there is no question that the, these particularly three word mantras that we've seen used by the government in particular have been driven through the NHS to the extent that uh, qualified doctors have said to us they've been amazed when they cannot discuss um, uh, genuine government figures on, for example, vaccine adverse reactions, because the person simply turns away or refuses to talk to them or becomes very aggressive. And the psychologist support that we're able to call on at the moment is self witnessing is cognitive dissonance in individuals, the result of their mental values being reframed. So oh, I, I, I could talk for a long time on this, but I'm going to say, yes, we are certainly seeing that there is the application of applied psychology in many areas in the NHS. And its overall effect is a degradation of healthcare treatment to the extent people are being killed when they could have survived quite happily had they been given the right treatment. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. And I had a follow-up question for you as well, Mr. Garish, and that was uh, this psychological operation by definition seems to be very subtle and below most people's level of awareness that they are being manipulated. If that's the case, uh, do you have any opinion about how, uh, how those people can be reached in a way that can uh, wake them up. I hear about the psychological dissonance and that sort of thing, the cognitive dissonance. Is there a way uh, in which these people can uh, be encouraged to see what's really happening, that they are being manipulated this way? Right. That, that of course, is a very important question. And uh, the response, and, and I qualify myself here because uh, I'm, I'm not professionally trained in psychology, but as a result of my work and investigation over mayors and advice I've received from fully qualified people, I, I, I'm going to give this as personal comment, but, uh, but I believe it to be very accurate. Um, if you apply... Um, if you apply um, a form of hypnosis to people, uh, the effect on a target audience generally forms a bell curve. You will find some people can be completely hypnotized. Uh, stage hypnosis uh, demonstrate this when people will go and do things they won't normally do in front of an audience because they're in a trance-like state. But if we use more forms of uh, manipulation, the effect on the target audience is a bell curve. So some people are very consumed with the message that's been put across, but it drops off either side to some people who are untotally. And the indications to us to date, and this is also supported by qualified psychologists, is that in the first instant, we need to concentrate on the people who are clearly not affected in order to spread the warning message to what's happening. We clearly need to be targeting the professions of psychology and psychiatry to say this is the abuse of those particular professions, particularly clinical psychology and psychiatry, which we can say has got a health beneficiary health result. And also to realise that people who've been subjected to this form of reframing or mind manipulation 
are victims and therefore they need to be treated in a very gentle and reassuring way because if we come at them in a in a very blunt way black and white way to try and make them see the truth uh, the result is that either they're going to become very hostile the cognitive dissonance or possibly they're going to become unwell mentally as a result of the immense assault on their value system and i can i just say to you it is very significant that in all the documentation about the british government's use of applied psychology get its political agenda uh, enacted there is absolutely no assessment as to what the adverse effects of such psychology may be on people who perhaps have uh, underlying mental health issues, anxiety or depression, um, and indeed where people have got undiagnosed uh, mental health conditions, so they're not even aware that they've got a problem. Somebody is using this psychology on them. You can do immense damage. And I believe it is no, excuse me, no co coincidence that uh, the official statistics in UK now show that the lockdown policy has caused a huge surge in suicides and mental illness, particularly among people tragically amongst young people but again uh, we can demonstrate that the uk government is hiding or manipulating the data sets that show this or they're using applied psychology in the way they present those data sets to the public in order to further mislead the public. This is the nature of the beast. Once you understand that you have what I'm gonna call a criminal political system that has the ability to use applied psychology to change the way the, the public thinks, we've got a very, very dangerous weapon in the hands of these elitists. And this, this is, easily evidenced i've i've put up a key document where the spy beam was boasting that we need to make people more fearful more anxious and there are many other documents and i've also demonstrated uh, for the benefit of of the germans uh, amongst the audience and on the team that uh, that applied behavioral psychology has now been let loose within germany certainly within France, because one of Sarkozy's personal teams, a gentleman called Oliver Willier, had meetings in UK facilitated by the Franco-British Council in 2010 to discuss how French neurological and psychological experts were going to work with the British in order to develop these political uh, these applied psychological techniques the evidence trail is there it's uh, when you know what you're looking for it's obvious but my goodness this is the most dangerous thing i believe we've ever seen if you have propaganda and political manipulation uh within of a type within nazi germany in many ways it could be seen the parades the banners the lights the rhetoric the posters but what we've got unleashed on us now is a subliminal attack on our minds and until we bring the full light to this it's going to be very very difficult for us to take the lid off what these people are doing through their covid and vaccination attack on people each of the pharmaceutical companies has access to this uh, psychological um, weapon. Each of the legal companies, the consult, the um, um, sorry, I've forgotten, Price Waterhouse Cooper, the uh, um, Debbie, help me out. What do we call these companies? Of audit, audit. auditing companies. Oh, the big four. Yeah. So. Everywhere we see charities, industry, public bodies working with the British government, we know that the use of the psychology is spread between them. 
So we, we've got to start talking about this in a very big way. And we've got to be, first of all, dealing with the people who are unaffected. They realise something's wrong, but they don't know what it is. And they, as the public, equally, they could be very intelligent and highly qualified professionals. And I'll just leave you to think about a um, well-qualified psychologist said to me, that's hearsay, but I'm going to repeat it, uh, said to me, Brian, the thing to remember is that people who are, are intelligent and have highly questioning minds can be more susceptible to the use of hypnosis, reframing applied psychology than somebody who is less intelligent and has less of an inquiring mind. So it is very wrong if anybody is thinking, well, I'm, I'm a bright person, I'm intelligent, I'm highly qualified. This would affect me. On the contrary, you may be more vulnerable. And could I Brian, just... perhaps... Uh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, just add there that the cascade of information, the NHS professionals that I'm speaking to and all of them that I'm speaking to are completely confused. They're having a cascade of information every single day. Things are changing. They don't know. What, I mean, I am seeing NHS professionals doing things that would be completely alien to them. I'm giving respiratorial depressants to respiratory patients, it's just alien to what we have been taught. So people are frightened. And, and I would echo what Brian said, you know, people when they are starting to wake up, they're scared. They don't know what's happening. They need us to, to reassure them because at the moment the agenda is confusion, chaos and crisis. And, and, you know, going back to what Brian just said just now about Deloitte's and about the big four, I mean, for anybody that doesn't know, De Deloitte's are, they've written papers on the future of the city of London, uh, the clinical trials, uh, their, their past CEO is now a board member of Pfizer. They're involved in the NHS. They're involved in corporate intelligence, as are the other three. And um, clearly, when Brian was mentioning Spa's pandemic, that goes hand in hand with Operation Claydex um, and Crimson Contagion. Now, Claydex was um, held by the John Hopkins University in 2018, I think, uh, simulating 900 million deaths. And Crimson Contagion, another exercise as well, um, that went on during the Trump reign, uh, for a response to a pandemic, uh, an ongoing pandemic of flu. So all of this has been well documented and well documented in the patent for the COVID testing by the Rothschilds, which again, everything that we can see within that patent in the main paper, we're seeing being rolled out now, including biosensors. You know, many people have spoken about RFID chips, but not many people are speaking about the advent of biosensors and how biosensors don't need the internet. You can have them in your clothes, on the sole of your shoes. They can be in your food and biosensors seem to be the way things are going to the point that there is a biosensor institute here in the UK, in Bristol, um, and the MHRA have actually approved one of the biosensors because you'll have bio, people will have biosensors in their cars, on their laptops, and their biometric data will be fed back so that all of your biometric, are you fit to drive a train? Are you fit to, to drive a coach? Are you fit to, to do anything? Your biometric data will be stored and it will be, um, it's, it's happening now. So, so if I put a little uh, summary on that, what, what we are seeing is uh, a political system integrated with uh, global commercial companies, pharmaceutical companies, unleashing an agenda uh, which has been to test vaccines on a population without any care for the damage and the dying. Where are they going? they're going for manipulation of our genes. There's no question of this. And Britain, all the data we're seeing at the moment is that it is UK that says it is going to take the world lead in putting this agenda together. 
uh, the, the UK and I'll qualify that and say I believe this would ultimately be driven by the City of London. But all of the UK documents say we will take the world lead. And this is the same UK that's unleashed this malicious applied psychology to change the way our cognitive processes work. It's a very, very dangerous combination. And just to Perhaps add my could... final point, sorry, my final point, Alex, is that um, the unique selling point for the United Kingdom is the National Health Service. Uh, there is no way to opt out of it. From, so from the moment that you're conceived and you've had, a, a, your, you know, the pregnant mums had a scan, there's data on that particular human being until the day we die. There's no way of opting out of the NHS. So NHS data is very, very precious and it's completely unique to the rest of the world. And, perhaps, and it's perhaps a we could succinctly, da database. Yeah. If we could succinctly illustrate that with the one slide I didn't show, I think it aptly summarises what Brian and Debbie have just said, if Paul can find it within a few seconds. It's a, a slide that UK Column has used quite a lot uh, of an organogram of the British government's ruling agency, the Cabinet Office, uh, with a new group, new in, since in the decade that I left British intelligence, called the National Security Council, like the American example from the FDR era, it's not original and not constitutional. And all of the bodies that uh, fall off uh, uh, away from the Cabinet Office under its control on that organogram are to do with controlling the agenda and to answer the question that was asked here to stop us from being able to show more people uh, what the paradigm is, uh, to stop them from being um, afraid by the uh, applied psychology that is being got to them. The military is involved, there's a 77 signals, uh, uh, 77th uh, regiment, a 13 signals brigade, there are entirely new British government uh, security agencies, the so-called Health Security Agency, the Joint Biosecurity Centre, all of these new since my time. And the, the buck stops with this Cabinet Office. And all the good sto studies of the Cabinet Office will show you that the leading committees there have a direct line to the City of London. They represent elite corporate will. There is no democratic control, and even the personal crown, the monarch, is not involved. So I don't know whether that was shown on screen a moment ago or not, but uh, people can also easily find it as a, one of the main UK column graphics, Cabinet Office Censorship Network, I believe we call it in one version. So ultimately what we're dealing with is um, a British system of psychiatric uh, manipulation which has been sold worldwide more or less uh, we have the city of london again um, aiming for world control um, is that why the common purpose people are creating their own future leaders is that is that a special position position apart from the young global leaders program uh, well, as with these things, the attack comes in from parallel directions. So uh, I, I would strongly suggest that many people with purpose network will have no idea of what the wider objective is. They are recruited uh, in the time I was really researching in detail. Somebody would be recruited locally and asked to join. It wasn't as, as if people were going to Common Purpose to join. Common Purpose sought out the people they wanted. And the agenda was clearly to train that future leader to work with other Common Purpose future leaders. And this is why it's so significant when you see Common Purpose now operating, for example, very strongly in India. And uh, uh, former Prime Minister David Cameron was part of the team promoting Common Purpose in India. So Common Purpose is one of the routes by which people are being recruited and reframed. Uh, the World Economic Forum Young Global Leaders would be another route via which probably more powerful people are recruited, reframed, to bring them in line with what their new role is. So um, Common Purpose is particularly operating at low level public um, level in the first instance, 
But as time went on from 1985, it was clear to see that they they got involved with the um, they got involved with the uh, corporate, the big global corporates, much more strongly, and um, and then from there they've gone to their world world status. But what are we doing? We're selecting people. Their egos are being stroked because somebody's suggesting they're going to become a very important future leader. Uh, World Economic Forum calls them global leaders. And then these people are being put together in, in order to change the world. That, that is the objective. Well, thank you very much. I think um, um, our next witness, Whitney Webb, is under a little bit of stress. Uh, that's why I hate to cut you off, but that's why I think we have to uh, give her a chance to uh, maybe fill in the gaps, um, which uh, we will try through asking questions. Um, unless my esteemed colleagues have any further questions we would very much like to thank you all three of you for your excellent presentations and then we would uh turn over um switch to uh, whitney is that okay well thank you very much brian and alex and debbie this is very important uh, as far as the geopolitical and historical background of what we're witnessing is concerned, and Matthew, of course. Um, Whitney, one of the questions that I, I uh, keep asking myself is what is the role of China in all of this? If you look at this as, a, uh, a as an Anglo-American or City of London uh, dominated game, really, what is the role of China in this? Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Before I start, okay, great. So um, I'm not really a China expert, but I have done some work on the transnational networks of capital and influence, I guess you could say, uh, from uh, sort of the nexus that people have been talking about so far today, the city of London, Wall Street nexus, um, and how they're very influential in China. Uh, probably uh, the best, most accessible ex example perhaps is Steve Schwartzman of Blackstone Capital, um, who finances the um, um, a program at a, I forget exactly which Chinese university, but it's very prestigious. And it, that's sort of like a, um, his personal version of the Young Global Leaders uh, program of the WEF in a sense. And of course, the Blackstone, uh, Blackstone group is uh, intimately related to BlackRock, um, having come out of that same uh, sphere in in Wall Street. Uh, he's considered one of the uh, U.S. China whisperers, um, as is of course the original uh, Ameri or, or a figure in American politics to have that uh, sort of title is Henry Kissinger. Uh, beyond that, you have someone like Henry uh, Paulson, who was Secretary of Treasury um, under George uh, W. Bush, uh, previously Goldman Sachs. Um, and he's also very intimately involved in China and has a Chinese-focused uh, philanthropic uh, foundation. Another individual would be Mike Bloomberg, who actually um, resurrected um, an, an event that used to be hosted by the World Economic Forum in China. I believe it was called the Annual Meeting of the New Champions. Uh, that discontinued in 2018. And from 2018 on, it's been the Bloomberg New Economy Forum, uh, which is essentially uh, specifically focused on um, the U.S.-China uh, uh, relationship and having that, um, uh, uh, what happens there, uh, the the decisions made at that at that meeting to facilitate um, uh, creating this particular system that people have been discussing, the sort of technocratic uh, control grid, having it be uh, joint uh, constructed jointly uh, by the U.S. and Chinese leadership, um, and essentially what you have. Um, or uh, something that, that I wrote about a couple years ago um, was this uh, organization called the National Security Commission on uh, Artificial Intelligence, uh, which was headed by Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google. Uh, uh, and was ha ha in, in, in that uh, commission, it was mainly uh, Silicon Valley, uh, the US military and the US intelligence community represented. And in 2019, before COVID, they talked about the need uh, 
to either beat China in the AI arms race or work together with China in the construction of this sort of AI-driven uh, technocratic uh, control grid um, uh, as a way to, uh, to avert world war. And this was uh, something uh, promoted uh, by Henry Kissinger in one of the uh, events of this uh, particular commission, and Eric Schmidt uh, has emphasized that um, as well. And so that, in a sense, ties in with the um, Great Reset, as it's often called, going on uh, across the world, but uh, but in the U.S. specifically in this context, um, the uh, effort to completely digitize um, every sector uh, of the economy and society in order to um, amass data to uh, and to use that data to train uh, AI algorithms. Uh, basically, uh, the U. This this commission and the forces represented uh, there see it as uh, necessary for the U.S. to maintain its current military and economic hegemony uh, to have the best AI algorithms and thus they need to have the, the biggest stores of data. They recognize that China, uh, because of its large population and, and more uh, technological control systems already in place, is far ahead of the U.S. in terms of amassing that type of data. Um, and so uh, the U.S., the, the, this organization before COVID was talking about the need to urgently force people to do everything online, uh, from shopping to teleworking and all of these things to telemedicine. And of course, there was a huge push for that uh, during COVID-19. Um, and while they sort of frames, frame this in this uh, sort of new Cold War um, type of uh, context, they say within their, their own documents that there's a need to uh, do this alongside China, essentially create the same system in a parallel way and, and collaboratively um, uh, in order to avert world war. And this is essentially what is happening at events like the Bloomberg New Economy Forum and, and things like that. Um, I don't know if you want me to go any further because I know there's a, a time limit and I have to uh, go in 30 minutes. <laughs> so Yeah, well, um, is the um, social credit system then uh, whose invention is it? Is it really the Chinese? Uh, when I say Chinese, I mean the Chinese leadership, not the Chinese people. It, was it invented by the Chinese leadership or, or was this invented in cooperation with the City of London Anglo-American financial interests? Um, so I've never really written about the origin of that system, so I don't think I'm the right person to talk to um, about that specifically. Um, but from what I understand, you know, obviously there, there is sort of this biometric technocratic system that exists within China. Um, and obviously that was developed by Chinese leadership, um, or at least with their, their blessing and implemented by uh, the government over there. Um, but it's worth pointing out as well that, um, you know, ever since the opening up of China uh, during the Nixon era, which of course, involved um, Henry Kissinger uh, quite intimately. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, go between between the leadership of China, despite them being, you know, publicly labeled communist, uh, with these same transnational networks of of Western capital, um, and also, um, you know, negotiations with Western leadership that ultimately, you know, uh, have their governments essentially co opted by that same uh, transnational ca uh, network of capital. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now we see like someone like Henry Kissinger popping up um, over and over again, but um, has that now um, has that changed in the meantime that it's not so many not so much like individual figures, but it's now more like a network of, of people connecting um, in between these different areas of interest. Well, sure. Well, I think Kissinger is definitely uh, on the way out uh, because of his age and sort of has been from some time. And so there's a lot of his, the people he mentored, uh, specifically when he was teaching at Harvard, um, that have come out to sort of be the new generation of Kissingers, um, as it were, with uh, Klaus Schwab probably being um, a, a leading example um, of that uh, uh, in particular. I see that uh, uh, Matthew has the comment and he probably is uh, more qualified to talk on some of these things um, uh, than, than, my, than myself um, because uh, I, I was under the impression that I was going to be talking about uh, Dark Winter and Anthrax, but I can uh, uh, continue to talk about this if uh, you prefer. Oh, uh, if you want to talk about Dark, Dark Winter and Anthrax, you should do that. I, 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 thought, I thought the presentation was over. No, no, no. No, it's fine. We um, I, do, do you have an answer to that question? What is what is the role of China in all of this, Matthew? Uh, well, I was gonna add, I do, but it's a it's a longer thing, you know. Um, I was gonna just ask: Are, are you guys familiar with uh, Soros getting kicked out in '89 in the ouster of Zhao Ziyang? 
and the Club of Rome in China? No, I didn't know that. Uh, Zhao Ziyang is, um, I, uh, I can maybe speak for one minute, but I don't want to take away from Whitney I, at all. Zhao Ziyang was Soros' man in China. He was called the Gorbachev of China. And he ran the Chinese Communist Party for two years in 87, 88, 89. He actually ran a think tank with Soros. And he brought in Alvin Toffler, the transhumanists. He called for the fourth industrial revolution. He brought in uh, the Club of Rome and their computer models to manage the uh, one child policy in 79, 80. That was one of his, his key, fig, key collaborators. And the whole 80s was like uh, an effort to get a, a Yeltsin process of perestroika in China, which was happening in Russia to privatize their entire banking system and bring in the technocrats, Milton Friedman, everything. But he was ousted because there was a coup d'etat in 89 that he was supposed to run. And uh, the CIA, MI6, I, I shared an article on it, but it, it, it's useful to look at these anomalies. Like, why is Soros not allowed to operate in China for the past 30 years, whereas he's, like, running the West? Yeah, um, why is that? Yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't, that's a whole thing. I could, I could address that later because I, I know uh, Whitney's brilliant and I don't want to take try away and from give us, Try and give us the very basics of that. Okay, well, I mean, the very basics. Um, I, I think it has a lot to do with what Guterres uh, warned about when he said that two, two different opposing paradigms are emerging around AI geopolitics um, last year, or not even, it was last November. But up until 2010, 11, uh, Soros was still saying that China is the role model because they like the social credit, they like the technocratic controls, the centralized controls, they love that stuff, the, the you know, <laughs> the transhumanist, uh, uh, Borgs in the West, they love that. They don't like the um, the actual utilization of national credit because China never privatized their their central bank, and they they also don't like the large scale infrastructure development, the high speed rail, all of this stuff that pulls people out of poverty, like a billion people um, uh, out of poverty um, <clears throat> in just like twenty years. They hate that. They don't they don't like the idea of a nation state determining their economic destiny. So. There's a fight over like AI is not going away. A lot of these things aren't going away. And China's been penetrated with deep state columns, like fifth columns for a long time that they've been trying to uh, purge. Jack Ma is a, a great example of the World Economic Forum trustee, you know, who called for the overthrow, <laughs> essentially an economic regime change in China last year. And he was like, just taken out. Like he was just totally stripped of power. So you, you have evidence of these fights, especially with the Shanghai clique um, of billionaires who have been allied with the Western liberalists. Uh, Russia has their same thing too. They've got their own fifth columns around their, their liberal privatized central bank tied to the West. That's tied to a lot of these big pharma networks inside of Russia. So there's fights going on all over the place. But I think the, the military encirclement of China and of Russia uh, is a serious, a serious issue that people should think about. Like there is something that is frightening the oligarchy such that they are, I don't know, Whitney, if you, what are your thoughts on that? Like why, why would they put so much effort to do a full containment, full spectrum dominance of China and Russia? Uh, Whitney, um, James Bush is with us, and he's going to give us the details on Operation Dark Winter, uh, uh, Rockefeller uh, lockstep um, yeah. uh, thing, and uh, Event 201. But if you can introduce us to that, that'll probably be very helpful. Well, I was going to talk about something that's probably a little separate than, than uh -huh. him, more like the importance of um, Dark Winter, some of the parallels between um, 2001 and, and uh, some of the, the figures that were, um, you know, uh, COVID and anthrax uh, have in common, things like that. So okay. um, I'll just uh, be pretty uh, brief about it. So I'll, I'll let him, since I guess uh, he was there, no, uh, <laughs> talk about uh, Dark Winter in detail. But uh, for those that don't know, it was a simulation of a smallpox outbreak, um, but also included um, Th a, a potential threat of an anthrax attack within it. Um, it predicted major uh, parts of what would then become the September 11th, 2001 narrative. Um, and uh, people who participate in that exercise in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 showed apparent foreknowledge of those attacks, uh, the anthrax attacks that would follow soon afterwards. Um, and so we have, of course, the, the simulation preceding the event there. And then, you know, event 201, we have that as well. You also have uh, Crimson Contagion, which I believe uh, Debbie mentioned um, just a little bit ago. Um, and uh, that's significant because the uh, person who came up uh, speaks the name Dark Winter within the exercise. Um, Robert Cadlick uh, was uh, the human, uh, 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 the HHS Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response under the Trump administration 
that led that exercise, Crimson and Contagion, um, in 2019. Um, after uh, the 2001 anthrax attacks, he assumed a lot of power and essentially constructed that assistant secretary position over the course of basically 20, uh, little under 20 years. And then he occupied it right at the time that, that COVID happened to take place. How coincidental. Um, um, but uh, the Crimson Contagion is significant because it, it didn't just last a couple of days like Event 201 or Dark Winter or some of these other ones. It actually went on from January 2019 to August 2019 um, and uh, took, uh, involved public-private cooperation. It, it occurred at the federal level, uh, the regional level, the local level, uh, the municip municipal level. Um, essentially, and was very extensive. And also, you could argue, in a sense, a little more predictive of what would come later than Event 201, even in the sense that it was focusing on the outbreak of a pandemic influenza within China, whereas Event 201 uh, placed the outbreak uh, taking place in South America. Um, but um, a lot of these uh, uh, event two zero two zero one and, and, and dark winter um, involved some very significant uh, connections. Uh, mainly the people involved in both of those, like Thomas Inglesby, um, you know, had had ties to these organizations like Answer, uh, their Institute for Homeland Security, created in the late nineties, that was intimately tied to the CIA um, and some other. Um, institutions that also had intelligence links. Um, uh, beyond the commonalities of these two simulations uh, between the anthrax attacks and uh, COVID, you have uh, the specter of gain of function research being very prominent. Uh, so in the case of anthrax in 1997, the Pentagon created plans to, gen to gen uh, sorry, genetically engineer uh, a more po uh, potent variety of anthrax, allegedly because a Russian scientist had uh, claimed to have uh, created a strain of anthrax that was resistant to the standard anthrax vaccine in animal studies, uh, but not necessarily for the purpose of biowarfare, or biodefense, but the Pentagon used this to justify these gain-of-function experiments. And also at the same time in 1997, the CIA also began gain-of-function experiments um, on anthrax as well. And these experiments were going on at a facility at, uh, called Battelle, uh, located in West Jefferson, Ohio, uh, that currently has ties to the Leslie Wexer Foundation for people familiar with uh, his role in the uh, Epstein network, but is also a, a does uh, contract work for the CIA and uh, the military. And uh, most, uh, I'm not gonna go into extreme detail on this, um, but basically a CIA asset at the time, a defector from the bioweapons, biodefense program of the Soviet Union, Ken Alibek, uh, was the program manager for these gain of function uh, studies uh, at Battelle. Um, and uh, he and another figure named uh, William Patrick, who uh, was an actually initially suspected of the attacks, but then added to the investigation, i.e. cover up um, of those attacks were essentially the people leading um, that gain of function. Uh, research and most people that look into the anthrax attacks and are aware that Bruce Ivins was not a lone wolf um, in all of this and are aware of how the narrative is inaccurate and including uh, uh, several uh, U.S. attorneys actually at the time uh, uh, that Ivins had a very untimely suicide uh, believed that Patel was responsible and any serious serious uh, 2001 anthrax researcher that I'm aware of uh, thinks that Patel was the um, site for the anthrax that was actually used um, in the attacks. Uh, moving on to another parallel, uh, biosurveillance solutions. Uh, this is arguably one of the most uh, critical in the context of what um, we've been um, uh, talking about here uh, today. Um, so after the anthrax attacks and also 9-11, there was a push to create a system within DARPA um, called the Total Information Awareness. One of those programs was called the Biosurveillance Program, uh, which was aimed at developing, uh, quote, necessary information technologies and resulting prototypes uh, capable of detecting the COVID release of a biological pathogen automatically. Um, and that this would be accomplished by the monitoring of non-traditional data sources, pre-diagnostic medical data, and behavioral indicators obtained from uh, civilian data, essentially, uh, even though it claimed to be focused on bioterrorist attacks, uh, it wanted to acquire early detection capabilities for any sort of normal uh, disease outbreak as well that would then be automated um, with some, uh, I guess, the precursors to today's artificial intelligence um, algorithms. And it, it, it basically wanted to be a massive data mining program uh, was essentially the goal of that. Uh, total information awareness was shot down by Congress because it was said it would eliminate accurate, it was accurately pointed out that it would eliminate civil liberties uh, for Americans entirely, essentially in, in the uh, right to, to privacy would no longer exist. So it was scrapped, uh, but um, 
the architects of uh, total information awareness, including a neo neoconservative figure, uh, Richard Pearl, uh, worked hand in glove with Peter Thiel and Alex Cart to create Palantir, which is a private sector, uh, the private sector successor of total information awareness, total information awareness having been a public private partnership with the US military. Um, but Palantir uh, wasn't so involved with the military after its creation, it was more intimately involved with the CIA, the CIA uh, helped them create their product and the CIA was their only client from 2005 um, to 2008. Um, some aspects of the total information awareness program, uh, which was scrapped, uh, um, like this biosurveillance program, had been resurrected in the COVID era, era under people like Robert Cadlick, like the monitoring of wastewater um, systems uh, to detect disease outbreaks. That was all planned out um, during that uh, earlier period of time. And there's um, and it's no coincidence that all of that data in the modern day, uh, now in, the, in this particular uh, the COVID era, if you want to call it that, um, is being fed into um, a, a database that's being managed by Palantir. And also in the UK, the NHS uh, COVID data is being handled by Palantir as well. So it's sort of the Anglo-American total information awareness control grid um, that's come up in uh, Palantir certainly doesn't give a, get an, uh, enough attention they deserve, but their origins go back to this particular period of time and in 2001 and involve a lot of the same uh, actors um, who were setting it up. It's also worth pointing out that Peter Thiel is a major funder of uh, right-leaning uh, media, including in the alternative media sphere. Um, so I'm just, uh, I'll just uh, leave that though, because that's for another time. Uh, the, the last thing I want to point out is that both the anthrax uh, situation and uh, what happens, um, uh, you know, with, with COVID-19 is the uh, fortuitous rescue of imperiled vaccine companies with the deep ties to the U.S. military. Um, so the first one is uh, would be Bioport, which today is Emergent Biosolutions. Uh, they changed their name in 2004 because of the controversy around their anthrax vaccine, which they had a monopoly on the production and uh, in sale of to the U.S. military. The U.S., uh, the sort of same network responsible for the anthrax attacks, mandated the uh, the use of the anthrax vaccine for U.S. troops, um, it ended up causing what is often referred to as Gulf War syndrome um, and, and a litany of adverse effects. Um, and uh, they were bailed out by the Pentagon multiple times because their factories were being shut down repeatedly because of violations of, uh, of safety regulations and health regulations, among other things. And they didn't use the money to fix uh, those factories. They were using executive bonuses and executive office refurbishments, among other things. Um, uh, which is uh, quite um, typical in these circles, it seems. Uh, but anyway, they teamed up with Battelle at the end of 2000. As I mentioned, Battelle was doing this gain of function research for the Pentagon and the CIA um, at the time. And um, they and those uh, that research uh, entered a new phase when this partnership began because it directly involved the anthrax vaccine. Um, the Pentagon was going to release a report on how to continue their mandatory anthrax vaccine program without this company in September 2001. Uh, this is derailed by 9-11 because that administrative wing working on that report was hit by a plane. Uh, on September 11th, 2001, uh, essentially ending that uh, inquiry. Um, and uh, Donald Rumsfeld decided to uh, rescue that uh, program, essentially. Um, and, uh, and the uh, concerns and that were heard in Congress and throughout the US uh, political system at the national level during that time about this particular vaccine product disappeared in the panic of the anthrax attacks and was replaced with um, calls not just to make the vaccine vaccination campaign mandatory for the military, but for first responders, for teachers, uh, firefighters, policemen, and and so on. Um, and of course, uh, the, the the commonality in terms of that sort of company uh, today is Moderna, which has uh, was uh, essentially they've even admitted now uh, going to collapse if it wasn't for um, COVID nineteen coming at the exact time it came. Uh, I want to stress that, you know, a, a month or two of difference and they would have totally gone under. Um, and of course, Moderna has very deep ties to the U.S. military, DARPA specifically, um, which has been funding them since I believe 2012. Um, for more information on either of those things, you can go to my website, unlimitedhangout.com and look at the investigative series, um, Engineering Contagion on the anthrax issue. And then I have one called uh, uh, Moderna, uh, about Moderna. Uh, I forget the exact name of the series. I think it's called like it, Moderna Gets Its Miracle or something like that for uh, COVID-19. Um, I, I, I'll stop there because I have uh, 10 minutes in case you wanted to ask about um, another topic or issue.
I just, just want to... a quick question. This uh, emerging biosolutions, they're involved in the production of the uh, vaccines now, is that right? Uh, yes. Well, initially they were, I think, they, after they produced, uh, I believe, six, six, a very significant number of doses for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that were deemed contaminated and unusable. I think they were scrapped. Um, but it's worth pointing out that Robert Cadlick, um, has, who I mentioned earlier, has a long-running uh, deep ties to that company and actually founded a separate company with the founder of Emergent Biosolutions. Um, and he basically uh, was, even the Washington Post, was forced to admit that he showed them favoritism in the awarding of contracts for COVID-19. Um, so despite their really horrendous track record um, and, and even complaints from within the system, they were given uh, contracts to produce uh, vaccines. Uh, I forget exactly which companies um, uh, were doing it, but the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was one and they, they got a lot of pushback. So I'm not sure if they're still manufacturing that. But uh, I would say that um, some of these uh, mRNA companies, specifically Moderna, have now shifted to using a new company that was created during uh, the COVID era uh, called Resilience uh, to produce their uh, RNA specifically for their vaccine uh, that has people from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the FDA, the Pfizer board, uh, a member of the 9-11 Commission, uh, the head of NQTEL, the CIA's venture capital firm, um, among other groups uh, producing their products. And that was made in, uh, that company was created in November, 2020. Um, and they're hoping to um, produce mRNA for uh, going forward within the United States and Canada. Um, okay. Well, so it, so it seems there's a, there's some infighting going on, but they're basically all these different interests are pulling in yeah. the same direction. But it's not clear who's going to make the who's going to be the leader of yeah, the track. Yeah, I would agree. I would. The pack. Well, both of these yeah, well, I think the I think the infighting is more over uh, like the pro so much over the overall end of the day, uh, you know, agenda. Mm -hmm. Um, both of the mRNA companies, um, Moderna and BioNTech, which is being used by Pfizer, um, both of them have come under a lot of pressure recently. Um, their share price is um, more or less collapsing, and this is due to the fact that um, the, there's a decision um, in the United States which forces uh, Pfizer to um, more or less declassify the documents that they wanted mm. to hide from the public. And all of a sudden, and there's a recent interview by an investment banker by the name of Ed Doubt, who explains this in great detail. All of a sudden, when people can see what's really going on, they decide to dump the shares. So the rescue seems not to really have worked. But that is only as a result of other people exposing what's really going on. Right, mm -hmm. which I don't think they anticipated uh, no, necessarily because they, right, yeah, it proves, uh, because it, it, it proves Matthew's point that they don't really have everything under control. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. Um, and I think that's why we're seeing them, for example, in various countries, particularly Western countries, sort of roll back restrictions for the time being. Um, as uh, Leanna Wynn, uh, the, one of the CNN medical experts, um, said this was uh, so that uh, public trust could be sort of restored so we can use these measures again in the future uh, for pandemic too, um, or some, so, some sort of event to that extent. Um, and if you look at the World Economic Forum since last year, they've been uh, the theme their whole theme for last year was rebuilding trust with the public um so this is something that really concerns them the lack of trust the public have in the elites but i think they're sort of in this mindset still well even if they start to not trust us in mass what are they going to do about it i think that's essentially um where this is but i think they're also planning to uh, try and uh, ramp up different things uh, that are not necessarily COVID as that particular narrative crumbles uh, to try and keep people uh, divided uh, and distracted and confused uh, by just the, the uh, massive information uh, coming out all the time uh, from these people, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, the, as people have explained before, this is, you know, sort of uh, the, the PSYOP, the psychological operation side um, uh, of, of what's going on. Um, Okay. Well, um, 
I, are there any further questions from you, Virginie, or Dexter, or uh, Anna, or Deepali? No questions from me. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Webb. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we will now, you do that, please. Yeah, we'll now do a little insertion of some witnesses because, you know, we have to, um, for the records and for the audience to see um, that we have um, what's really going on. And I think we have to it's it has been so crazy like through these uh, two years now that uh, we sometimes seem to forget like what we used to have like what we used to think was like uh, the normal um, way uh, things would be handled like that you could choose uh, without like deception whether you wanted to have like a medical treatment or whether you wanted to protest against something like without having to deal with the police and so on and so we have prepared a um, I think it's two videos and um, we have uh, two witnesses one live here with us and another one in the zoom and I would like to start to show you um, what we experienced um, when we got word from a whistleblower that in an old people's home here in Berlin there was going to uh, going to go a vaccine some vaccination was going to go on like on a Sunday I think it was and it was actually the the, uh, the vials were um, um, provided by or like accompanied by so soldiers and so the old people the old people were confronted with soldiers like um, uh, you know um, working with the doctors to get the vaccine and some one person was not really voluntarily accepting it I mean it was like the, it was like a dementia um, a section of this old people's home and some of them obviously were not quite able to um, to they I mean were not able to to sign the papers themselves clearly but you have to still like respect like a natural will kind of that they express wh whether they wanted to be treated or not so we're going to see that and what the what the um, because like so we had one whistleblower um, verbally telling us about this um, this incident and um, what happened afterwards that was that uh, th of these 31 um, uh, people who got vaccinated eight passed away rather quickly after the vaccination like in, in within, within a few weeks. No, within a few weeks and i think the last person who died was like two or three months later and they were really in good shape it was um a a um before the vaccination before the vaccination so it was the section where they would freely freely roam basically and some were jogging every day some one was a piano player and so um you know they had had um, had like singing songs the night before basically and then already on the evening some of them had serious problems and um, what's also interesting about this is that later on we um, got in touch with the uh, police and I uh, filed I personally find like a criminal uh, uh, charge or complaint against the uh, and asked them because there was like of the two people who deceased like at the latest in time um, there were still the corpses were still like with the undertaker so we informed the police and said that they should investigate this and the district attorney and then they sent us a letter and saying they don't even see like um, anything suspicious where they could start even start investigating you know that's very um, I think very remarkable and so after we um, had uh, done this whistleblower interview a second whistleblower uh, came forward and provided some some footage that you can see now and for you to see this, you have to turn to the um, the, the stream. Uh, Take no, a look at the stream. Is, this is to illustrate what we're really talking about, because we have today, tonight, uh, we have been talking about the run-up to what is actually happening. And now we're looking at the consequences, um, because I do think it is important for us and for the jury to understand that we're not just talking about irrelevant games that are being played, power games, but that these games have very serious consequences. And that is what these, uh, what this video clip very clearly illustrates.
gleich kommen. Sie müsst jetzt stoppen. So, this shows that when you, Brian, said that the they're killing people, they're not killing people in theory, they're killing people in real life. One of the people who we saw in this video, which was filmed with a hidden camera, died. The old man uh, in the pajamas died. Um, so this is what this is all about. There are real consequences uh, as a result of these so-called power games. This is really about control, and this is really about population reduction, as I think this uh, short video clip uh, clearly illustrates. And this is just one example. There are many more such examples. Uh, we have gotten um, uh, lots of um, information from uh, similar nursing homes where the same thing happened. This is particularly uh, impressive for us because it's right here in Berlin. Um, 31 people were vaccinated and within two weeks or so, uh, eight of them had passed away. Eleven more had developed very serious symptoms. We don't know what happened to them. But these eight people who died, one of them, as um, Vivian mentioned, uh, had been playing the piano the night before he got the shots. Another one was a runner, and he was running the night before he got the shots. This is what we're really talking about. Um, yeah, so um, now, now we have another... Um now we have another um, uh, video clip that we're going to see. Uh, it's from a, a little small demonstration, like a vigil, basically, that took place for, um, I think it was, he's gonna, the witness is going to tell us in a second, for like several days, 60, 62 days. And this was like the final, um, basically the final day where it was supposed to be like a little, little get together um, there. But it was a small event and you'll be surprised by the amount of police compared to the size of the event that you're going to see and how, how harshly then they sort of ended it. Um, I think we show the clip first and then we're going to talk to uh, Roman Masinov. Unsere Kinder haben kein Schutzschild. Unsere Kinder haben nur uns. Und Achtung, Achtung! Hier spricht die Polizei. Bitte vergib mir, falls der gerade die Durchsage macht. Lieber Herr, bitte vergib Ihnen Ihre unendliche Schuld. Vergib Ihnen Ihre materialistische Geilheit. Vergib Ihnen, was Sie Ihre Hausrate sehen. Vergib Ihnen. Was bedeutet, Ihre Versammlung ist hiermit beendet. Entfernen Sie sich in Richtung Hauptbahnhof. Ich wiederhole, aufgrund der Nichteinhaltung der Hygienemaßnahmen. Yeah, you can see how out of proportion this is for what's going on and there was not not even like hygienic uh, aspects like violated and I mean like in earlier um, times we would have thought this is a normal event and so but maybe let's just talk to uh, to Roman uh, Masino. Hello? Roman, oh what happened there? Uh, uh, ich kann nicht so gut Englisch, also ich muss... Uh, English so well, so I'll have to um, speak in German. Good. Uh, let us just briefly talk about it and I'll translate. In a few words, can you tell us you um, had done this demonstration 60 times and then it ended that way? 
Exactly. I had held a vigil in the front of the Chancellor's office because uh, demonstrations weren't possible in Berlin anymore because we always, uh, it always uh, escalated in uh, police violence. It always ended in police violence. And so I organized a vigil because uh, with a few people right outside the uh, Chancellor's office, the police can't uh, overreach as easily. And we did that over a period of more than two months. And very frequently, there were um, le media um, with us, and they uh, left and right to us. Um, um, and they never reported on us. Um, they were just there because there were um, uh, something happening at the Chancellor's office. Um, one of us had uh, registered uh, with the Chancellor's office, and the last day, the 1st of June, was the World Children's Day. We resisted there. We did not put on masks. That's the least level of resistance you can offer. And of course, it escalated. And our, demonstra our uh, assembly was disbanded. Okay, ich übersetze das mal kurz zurück. Nach uh, zwei Monaten der Mahnwache, in einer Zeit, wo es eigentlich gar keine größeren Demonstrationen geben durfte, war das ein Protest gegen die. Um, you know, also going in the direction of the children, and um, actually, when this, um, when they, um, so there, there was a lot of media usually there, and but they never reported about this demonstration because they actually, they obviously wanted to keep it under the, the, the rug or like you know not talk about this, and then the only thing that was not um, complied with was that. Outside, you'd have to wear masks, although people were keeping their distance. And so you can see that the police immediately decided to even kill this small um, demonstration or this small protest at that point in time. So, Roman, uh, thanks you thank you very much for your statement and for sharing this in this experience with us. Yeah, now we have... Um, Jetzt sollten wir zu um, James Bush gehen. No. Okay. Okay. Then we'll continue with other examples uh, in the future. Yes. Now, uh, James, you've been waiting for quite a while, but we are very interested in hearing about Operation Dark Winter, uh, the Rockefeller lockstep simulation, and Event 201. You are muted. You are muted, Jim. I'm muted. Okay. Okay. I'm absolutely flabbergasted by everything I've heard today, and the intelligence and the experience of the of the uh, of the team that's producing this. So I wanted to thank you all. Um, <clears throat> my credentials are very simple. Uh, I re retired after 20 years in the United States Marine Corps as a lieutenant colonel. I was an infantry officer, uh, a force recon officer, and then I became an engineer and I worked as an engineer for the Honeywell Corporation as a launch guidance engineer for the uh, shuttle program. And then I became a special operations engineer for special environments and mechanical systems. I was the engineering officer and manager for the uh, North Colorado Medical Center for the Infectious Disease Research Center at Colorado State University in Colorado, and for the Center for Disease Control Vector Borne Research Facility in Colorado, Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, my interest in this uh, actually peaked well before I had gotten into uh, the, um, uh, the knowledge of what was going on today. I was working for Hewlett Packard and in my engineering capacity. I was the biosafety officer for the Rocky Mountain West, and I was invited to go to a program called Dark Winter in Oklahoma City in June and uh, of 2001. And at this point, I'm not sure how I, oh, is there a share screen? I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna pull up a, a fairly quick, and I and I am sincere, it's, it's quicker than the others uh, presentation. Um, 
Let me see. Let's see if they'll open up. There we go. Um, I don't know why that's still showing up there. Is that, is it? there you go. So uh, that's my resume. I already went through that um, uh, with you. I have a master's of science degree in mechanical engineering at BS in epidemiology. Um, <clears throat> this is dark winter and you've heard it referenced and may have, you may uh, already be aware of it, but it was an ostensibly a program uh, supported by the government and, and private organizations in June 22nd, 23rd of uh, 2001 at Andros Air Force Base in, in uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, you've heard, uh, when he just mentioned ANSWER Homeland Security and CSIS, the uh, Oklahoma National Memorial Center for Civilian Biodefense. These are all organizations that were precursors of all of the uh, elements that it takes to eventually create a bioweapons system in, uh, in the United States. So dark winter, this slide set they're seeing is, is only a very, very small part of a slide set that was generated during that presentation. Uh, and it was a presentation, it wasn't a, a real study. They called us and said, we're gonna study this. But basically when we got there, they said, okay, here's what we're doing. and sit back and watch and here's what we have cut into conclusions. Please take this back to your companies and to your organizations and share it with them because the government was totally in control of this. Uh, it was an exercise designed to simulate the possibility reaction to a deliberate introduction of smallpox in three states in 2020, 20, 2002. Dark Winter was developed as a program by the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Johns Hopkins Center and the Answer Institute for Homeland Security. And you've all, uh, I, I believe you've all heard those names before. You're going to continue to hear as you go through this process of analyzing what's happening to our country. Answer Institute for Homeland Security was eventually converted to a uh, nationally funded uh, 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 cabinet post called Homeland Security. The key participants, and I'm going to show you who they are, what the goals are, what the, uh, the introduction, uh, it was a scenario. So our government, as you know, and many governments really love scenarios. They like to, well, what if we do this? What if this happens? Uh, what are going to be the next steps? So this was supposed to be a scenario study, but Please note the characters that were playing this. This is in 2001, and some of the most key people in the government and the defense of the United States of America took their time off to go to Oklahoma City and ask the question, what happens if we get hit by uh, smallpox? And smallpox is, in, is clearly defined by every organization out there, the World Health Organization, the CDC, the uh, FEMA, everybody says it's a pandemic disease because it has a fatality rate, a true live fatality rate of about 32 to 33 percent, as opposed to the coronavirus, which, uh, depending on who you're talking today, is maybe 0.012 percent. So they were using a true pandemic disease to see what would happen. But the people who came was Sam Nunn, a U.S. Senator, Frank Keating. He was the governor of Oklahoma, the national security advisor to the United States, the CIA director for the United States, the Secretary of Defense, John White, the chairman of the United States military, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General John Tulelli. Secretary of State for the United States was Hank Frank Weisner. The Secretary of Health and Human Services was Margaret Hamburg. The Attorney General, George Twilliger, the Director of FEMA, Jerry Hauer, and the Director of the FBI. Now, in, I'm sure that, that, that this type of an assemblage of people has been formed before, but I don't think in the history of the United States they've ever come into a, a meeting like this 
created a document, created a, a scenario, and then disappeared because within two or three days of this program being ended, uh, some of us got actual copies of the slide set and everywhere else it, it disappeared. It was on the internet for a while, but if you recall back in 2001, the internet what it is not what it is today. And it took me several years to find this on the internet. In the meantime, I had a copy of it on my computer. And later, when I worked for the, the Infectious Disease Research Center and the CDC, I would bring this up to various researchers and ask them what they think of it. And they would all kind of turn green and walk away. They didn't want to talk about what this was about. So the question is, what would happen if a local biological weapon attack uh, were to hit America with a contagious pathogen that could, could cripple the uh, country? The government response will pose enormous challenge to civil liberties. The less we are, we are, the less prepared we are, the more threats there will be to civil liberties. So in, in, in the beginning documentation, some of the first currents are, are civil liberties and what they are going to take, uh, take away during this event. So I'm gonna stay on that, that page for a moment and just, just say to you, that during this study, it was two days long and we got out early because this study, when we got there, they had uh, all kinds of slides and I'll be glad to show these slides to anybody who wants to see them. But the slides really show the thought process, the, the uh, initiation of an agenda whereby they wanted to share with the people in the room and the people in the room were people of, it, of science and industry and business and they were saying to us, how will this affect you? They showed what happened after one day, after six days, after three days, how many people are sick, how many people are injured, how many people have died, and how does it progress? This document was provided as a means to create two or three things. One is a, a tutorial on how to initiate and get the results we want from a pandemic disease. The other would be is how would we control? What would be the results? How many people would die? How do we take care of inoculations? This was of a, a known disease, which had an extraordinarily high fatality rate. And they translated that and that, that, that gave them the opportunity to create an outline, a primer, a document that they can use when it takes, when it comes time to create a bioweapon national security pandemic event. That's what they did. And the, uh, like I said, I'll be glad to share the rest of these. My current um, presentation on Dark Winter is about two and a half hours long because I go into all of the details about what a biosafety level one, two, three and four facilities and, and, and where they are and uh, how they're used and, and, and how our, our government and our universities are studying this. But there's, there's a wealth of information in that slideshow. And uh, Reiner asked me to keep it relatively short. So this is, this is the beginning. This is the first stage where our government engaged some of the most powerful people in our administration to bring forth this concept. The next one was Operation Lockstep. And Operation Lockstep was ostensibly done by Ralph Emerson. He kept referring to John D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller. It was claimed to be a three-step approach to a permanent lockdown resulting in massive depopulation. Now, I've done some significant research on this and Operation Lockstep was actually a concept that was created by people doing uh, research on not just Operation Lockstep, Lockstep the, the, the book, which was uh, a 54 page look, book by uh, uh, Ralph Emerson. I, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Ralph Emerson wrote the book. Uh, the New World Order, and it was 320 pages. And the prima facie information from this entire Operation Lockstep came from page 18 
in that book. There was two elements. The, the uh, uh, operation lockstep was created by information from uh, um, the New World Agenda and another program that did come out of the Rockefeller Institution. So my question is, what is it really? So the, the, the published document is basically people got together and they said, okay, based on us reading the information in uh, the New World Order, here's what we see is happening and it fits fully well what's in the 320 page document of the New World Order. And this is very, uh, this is very uh, clearly pattern on what actually did happen. And the reason for, the reason for that is, is that Operation Lockstep came out in the middle of uh, uh, June of July uh, last year. There was a lot of people trying to refute it, but there was nobody that What happened? Created according to the documents in 1989. So we have 2001, dark winter. You have 1989 when Operation Lockstep and the the, the uh, birthing documents were created for, for that. And then uh, we move forward as we go through our nation's history. We now have, uh, you see the New World Order by Ralph Emerson. You see the Rockefeller Foundation and the Global Global Trading uh, Organization, which which contributed to the New World Order. Rockefeller contributed contributed to the next book, which is a about a fifty four page book called Scenarios for the Future of Technology and International Development. That was done by the Rockefeller Foundation. And in, in, on, on the internet, you find that, that it keeps referring back to what you see on the right side of the page, which is the first phase, the second phase, the third phase. Back in, in, in uh, 1989, nobody knew anything about 5G radiation. Nobody knew anything about specifically about coronavirus. Uh, so somewhere this information came out, but it was truly a combination of, of data created in the New World Order, and I don't know how many people have read the New World Order, but it is a malevolent and a disgusting tutorial book on how to destroy Western civilization. And it cites George Bush and the whole litany of people that, that we're, we keep talking on. Uh, James, the lockstep is- James, can you do us a favor and read those yeah. three paragraphs uh, because okay. I think this is extremely important for people to understand what happened in 1989. Let me, yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to. First phase, common cold, flu, mild symptoms, at most media endorsement of mass paranoid and fear, flaw, flawed testing system utilized, which picks up any genetic material in the body, body and triggers a positive result. Inflation of COVID cases numbers through changing of death certificates, double counting and classifying all death, including other diseases and natural causes as COVID-19 lockdown will con condition us to uh, live under draconian laws, prevent protests and identify public resistance. That's step one. Phase two, the first phase will lead to the com compromised and frail immune systems through lack of food, social distancing, wearing of masks and lack of contact with sunlight and healthy bacteria. Ex uh, exposure to 5G radiation will further attack the immune system. Thus, when people reemerge into society, more people will fail, fall ill. This will be blamed on COVID-19. This will all occur before the vaccination is ready to be uh, ready uh, in order to justify it. A longer and more potent lockdown will follow until everyone takes the vaccine. 
That's their intention. Third phase, if a majority of the people resist the vaccine, a weaponized SARS, HIV, MERS virus will be released. A lot of people will die from this. It will, uh, it will be survived. It will be survival of the thinnest. It will also be uh, the ultimate push for everyone to be vaccinated in order to return to normalcy. Those who have taken the vaccine will be at war with those who have not been, and it will be anarchy. And the predominance of that came from that page 18 uh, in the uh, other document, which is scenarios for future uh, technology, technological uh, international development. So this is all tied together. And this was this was poured out and it was meant as a, a document to, to do two things, tell people where it's going and if you tell somebody it's going to happen, you keep reading it, eventually people will get okay with it happening. We've heard that all day today. Um, let's go to the next one. Lockstep is the fulfillment of the concepts and goals expressed and solicited in the philosophies of the New World Order and the scenarios for the future of tech technology and international development. Those concepts and agendas were put into operation for COVID-19 pandemic. The author of the, uh, uh, the actual author of the lockstep documents is unknown, but it is clear that the lockstep was created in 1989. I, I'm sorry, the New World Order was uh, created in 1989 and the uh, scenarios for a future technology were created in 2010, and that's when the other document known as Locksteps was created. Uh, just uh, the next page, I don't know if you all can read this, but I'll, I'll try not to read too much of it. But this is the, the concept in the scenario. This is the Locksteps scenario. So this, is, this was a scenario done by our, our government studying what Locksteps should be a world of tighter top-down government control and more authoritarian leadership with limited innovation and growing citizen pushback. In 2012, the pandemic that the world had been anticipating for years finally hit. Unlike 2009's H1N1, this new influenza stain originating from wild geese, that's a wild guess, uh, was extremely virulent and deadly. Even the most pandemic prepared nations were quickly overwhelmed when the virus streaked around the world, infecting nearly 20% of the global population and killing 8 million in just seven months. The majority of them healthy young adults. The pandemic also had a deadly effective effect on economies. International mobility of both people and goods screeched to a halt, debilitating industries like tourism and breaking global supply chains, even locally, uh, even locally, normally uh, bustling shops and buildings uh, sat empty for months, devoid of both employees and customers. The pandemic blanketed the planet through disproportionate numbers, uh, and died in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Central America, where the virus spread like wildfire in the absence of official containment protocols. But even in the developed countries, Containment was a challenge. The United States' initial policy of strongly discouraging citizens from flying proved deadly in its leniency. Um, I'm going to skip to the next. However, a few countries did fare better. China in particular, the Chinese government was quick, uh, quick imposition and enforcement of a mandate uh, quarantine for all its citizens as well as its instant and near hermetic sealing off of the borders saved millions. This information was written. This is where the entire concept came from. So they had dark winter. They decided that they really didn't want to use something like smallpox and the, uh, the enhanced uh, uh, development and, and genetic modifications of diseases is practiced all over the world. And ostensibly it's, it's used for uh, the development of medication and, and uh, preventive medicine. But the reality is, and I say this having been 
They're in, running the laboratories. I've worked on six coronaviruses. I've worked on 78 other biosafety level, level three and three plus diseases. The reason that the universities and the, and the military and the government do this research is a bioweapons program. They are trying to find tools that are less expensive to use against a common enemy. Use, uh, develop tools that they can control. Um, the, the, the whole development of the process, when I worked for, the, for CDC and CSU, there was no, there was never a time that I saw any vaccine go out in less than six years. And they tried to tell us, they tried to tell people of science that they have created vaccines that are safe. And there are four different vaccines that do different things to the human body. And oh, by the way, uh, we did it in less than nine months. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I can only tell you that from my perspective, it's lies, lies, and damn lies. Finally, on October 18th, 2019, many of you already know what happened, but the Johns Hopkins Center, the Bill and Melinda Gates Group, and the World Economic Forum, here we go back to, to uh, the financial side of this, uh, this atrocity. The Johns Hopkins Center and, and for Health Security in partnership with the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates hosted event 2001, a high level pandemic exercise on October 18th, 2019 in New York. The exercise illustrated areas where public private partnerships will be necessary during the response to a severe pandemic in order to diminish large scale economic and social uh, consequences. Statement about uh, the novel uh, coronavirus and our pandemic exercises. In recent years, the world has been growing, has seen a growing number of epidemic events amounting to approximately 200 events annually. These events are increasing uh, and, and so on. The experts agree that it's only a matter of time before the epidemics become global. How could they possibly put together a meeting with all of the, the most important people in the East Coast, in New York City on October 28th, and all of a sudden, less than a month later, we now have coronavirus coming out of the Hunan province. And I will tell you, having managed these facilities, I've managed one of the largest in the country, it's Colorado State University. They don't accidentally get out. You can take them out. When I work there, I could walk out the, the, the any day with Yersinia pestis, with HIV, with tuberculosis, with all kinds of corona. The coronas weren't even used to in, in level three uh, facilities. They were uh, worked on in level two. You ask why I've got the Central Intelligence Agency. So the question still remains, how come all of the media, you, you get up in the morning and you listen to one radio station, go to a TV station, and they all say exactly the same thing. Did you all know about Operation Mockingbird? Mockingbird is a CAI program that was created after World War II, and it is still operational today. It's where the CIA creates the dialogue and works with the six or seven uh, ultra media uh, systems in the world. And I can say this because you don't know her, her name, but my daughter is a military intelligence officer with the US Army. She's been in for 12 years. She's a, she's a major selected for Lieutenant Colonel. And I showed this to her and she said, yeah, that's what they do, they do it now. So the question, there's lots of question as to why, and I think the question is, is, is just exactly as every one of you have, have spoken to today. But this is an important piece of information that I wanted to share with you. When I started managing the infectious disease research centers, both of them in Fort Collins, about 14 years ago, there were 25 to 27 biosafety level three and four laboratories in the world. It's now 2022, 
And this is directly off the CDC's website. I've, ref I've uh, compared it to other uh, websites as well. And this is the distribution of biosafety level three and four laboratories around the world. And you can see that Australia has four. Almost all the rest of the countries have them. Have Germany has four, India has three. The United Kingdom has six. The United States has 15. And when I started in this business, there were three. And the biosafety level threes, now these are the ones that work on diseases like coronavirus, which is the influenza, which is uh, HIV, the things that are not extraordinarily uh, uh, capable of being made into a bioweapon. But the BSL threes are the, 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 the test beds for the fours. There are several smaller countries, several smaller countries have one or two BSLs, BSL threes. All of the countries on, on the BSL four list have similar numbers of BSL-3 labs now as the BSL-4. The United States of America has over 200 biosafety level 3 labs in the continental United States. So between BSL-3 and 4, the United States of America has 215 bioweapons research facilities. They call them normal research, but I can tell you it's not true. James, so that's yes. One question. I, I, I must ask you these two questions because having looked at the documents you showed us from Operation Lockstep, I mean, you quoted these three paragraphs. Um, mm -hmm. Is it, I mean, was, were these terms really included in that document? I mean, terms like COVID-19 and uh, what's the other one, 5G, was that really included? Yeah, that's from a book. Very observant. And that's absolutely, the answer to the question is, uh, in the document that people are using for lockstep, it's, that's exactly what they are. That's the, 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 I found that document all over the internet. I, could, I said I could not find an author of that particular document. It said it was page 18 in all references. It said it was a page 18, and the, the page 18 it was referring to was the scenario page that I had pulled up. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if I can go back. Okay, but that's ba basically like maybe an inspiration that they used for the for the lockstep were, scenario. No, the question is, was it really included back then? Was no, it in it, 1989? Were these no, two terms? No. It, 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 so there's there's the uh, the 2020 document that was on the internet, and in the uh, the scenario for future technology and international development, uh, and I apologize, I was going to put page 18. In, well, no, this is page 18. The lockstep scenarios. No, the other they took one, this, the other they, one with the three did. paragraphs. We just looked at it. Yeah. It is slide that, number 10. It is slide number, that's it. That's, that is the one that was on this one, the slide internet. number 10. 10. Yeah, that one. That one. Okay. This uh, this slide on the right hand side. Yes, is that is really up. originally from that book written in 1989? No, it is not. Uh huh. And what I'm saying is, this was uh, th this the document here, and this slide was made up from someone going in and referring to the the, the uh, this page. Can you see that? Yeah. That's from the lockstep, which was done by uh, the Rockefeller Institute. They took that and they transmorphized the, the current events and they plugged in the concepts from this paragraph and they made it. Uh, uh, but the, the, the world believes this. And what the irony is, uh, if you look at the, the, the content of the paragraph from the scenarios for the future of, of technology document, that's where they got this information from. And the 5G and the COVID-19 are not in that other paragraph. That's but, what I thought. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So th this tie, but it still ties it all together because the information was there in, 
in 2000, uh, uh, 1989, 2001, 2010, and uh, then again for uh, uh, event 201 in uh, 2019. So there is a progression that goes along with the historical uh, dialogue that your other history uh, speakers and experts presented. And this, this one really uh, shares the information. And from my perspective, dark winter is a critical factor in showing that they had the ability and the intent to do a preparation that actually reflected the same thing as event 201. Mm -hmm. 201 was just the second dark winter. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's dark winter and that's uh, uh, the information that I can share with you on uh, Operation Mockingbird. And uh, the, the lockstep, the lockstep after we started uh, um, doing some more research, I wanted to do exactly what you said. I wanted to find this particular page mm -hmm. in that book, the, the, uh, the New World Order by Ralph Epperson. Mm -hmm. I went there looking for it, it's not there. I went for the scenarios for the future of technology, it's not there. And I looked up all of the, the, the information I could on the internet and clearly someone made the, that particular document uh, to match it and it was an attempt to to coordinate that, uh, and, and it, it, it gives some it gives some credence to the new world order. Uh, I don't know how many people on the uh, uh, on the uh, group right now have read um, the new world order. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get out of here. I well the thing the 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 problem with documents as such as that one is that it is not only confusing, but it makes yeah. us look bad if we turn exactly. to documents. Exactly, and that's why, I wanted to, mm -hmm. that's why I wanted to show it to you. Because mm -hmm. I'm not sure we can use lockstep unless we simply refer, refer to the New World Order and the scenarios. Mm -hmm. Those two stand all the tests. Lockstep does not. Mm -hmm. I got it. There we are. There you are. Okay. Well, thank you, James. That leads us uh, all the way to probably uh, the World Health Organization's role in all of this. But we have two more speakers for that. Uh, in the meantime, however, are there any questions that uh, Virginie, Dexter, Deepali uh, want to ask? Thank you, uh, Mr. Bush. Thank you for that evidence. But I just want to find out from you, you have mentioned that uh, based on your experience, it takes approximately not less than six years before a vaccine uh, goes to market. I would like you to make a connection with uh, Operation Warp Speed. How does that basically tie in? Because in a sense, it seems like when uh, uh, it comes to the, uh, um, uh, the fact that they've actually expedited this vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines to the market, they justify it and they say no, but this is in line with Operation Hope Speed. Can you basically just give some clarity in relation to that, sir? The answer to that is they are not doing a true vaccine. They are, they are creating a, a DNA modifier. It's an injection that has nothing to do with the, the normal process of taking a, a, a live disease and, and learning how to fight it with the uh, human biome and applying the right chemicals and light, the right endurances to the testing and going over time Doing human doing animal testing, doing human testing, and developing an actual vaccine. The material they're injecting into people today, as far as I'm concerned, and I, like I said, I've worked on vaccines for, for 12 years in environments where my job in those facilities was, to, I operated the biosafety committee and I, and I kept the disease from getting out. And I kept people, during my, during my tenure, no one, there were 6,000 researchers in those facilities no one ever got sick. So we knew what caused the sickness. We, we were able to stop that. 
but it was also built into the, the understanding and the knowledge that you cannot develop a vaccine accurately in less time than six years. And so when, when I started hearing people say, we're gonna have one this year, uh, they're, they're, they're injecting materials that who knows what is in it. I'm not a, 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 a physicist, I'm not a MD, and, a, and I'm not a uh, research doctor. I worked with them and I can tell you that there will never be inoculation going in my arms or anyone in my family because I, that I fear what's in there. And that's, that's what some of your other experts are gonna to testify to as well. Look, look at the results we've already talked about today with how people are reacting. They are reacting to something very quickly, shortly after getting the inoculation, and that doesn't stand the test of a true vaccination. Thank you, sir. And I just want to, to re reiterate for if there's any question at all, um, when the illusion was that um, a some type of uh, Wuhan uh, disease got out of the B, the Wuhan laboratory is a BSL three and four. BSL the uh, Wuhan the uh, uh, the virus they were working on in China was in a BSL-3. So it does not meet the requirement for the extreme care and consideration and security that a BSL-4 does. And when I managed the, uh, the facilities in, in Colorado, we did tests to find out if people could get out of our building with uh, a, a um, select agent, a select agent Again, go to the uh, CDC's website and look up select agent, and it basically tells you that a select agent that can be genetically modified to make it into a weapon of mass destruction. That's why they call them select agents. But at that time, we did tests. We had U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, uh, U.S. AMRIT, uh, people come in, the FBI, the local fire department police, and we did tests to find out if, if somebody could get out of our facility. There was no way to stop them. If somebody wants to get out with that material, they couldn't be stopped. So there is, of those laboratories that I just showed you the numbers on, there's no way to stop any from, anybody from getting those things out of there. Mm -hmm. So what they are working on, in, in, in these, it's a, as far as I'm concerned, it's a bioweapons program. And what they're working on is basically the ability to modify other forms of, of uh, injections to control and to kill the general population. And that's why they're doing it in lockstep. It's, it's a chimeric, are you all familiar with the chimeric concept? Yeah. You can have, uh, pardon me? You can explain the, uh, the concept. A chimeric, a chimeric drug is, you, you, you develop a drug and you inject that in, into a, an, an, uh, an animal, an agent, or a person. And it does, it sets up the body for certain reactions. And then you come back with the second part of the chimera, the, the, the two part, and you inject that, and that causes extraordinarily big changes and or death. So I, I believe the uh, inoculations are chimeric. And to go along with your question about the vaccines themselves, how is it possible that you have a disease? There's, there's two questions here. How is it possible you have a disease that is being solved and has a solution being created at 95 to 100% efficacy with four different types of inoculations that don't even resemble each other in their content? And beyond that, in the history of mankind, Science, medicine has never come up with a cure for the common cold and the common flu, both of which are coronaviruses. Well, I'll leave you with that. In the meantime, Jim, the I'm sorry, Dexter. No, that's fine. No, you can continue, uh, Rhino. I just, I just meant to mention that um, other experts 
who will testify have in the meantime clarified the situation, at least as far as Pfizer, BioNTech Pfizer is concerned. It has not, it does not have an efficacy of uh, 95%. It's less than 1%. Some people even say it has absolutely no efficacy whatsoever. Um, uh, this is because we see countries that uh, have a very high vaccination rate also have very high, like Israel, like the UK, also have very high what they call breakthrough cases. So in other words, the vaccines don't seem to work at all. In other words, you're probably right, Jim, uh, we cannot call these injections vaccines, but we will learn more about this from other experts. Yeah. I applaud everything you're all doing, and if I can help any more, I shall be well. Jim, thank you so much. Thank you very much for walking us through these three exercises. Um, okay, now, Lee, uh, let us talk to uh, Dr. Astrid Stuckelberger and uh, Dr. Sylvia Berendt, uh, both of whom work for the World Health Organization. Do you have, uh, who's, who's going to go first? I think it's me. Okay. Uh, and then Astrid will go on. All right. So thank you very much. Um, just uh, uh, my credentials are I have received my PhD from the University of St. Gallen, Switzerland, on the topic of the international health regulations and the executive authority of the World Health Organization during public health emergencies of international concern. Very long title. And it's not my phone. <laughs> And I was a visiting researcher at Georgetown Law uh, at, under Professor Gorston, funded by the Swiss National Fund. Later, I collaborated with the International Health Regulation Secretariat in Geneva at the World Health Organization and conducted WHO country missions for the purpose of national implementation of the International Health Regulations. So, um, Good. Uh, the other experts uh, that were providing the expertise, the last we heard from Mr. Bush, Bush was uh, were speaking about financial, geopolitical and security issues, particularly under the paradigm of bioterrorism that provide evidence there, that there is a path that led to the current COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to focus the attention to the fact that we are currently not confronted with a medical pandemic response. Most of the criticism raised by the scientists and doctors center around the issue that from a pure medical perspective, all health measures recommended and required by national health authorities or WHO are actually contrary to the epidemiological and medical state of the art. And this is so on purpose, I condemned because the underlying concept used for COVID-19 does not follow established scientific principles, but rather a different ideology, which is called or framed as global health security and means to treat health as a national security issue require, requiring um, national and global states of exceptions to deal with it. Therefore, I consider it crucial to provide a short historic analysis of this concept in order to understand why the current global health crisis we face is not about medical science and health in the common sense we would expect. So the progressive replacement of medical with political aims started in the context of emerging infectious diseases in the early 1990s and originated actually from the US as we already heard. Within a short period of time, WHO institutionalized this new approach by the rapid setup of an entirely new division called Emerging and Other Communicable Diseases. And interestingly, they didn't engage, engage the staff of the Communicable Disease Control Department at that time. This policy confirmed that the new paradigm shift uh, from lower, lowering the incidence of regionally endemic diseases uh, was to the sole focus on preventing the international spread in real time and most preferably within a 24 hours time frame. So uh, there was a need for a technocratic apparatus of surveillance networks that were capable to deal with these new threats. So consequently, in 2001, there was a resolution of the World Health Assembly that already inserted this novel concept and called for the first time to find a definition for a public health emergency of international concern for the purpose of revising the outdated sanitary laws called international health regulations because nobody was interested in sanitary laws at that time. 
The problem was they had a very narrow scope and applicability only for yellow fever, black, and cholera. So at the same time, particularly in the US, bioterrorist scenario planning, we all heard right now a lot about it, uh, within the military and at the academic level with the most prominent exercise like Dark Winter, uh, was launched. And interestingly, uh, all those events went real uh, short after that. But what is also very interesting and we did not hear is that not only the exercises were held, which turned into reality, also the legislation in the US was prepared to curtail civil liberties for the fight against bioterrorism from 1990 on onwards. This undertaking was started by the CDC and eventually finalized by professors from Georgetown University, like Professor Gostin, together with the Johns Hopkins University, and it was called the Model State Emergency Health Powers Act. This model act has been sharply criticized at that time in the US for transforming governors into dictators, but was used over many states eventually. So the most important milestone in the, in the revision process of the international health regulations, which is an international treaty, was the outbreak of the severe acute respiratory syndrome, um, abbreviated as SARS, as we all know, in 2002, which, accompanied, which was accompanied by an alerted media attention that was not proportionate to the threat of the disease, which was remarkably low. In addition, there was a quasi consensus among scientists that the novel SARS outbreak could have had a bioterrorist potential. This political bioterrorist framing of the SARS outbreak, outbreak led to the agreement of the international community that the old sanitary laws needed to be rewritten to include bioterrorism without naming this goal officially at WHO. This came under the paradigm of an open, all hazards approach which means that not only various sources of risks were included, but also that any intentional release would come under the paradigm of the WHO and that the IHR needed to be revised. So the legal dimension of the global health security concept was eventually successfully integrated into international health regulations in 2005. And thus the US model of public health emergencies has been exported to the international community and is now merged into national constitutions, which have which were never having such such constitutional emergency provisions. Then the outdated IHR provisions of disease containment were replaced to, in, to include pathogens that pose a threat to national security and require an emergency, emergency regime that enabled the derogation of legal standards, not only in terms of medical safety regulations, but also in terms of fundamental standards, not um, freedoms and civil rights. According to this new paradigm, endemic diseases which count for the most death do not fall under the attention of this global set of rules, which are now the standard procedure for pandemics, but only newly identified pathogens without medical treatment that therefore require an emergency licensing as these substances are all unlicensed. In addition, the importance of diagnostics emerged under the global health security ideology as a new priority issue because the threat needs to be identified as threatening prior to devastating effects according to this ideology. So this, uh, the, the availability of diagnostics is labeled as necessary requirement for pandemic preparedness and response. So I hope you can follow. <laughs> Moreover, under the threat of bioterrorism, the establishment of laboratories boosted throughout the world, as Mr. Bush already explained to us. Because biological weapons are defined as weapons of mass destruction and constitute a crime under international law, the only legal pathway to lawfully undertake research and medical treatment is called biodefense, which takes place in laboratories, as we learned. I would like to remember that all SARS coronaviruses come under the US category C of potential bioterrorism agents and also classified under the expert regime of the EU for dual use, which refers to the potential of civil and military use. So I hope now that the, pic that the picture becomes a bit clearer why some historic knowledge is needed to understand why WHO and the global community do not address SARS-CoV-2 in accordance with the state of the art of medical knowledge, but rather fight the virus as a threat to the nation in an unproportionally manner, 
with military instead of medical terminology referred to it as medical and non-medical countermeasures. And throughout all health ministries in the world, new departments are established called national health security departments. So this was part one um, of my <laughs> kind of expertise. Um, if you have questions, because then I would like to explain how um, all those newly identified diseases um, came to WHO. Or should I get, just go forward? Okay. Uh, if you have no questions. Uh, as a second step, I would like to explain in more detail why the small number of atypical pneumonia cases of Wuhan in late 2019 and in the first days of 2020 were reported to WHO and soon ended up as a public health emergency of international concern and soon later as a pandemic. This is all due to the international health regulations uh, and the revision thereof. Also, the IHR, referred to as IHR, include an all hazards approach, some pathogens like any novel strain of an influenza subtype or any SARS coronavirus are still prioritized and have to be reported within a 24 hour time limit to WHO. The identification of this novel virus was possible because China has a very tight sc uh, screening regime for respiratory diseases since the SARS out outbreak in 2002. Thus, it was possible for China to identify this novel pathogen. Already on the 1st of January, WHO requested more information about the outbreak due to information by Taiwan. On the 3rd of January, China notified WHO officially of a cluster of 44 patients, of which 11 were severely ill with pneumonia of unknown etiology after WHO. Um, so, um, 44 cases. That doesn't yeah, sound 44 like, cases. It does no, not sound like a pandemic. Yeah, that's true. Uh, after the WHO already requested more information. Uh, and there was the closure of the Wuhan market. So this politicization and interest of WHO at this very early stage, at the 1st of January, when only 44 people had this atypical pneumonia and 11 people suffered, uh, suffered severely from this atypical pneumonia is indeed an interesting aspect that should lead to some precautions about how the entire crisis started, as there were no death reported and no international cases, and the potential of human-to-human -human transmission was not assessed at that time. In the meantime, the novel virus was identified as the SARS coronavirus. So this means the identification of this new virus falls under the international health regulations that formally requires an automated official report to WHO and the Director General is obliged to constitute an emergency committee under the IHR once such an official notification has been received. So he's legally obliged to uh, constitute this emergency committee. Then, now it's becoming interesting, at the same time, Professor Trosten and others worked in Germany intensely to deliver to WHO at diagnostic test assay via the PCR method for this novel virus. And Professor Trosten was also the lead author in 2003 when the novel SARS coronavirus was identified and since then nominated as WHO expert. His first protocol was officially delivered to WHO on the 13th of January 2020 which implied that he had, of course, worked prior to the state of submission and WHO immediately circulated this first protocol of this essay to its member states. Later, this essay was a bit revised and finally published in the Euro Surveillance Journal on the 23rd of January. So he also contributed to the WHO interim guidance dated on the 10th of January. And this interim guidance was published I, you can have more information if you want to later, but it's, it's getting complicated otherwise. This information guidance was published as a part of a comprehensive package of about 10 guidance documents of WHO for countries covering topics related to the management of an outbreak of the new coronavirus disease. So on the 10th of January, WHO had a comprehensive package already published um, at that time. That's, um, yeah. 
<laughs> Interesting. At a time when there were literally no cases yes. except for the 44 cases yes. in and okay. These were getting officially and mm -hmm. it's normally takes a very long time at WHO to get something published because it has to be cleared. Mm -hmm. Importantly, as any SARS coronavirus requires an official notification under the IHR, the Director General had to convene a COVID-19 emergency committee as a legal obligation under the IHR. You can find on the WHO website the experts who are on this committee and you can find your CVs there. This emergency committee advises the Director General in the proclamation whether a public health emergency of international concern exists which is an executive authority of the Director General in accordance with the legal principles set out under the IHR. So the first meeting was held on the 22nd of January, where the experts found no agreement whether a fake, that's the abbreviation of public health emergency of international concern, what WHO uses, so a fake exists or not. And they agreed that there was no international spread of the novel coronavirus outbreak, which was due to 17 deaths and 557 confirmed cases uh, on the 22nd of January. So they had an idea, they said, um, in 10 days, within 10 days, they will again meet and consult and assess the current situation of new cases. That's what they did on the 13th of January. And by then the cases have risen from over 500 cases to 14 times higher to 7,711 confirmed and even much more 12,167 suspected cases. That's all in the statement of the second emergency committee of the WHO's all in, uh, official information you can look up yourself. How are the cases defined? Positive well, test results? Well, the, yeah, the, the cases defined, the, the confirmed, will <laughs> have been confirmed by this essay of Professor Trusten because it was an official publication circulated by the 13th um, of um, January. And it was also worked into the uh, later published um, uh, interim guidance, uh, laboratory testing of human suspected cases of novel coronavirus. So these documents are still all online at WHO because sometimes uh, it could be that they are withdrawn afterwards, but they are still online and can still be looked up. And it's still all referenced to uh, Drosten and so his publication. Was, when was the first emergency meeting and when was the second one again? The first was was at the 22nd of June and then they agreed January. they did not uh, January. <laughs> they did not have enough cases because it were only 550 five cases or 57 cases and there was no international spread and the international spread is a precondition for um, uh, calling and uh, for defining a public health emergency. So they had to wait 10 days, and then there was a 14 times increase of cases, of course, through the rapid diagnostics, which was also referenced uh, in the statement uh, that they were very grateful that there were rapid diagnostics. So they could identify and diagnose um, this new threat uh, called SARS coronavirus 2. So what had happened is Drosten had delivered his test kit to the World Health Organization and through the use of his new test, all of a sudden we had 14 times the number of cases that existed before he used his test. That's what the documents say. Okay, can I, do, can make a, I would like to make a remark on this because we have like also information uh, from a, um, a Freedom of Information Act uh, request that we did with Charité. And, um, you know, it turns out that actually the, um, you know, the, the company Tip Molbiol, they would, which produced the test together with, uh, with or like produced it for, developed it together with Drosten. They were listed. That, so the the, the constellation came that um, basically they were doing the logistics. The uh, Charité claimed, and sending when someone got in touch with Drosten, and the companies, uh, the the countries knew that Drosten was the one in in charge or had this te developed this test, like from the the information kit that you said that was sent out through uh, 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 the WHO. The test essay. 
Test essay. From WHO so, to the member states, because it was then an official guidance can, that she exactly. delivered. But there was the, the contact information was to Drosten and to Tib Molbiol. So th they knew they could get in touch with them. And then uh, uh, Tib Molbiol would do the send out like for Drosten or for someone else. So it was basically all at, uh, at their hands and they could deliver it worldwide. It did, I think it did not go through uh, via um, the WHO itself, but like through this connection of the first mover advantage basically of what um, what the two had developed but what this boils down to is that the cases that they needed in order to um, declare a public health emergency of international concern came into existence because of the test is that correct at least they needed the international transmission and they have to diagnose it and without diagnostic test assays it's not possible. So the only one who gave this test assay uh, is in the document referenced as um, Truston. Mm -hmm. That's what the documents say. Um, so so had, uh, had it not been for his test, the WHO 10 days later would still have probably had 44 cases or maybe 500 cases, but not of course, 14 if, times that many. If there is no test, you cannot qualify it as yeah. the new virus. Uh, that's the problem. And, and that's also, it's and the really important thing everybody should know is that the proclamation of a public health emergency of international concern, because this is connected to vaccine manufacturing. Uh, that's the, the actually the most important thing any legal person or anybody should know. It's not a pandemic. There is no uh, legal consequence if WHO proclaims or um, defines a pandemic. That's just interesting for the media. But uh, the public health emergency is connected to the regulatory pathway for emergency use authorization. Without a public health emergency of international concern, there cannot be any use of untested medic, untested drugs right. like vaccines. Right, because all secondary laws like the EU, um, uh, the F FDA, uh, the, the US, they use the concept of the public health emergency also proclaimed by WHO. Okay, Virginie wants to ask a question. Yes, Mrs. Behrens, Virginie de Arrojo, Toilet Friends. I would like uh, to confirm with you that uh, Mr. Bill Gates put pressure on the WHO to declare a pandemic and that we know that uh, Charité Berlin, which is uh, linked with Drosten, has developed these tests with the financing of uh, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Wellcome Trust. I don't know if you can confirm that. Uh, maybe Astrid, I don't know so much about financing, I know more about regulatory issues. Um, yeah, uh, Astrid? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, uh, what we can confirm, and that's what I was going to explain to you, is that there is really a plan uh, since 2000, even maybe before 1999, there is a plan that you can see chronologically with events that is mounting up um, Gavi from a Vaccine Alliance in UNICEF uh, to start joining the United Nations, not only with UNICEF, but with the World Bank and WHO uh, through a financing of this IFFM, the International Financing Facility Immunization. So they did a trio, a triad in 2006, they started. And at the same time, Gavi started to be a global alliance in, France, in Switzerland as a foundation. So they registered in 2006 at the same time as they did a, a triad, a tripartite um, agreement between World Bank, WHO and Gavi to get financing from the member states. You can find this on the, even on, on, on the web. So that was the, the first step. And uh, as you know, 2006, the, the IHR started to be uh, in the implementation phase. And what we can find out is tracking what he's doing is that uh, he started to, um, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll jump to the most important. Um, in 2009, he registered as an international organization in Switzerland of a new type. And we have a press release signed by the Swiss government that shows that it was created specifically for Mr. Bill Gates, this 
um, <laughs> international organization with total immunity. You cannot do anything. You cannot even take him to tribunal. They do their own tribunal. If they have any <laughs> sort of uh, um, disagreement. Um, and from then on, he started, and we have the documents in the WHO logo. <clears throat> you know, they have executive boards. We can find, uh, I found out very lately that we can find out everything on, on the web, so we can find this. And he, they created a decade, 2010, 2020, of the global of vaccine decade. And we, we did the implementation, um, IHR implementation, because you had to teach and train uh, the countries to be prepared. And we finished the first round in 2012, from 2009 to 2012. We received this with Georgetown University, Pretoria University, and I was with University of Geneva. And at that time, when we stopped the round, we got funds again for, from Japan, and suddenly it stopped. And they said, there is no more fund. And we had almost the contract signed. And I found out now that I know why, because in 2012, at the World Health Assembly, uh, it's, they, they did, and they put Bill Gates as the leader of the Global Vaccine Action Plan 2012-2020. So it's beautifully carved. From then on, he was in the driver's seat. Uh, and it's, it's mentioned, you know, the Gavi is the leader of um, most of what is concerning uh, vaccine. And it's not only children like UNICEF anymore, it's the whole world. Uh, so you can see, I mean, if that's enough of a proof <laughs> of at least that there is a plan um, and it keeps on. I mean, he, he is in uh, the stage group, the strategic expert uh, advisory group. And they did even, a, <laughs> it's very funny, it's not funny, but he, uh, they even did in 2016 an assessment report of this uh, 2012, 2020 uh, Global uh, Vaccine Action Plan, GAPC. And um, in 2016, they are very upset because they did not uh, immunize the whole world. So immunization is vaccination and they would take any excuse with vaccination and they don't talk about experimental or or validated that it's all vaccine of course and and in 2016 you can really see that um they're not happy and mr gavi global is saying that um we really have to make an effort so they they have made a program called the accelerator program of vaccine okay so that's at least some of the steps that you can get um very clearly it's all on the web uh, without talking about the financing, <laughs> which I can talk about too. Yeah. Mr. What happened? Who, who received basically diplomatic immunity in 2009? Was it Gavi or was it Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or was it uh, Bill Gates personally or all of them? No, it's, it's really Gavi um, Alliance uh, Foundation, but they took away the name foundation and in the agreement, it's really uh, Gavi, the Global Alliance mm -hmm. for Vaccination. Um, yeah, I can find the exact term in my paper, mm -hmm. but um, you know, it, it's really it concerns really him. The, the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are rather what I find out more and more is that they are more the financial mechanism of uh, funding or receiving funds for programs. And I, I found out again that the Swiss government, Swiss Medic, this is the FDA of Switzerland, has signed an agreement to, um, <clears throat> it's in 2020 to 2023, to um, provide to the Bill and Melinda Gates $900,000 uh, in three years, so 300000 every year, uh, for his program. Uh, project and you cannot see in the paper you have to go and look at the project and i did not go but it concerns the vaccine so mm -hmm. i'm i'm suspecting that when we take a model like switzerland or like uh, sylvia said about mechanics between the national and international health regulation it's been applied like a model everywhere in the world that the law on epidemics of a national country um is binding to international health regulation. We found that in Switzerland, even the constitution of Switzerland has a little line they have added without asking us, um, which says that 
uh, international uh, law supersedes national law yeah. uh, in the health matters. Mm -hmm. And then you can see that in the law of epidemic that was passed in 2016. In, so probably in all countries we check, we should check. And I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, we saw that in Canada, that there is um, a law of epidemics, a law of emergency law that says to the country they will obey to the international health regulation. And so if a fake is, is declared, public health emergency of international concern, every country has to put and trigger immediately the mechanism of obeying. And that's what explains why when in, in, on 16th, 17th of March or in this area, the whole world locked down because this is uncomprehensible according to the international health regulation. And according to the strides cov one, it never happened like this ever, that suddenly the virus was everywhere. <laughs> and it's what's happening with Omicron too, you know, it, it starts in South Africa and the next day it's, it's, in, it's all over the world. Yeah, but um, is there any, as far as the international health regulations are concerned, Sylvia and Astrid, is there any democratic legitimacy to these health, international health regulations? Has anyone who invented these international health regulations been uh, voted into some office? Is there any, any democratic legitimacy to this? Or is this just a private enterprise by people who control the World Health Organization? Um, I, I can answer first and then Sylvia, you can, uh, you know, uh, fill in. Uh, what, when we were teaching and training um, about the international health regulation, it was the question that came very often in, how come this is binding to member states? And it was an extraordinary answer, which will explain to you how important it is to look at this new pandemic treaty now. It's that WHO, I, I have looked and looked, it is for, for the moment the only United Nations specialized program or an agency who has a constitution. So WHO constitution, not convention, constitution, article 21, 19, uh, 21A and, and 2 are binding member states directly if they adopt the international health regulation. So they don't need to go through the whole procedure of a treaty they can, and that's why it's very dangerous. This WHO constitution is like if it was planned to supersede all constitutions of the world, because why would you use the word constitution? And so the answers of the lawyers from WHO was always, oh, we have adopted it at the General Assembly of 2005 under the WHO constitution, Article 21A and Article 2. Yeah, but the funny thing is, and it's not funny at all, yes. that those people who created the international health regulations have not been voted into their, or have no authority, uh, or is, is there any connection between the member states' people, not their governments, the member states' people, and these international health regulations, or is there only the constitution which they themselves invented? <laughs> so, well, um, let me explain the mechanism of the United Nations, and it's almost with all, it's with all the big agencies like the International Labour Office, the ITU, the telecommunication, for the refugee. Every year, <clears throat> you have a World Assembly with like an NGO, like, you know, a World Health Assembly every year takes place in the United Nations in Geneva uh, in May, it's the third week of May, where all member states have their little seat and they are all together and they have an agenda and they decide about the agenda of the world together. So this explains, and but normally, it, if there is a big decision they are just children of the United Nations General Assembly, so they should go up to the General Assembly and it has to get the blessing of the Secretary General, which is the head of the United Nations, which should give a blessing to WHO. I don't see this in the case of international health regulation, if that's a piece, um, a clue. Well, 
Well, I, I just add to this that uh, the international health regulations, because we started with 1815 something <laughs> uh, some hours ago, and um, these, uh, it's, it's a very interesting regime because it's an international treaty that dates back to the sanitary conventions from 1850. Um, so it's one of the oldest international legal regimes which were taken over to WHO and which were recognized under the WHO constitution because they already had in mind, and that's very true, they had in mind that they wanted to have a regulatory fast track regime. So they, they had this um, um, regulatory process that says uh, under the regulations for sanitary laws, which is now pandemic laws, uh, you could refer to, um, you have uh, the member states need to opt out um, and not opt in. So uh, by the resolution that is passed, the international treaty has to enter into force um, uh, in the member state, otherwise it has to opt out uh, on purpose. So it's the reverse process of international law and that's a very unique thing and I think no other international organization or I found no other international organization having this capacity. So, but what they did uh, it, it's democratic because uh, it was an intergovernmental negotiation process. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that only because of the emergence of SARS, they had this new um, ideology adapted of the global health security idea that not the endemic diseases are devastating to the people, but only new diseases that have no medical treatment. So they inserted this new concept in the old laws that were ever existent at WHO and ever existent in the world. Uh, so they uh, adopted this totally new uh, um, yeah, ideology, and that's the very, very striking thing uh, we have now. And it's passed uh, as a resolution. And the interesting thing is that it's an international treaty, and WHO is not a party, it's only bound by the resolution. Whereas other international treaties, like the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the WHO is a signatory. So that's an international law, a bit tricky. I still don't understand. I, I don't see any connection between myself, my countrymen, and these international health regulations. That's I, a problem of international law. It, That's well, we well, not all, really. We not really. <laughs> I, I think this is this is this is quite unique, because, because member states have adopted. Me member states give give their uh, consent in the re in in 2005. They all said they wanted to have this new kind of rules for international law and now they are obliged to implement it nationally or since 2007 uh, it entered into force and they are obliged to to implement it and for example Austria I'm from living in Austria we have no emergency clause in our constitution and we did not adopt our sanitary laws our epidemiology laws uh, there is no clause um, of emergency and we still have the same regime so that's what I always say Whatever legal regime and whatever constitution uh, countries have, obviously the system can impact any country and any constitutional system and any legal regime. It's possible with or without emergency clauses, they apply emergency rules. That's what I can see, at least that's my opinion. Yeah. It's the same with the Millennium Development Goal and the uh uh, sustainable development goals, which seem to match, you know, 2000 to 2015, 2015 to 2030, the sustainable development goal, they did, they're doing a whole mechanism around this, and it becomes more and more obscure, and it is more and more obscure how much us as citizens really decide, and we don't decide anything anymore, because it becomes so complex and, and obscure. We definitely have to take our sovereignty back. That is the conclusion that I draw from this. Uh, because even if the EU wants to come up with uh, a new law, for example, they can decide that they want to introduce these laws. But unless the member states ratify it in their own countries, it doesn't become law in their countries. So this is quite surprising to me, and I think to many lawyers who should know about these things as well. This is very disturbing, I think. 
Yeah, and the, and the EU has uh, created this HERA agency, mm -hmm. which is the same, uh, but probably much more coercive. Um, and uh, that's that's a huge, huge problem. And they have no authority the, uh, in health matters, but they still pretend to have it and still create the agencies and instruct on us without democratic processes. And yeah, Hera, I think that mm -hmm, HERA stands for uh, Health Emergency Health. Response Agency, right? Yeah. And yeah. isn't there a rumor that if our national member state governments in the EU collapse, then they're going to take over and under the EU Commission, there will be a kind of a mini world government? Is, does that sound like, does it sound plausible? I have no idea, but I'm sure they would love to. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's the, that's the idea of this pandemic treaty. Because this pandemic treaty has articles at the end who say that uh, with the constitution of WHO, we don't need any other constitution as huh. member states. And not only do they diminish the power of member states, which is why what is a United Nation, but they have invited a whole lot of non-state actors, they call it, uh, NGOs, Gavi, uh, intergovernmental. Uh, he means he's an NGO, international organization, because he can use many, you know, things. The Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates might be an NGO, and then they make different things. The Rockefeller Foundation. I've met them in WHO. They they come and sit in meetings, and you know, they are NGO. We don't know what they are. So the non-state actors are, are also invited in this new treaty which would take over, literally, through WHO constitution, a world constitution, because of pandemic. So ultimately, <laughs> what we're looking at is private associations, private individuals even, taking because over our national governments through the World Health Organization, using health as a crowbar to do whatever they want. Yeah, we could say that because the public-private uh, partnership has has been, you can see it through the financing because the, the I mean, Gavi and uh, private partners have started to invade and interfere the whole United Nation. I, I actually looked into this because um, I, I was called to organize for the, you know, Switzerland joining the United Nation, uh, the whole United Nation open days for two days, etc. So I, I learned a lot of organization that nobody hears about and one, it's really a private entity called the UN Global Impact Compact. Mm. And this United Nations Global Compact is only private sector. And they can, for example, finance. Uh, they, they, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's open to partnerships. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's and, what and, also, I, and just to add on this, also the implementation of the inter international health regulations, it's very strange because it's done by joint external evaluations undertaken by the Global Health Security Agenda. And if you look up the, the page of the website of the Global Health Security Agenda, it says it has a, a, a private consortium and you don't know, you have no information which private consortium this is, but you know that these external evaluators go to Germany, go to every country, uh, it's even on the website of the RKE uh, and, and uh, plausing how, how great it is, but they don't say it's uh, implemented by private uh, entities. You don't know. So I don't, have, I don't want to have laws implemented um, by private entities. That's absolutely undemocratic. And they are very proud of it. <laughs> They're very proud of it. That's bizarre. I am to understand well, there's uh, private advisors that I'm working also with the WHO, like uh, um, Mackenzie and uh, Accenture. Uh, they, they are the arm of the Bill Gates Foundation also. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I've, I've actually looked uh, for the link uh, Mackenzie and WHO because we know that they are uh, creating the communication. And I think um, they have been uh, putting it under something they're setting up now, an intergovernmental uh, panel, what is the exact title, uh, intergovernmental panel uh, for this treaty, of, for negotiating, intergovernmental negotiating uh, network, something like that. So, so this is just happening, it just happened at the, the, the executive board, 
So um, it is a bit worrying because you think that, and I think that all those communication agencies are, are buried into that. They're not only one. So what is this treaty adding to the situation that we have right now? Well, the, the treaty is very mythical. I just hear the legal counsel, the, the former legal counsel of WHO speaking about it. It's available on the internet. Uh, and it's it's very political. It's uh, it's probably the, the most fierce proponent is Charles Michel. He suggested this treaty. Uh, the European Union wants this treaty. The US is uh, kind of opposed to it. They made a proposal that uh, um, the IHR should be strengthened. So the problem will be a due track um, world because if they are rushing into a treaty, only a small number of signatories will sign and the IHR is a universally acknowledged tool and we did not mention that it would actually have good aspects in it which are neglected and infringed. Uh, it has a, a human rights implementation clause which is not respected, absolutely violated. Um, so there were compromise deals uh, at the end uh, when they passed through the resolution uh, but it's just that they are not mentioned and, and nobody does no court, uh, which would, uh, you know, find a violation of this. So the problem is uh, what they would like to do is to have an upstream and a downstream of um, uh, pharmaceutical um, industry, probably, because it's not even clear the scope of the treaty. Not even this is clear. Uh, the only thing uh, is that there's a lot of um, communication about it. Uh, the director general um, is, is this a very uh, a huge proponent of this treaty because he's very political um, in a way. Uh, and uh, it's it's very, very strange um, uh, what kind of intentions are behind that. And it's called for preparedness and response. So what we know is that they uh, invented a new procedure, which is also problematic. It's called WHO emergency use authorization. That's where a huge mm -hmm. company, big pharma, can go to WHO, say, I'm inventing a new pharmaceutical for or a new diagnostic set for this kind of disease, for this public health emergency, and we would like that you put it on our list. And then WHO puts it puts it on the list and has a disclaimer uh, disclaiming that there's no warranty and no uh, endorsement of WHO. And if somebody dies, uh, it's not WHO fault, it's only a list. And then Gavi takes this list and says, oh, we can export it to the entire world even if we don't have stringent uh, and very competent um, medical authorities. We have this listing of WHO and now we can contribute it to the world. That's what they do uh, in the treaties of Gavi and, and this vaccine alliance, this um, um, uh, COVAX facility, it's called, uh, the third pillar of this ACT accelerator. Um, so, and they probably would like to uh, find better regulatory ways that it's, it becomes a normal process that big pharma goes to an international organization, but then actually it's a treaty of international, of private international law, not of public international law. Uh, because the problem of customer international law is not recognized. Um, it's, it's use Kogans, that means it's, it's a norm which you cannot derogate from, that there are no medical treatments whatsoever uh, without probably uh, without your consent. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's a huge problem. So we've learned tonight from all of the other experts, um, including, of course, the three experts who testified um, at the beginning of this session, that, for example, in the UK, healthcare has been largely privatized. It's being controlled by private groups, private charities even. Um, we've learned that through this privatized, um, uh, even their psychiatric system has been privatized. There's private people behind all of this, and this is how they control everything. They even create their own future leaders next to what the, um, what the World Economic Forum is doing, meaning they have their own people who they then seem to be telling what to do in uh, positions of, um, well, of power in the governments. Now, if I look at the WHO, there's uh, a man by the name of Tedros. He's the director general. 
Who is he? I have uh, read. I have uh, read in the papers that in his own country, uh, people are, um, and and a, a criminal complaint has been filed against him for genocide. Is that the typical, let's say, puppet that the private entities who are running the healthcare show are using in order to further their aims? Um, no, I have, I, I must say, I have never seen a director general like that. I've known many, but uh, this, uh, I know also from inside that um, the staff was very unhappy with him and they asked for his resignation and of course it never happened. Uh -huh. So, yeah, and another scoop, if I did not say this already, <laughs> is that uh, on the board of Gavi, foundation, you can see the names of uh, people who have been part of Gavi. Well, Tedros has been part of Gavi before he was uh, elected director general, conflict of interest. Oh. And so he was on the board between, uh, I wrote it here, uh, 22 January 2009 and September 2011. And he, that's one of them. And the other person, conflict of interest, the president of Ireland, who was at the head of the Human Rights Commission, uh, and I know her, but uh, I'm very surprised that she was there with president with signature even of Gavi uh, from uh, November 2008 to uh, no, November 2008 to the September 2011. I can give you the papers, no problem. You know, it's very precise. 25 November 2008 to 14th of September 2011. So you see that the and there are many names that I don't know. And I'm sure you will find there many names that you can maybe find in your countries too, because there are country representatives that are in Gavi before uh, they were even in position. So for, it's clear that he was already uh, entangled with Bill Gates. So wherever you look, you see conflicts of inter interest. Uh, Debbie and Anna have their hands up. Yes. Um, I check to see which countries are members of the WHO. Are you, it, I, I see many, many, many. I, in fact, I'm, I don't see any I don't recognize. Are there any countries, 194, are there any countries that are not members of WHO? Um, at the moment, I think the US, oh no, they came back, okay. Um, no, the Vatican is an observer in the United Nations, as you might know or not. And that's also a topic I wanted to uh, talk about when you talk about the values, religion, psychop. <laughs> um, yeah, so they are, they are observers and they're everywhere. <laughs> the, the other religions are in general at the World Council of Churches, uh, right in front of the big building that Bill Gates has been building with our Swiss money <laughs> in uh, in three years. I mean, it, it's, it's been, um, you have to know this. Uh, oh, no, that was a question, so I answered, <laughs> right. So so there Sorry. there are no countries that are not members. The Vatican might be a, a, an observer, observer, but it's not a member. But no, I, no. Uh -huh. I, I don't know of any. Uh, Sylvia, would you say? I, I, I even thought there was 196. So I, uh, it's, you're, you're muted, Sylvia. <laughs> so it's 196 to the international health regulations because the Vatican and Liechtenstein, um, uh, they are not WHO members, uh, but they are they are member to the, the signatory to the international health regulations. <laughs> Debbie has but has her hand up. I, I would just want to add something that might be interesting legally. Um, there are in the annex in the notes at the end of this international health regulation of 2005, two countries who made reservations that they don't agree with that uh, completely because they want to apply uh, their global security nationally. And you would guess who it is, it's the US and Iran. Uh -huh. So it's interesting to see that a two countries have managed to put a reservation to this. Mm -hmm. How come the others haven't? Or mm -hmm. no? It's because their people haven't spoken, but they will. Debbie. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention very quickly when you mentioned about the UK, um, we've also got a serious issue going on here with the unvaccinated in that anybody that seems to be admitted to hospital with a COVID-19 positive seemed or would appear to be put on an end of life, an accelerated end of life care plan. 
and patients seem to be giving uh, they're being given midazolam and morphine um, and this is without their consent this is without their family's consent these decisions are made by the clinicians alone and the families and the patient doesn't have any say in it at all so I just want to, to, to be sure to include the victims um, of this absolute disaster um, that are unvaccinated and also just to bring your attention to CEPI. CEPI was founded in 2017 and CEPI and Gavi work very closely together, in fact financially very closely together. And when CEPI was launched in 2017, Bill Gates at the World Economic Forum launch um, said that basically they would be cutting out the safety with regards to clinical trials it would just be and he, he said it straight out and it was actually featured on UK column news but Bill Gates said that the safety data and manufacturing would be cut out which would enable the 100 day mission to go ahead to have vaccines rolled out within 100 days of the World Health Organization declaring um, a pandemic so I just wanted to mention that and also um, with regards to Whitney earlier talking about DARPA, we have our very own um, kind of diluted DARPA, if you like. We have ARPA, but we also have Welcome Leap, which Whitney has got a lot of information about when it comes to bioweapons and making of bio, biochemicals. Um, and also, I just want to go back to the patent as well, because the Rothschild's patent of 2015, if you look at the full paper, everything that we're seeing today was put into that. And it was approved in 220, but it was given priority in 215. So it was written in 215. And what we're seeing now is everything within that patent. So that together with SPARS pandemic and SPARS pandemic 2025 to 2028 was a coronavirus. And some of the, um, uh, some of the names are the same as in the John Hopkins futuristic scenario like Coravax. So there's an awful lot of similarities there. And I know that we've been talking, you've been talking about lockstep. But I just want to just re-remind people that SPARS pandemic 2025 to 2028 gives a month by month breakdown. And if you look at when we first started in, in the March, when we had the first case in our country anyway, or in December in Wuhan, it literally goes month by month. So the prediction going forward would appear to be antimicrobial resistance, which is already what is written in SPARS. And we're finding many people in this country not uh, being able to access antibiotics and GPs and physicians here not wanting to give antibiotics. So I just, just wanted to throw that in. Thank you. So we do have uh, lots of reason to worry about our sovereignty. One of the, not the least of one, is the World Health Organization's international health regulations. That seems to be the overarching theme. This is how, through their constitution and through the revision, through the revised uh, international health regulations, they seem to be trying to gain control over the rest of the world, including, of course, all the member, the 196 member states. Is this a correct assessment? Yeah, at least I, I think uh, because in the first part of my uh, expertise, I, 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 I stressed that the military aspects uh, were included in this agenda, but would, were not named. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why we have now a kind of pandemic response, which is not medical, which is unproportionate and political and we do not realize it um, because they included this bioterrorist scenario and they adapted the language to global health security. That's also with the Center for uh, Civilian uh, Biodefense also uh, at, at the time at Dark Winter, it was called Johns Hopkins Global Health Security Center was called Center for Civilian Biodefense, I think was the correct name. And they had also a journal called um, Bioterrorism or Biodefense and now it's called global health security. So we should not forget about that a bio war could go on at least. Um, so it's much more political as the politicians would um, themselves 
Agree. Mm -hmm. um, I will add two points. Is is uh, one we should worry about the whole United Nation because the Sustainable Development Goals are 17 goals and 169 targets. It's the Agenda 2030, and it is all entangled, uh, especially with the climate change, for example. But there are many other mechanisms under that have to be looked at. The second, um, the I mean, such as the UN Alliance for SDG financing. I mean, what is this? I, I'm finding, you know, when you dig, you find a lot of things very mysterious that we have to find out. But the other one that might interest you is um, remember that um, pandemic or epidemic or public health emergency of international concern has four typologies. That's what I was taking care of the case studies, and it was very important to distinguish. And that's what we should do with what's going on now because we're all focused on the biological factor. But in fact, the first one is infectious biology. The second is foodborne biology. And there's a whole organization behind called InfoSan. The third is chemical. And uh, chemical is mercury, uh, can be um, metal, uh, et cetera. And there was one expert, Kerstin Gutschmidt, a, a German that I was inviting, and he was always making very they're great reports, but very difficult to find the experts there. And the fourth, which is very important, and you will see why, is radionuclear, radiation. And um, that's even more difficult to find experts. And I re realized this because in our courses, we were inviting people uh, who are taking care of this. It is the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, based in Vienna. And they are experts on radionuclear, Chernobyl, Fukushima. They are the first on, in line there. And what I was shocked about is when we were doing the case studies of Fukushima, um, uh, we, we asked, so what did WHO do? And they said, no, WHO was not um, allowed to access Fukushima. They were refused the visa because the first one to be there is the IAEA. International Atomic Energy Agency. And what is very str strange is, is that they have an, uh, I don't know if uh, agreement or anyway, a, a written statement, which gives them power over WHO. So I went to look at what they're doing now with COVID just today. So I'm very happy to tell you, or very scared to tell you that they are in charge of the RT-PCR kit. And I can, and I can, it's, it's a crazy, and actually to know, just before I say how they have uh, presented this, is they are independent from the United Nation. They have their own international treaty, and they report to the UN General Assembly and to the Social Security Council every year. So this is for nuke, it's for radionuclear threats, which could kill the whole planet. So um, they say, that um, the IAEA has developed a nuclear-derived diagnostic technology that can help detect and identify COVID or anything else in hours, in humans and in animals, uh, because animals is treated by veterinary and by FAO, the Food uh, Administration Organization. And um, they have uh, developed this test, and this test, is um, very efficient, the RT-PCR, because it's polymerized chain reaction and rapid test. They think they are the experts. And, and that um, especially for Ebola, Zika, and the African swine fever virus. So this is just today. I read this, and for me, it rings a bell because they are, uh, they are offering now the test uh, kit, a PCR test kit and their lab. So they're linked to labs. And we were talking that that's where the power lies and where things have to be, I think, looked at closer. I don't know what you think, Sylvia, but that's a bit worrying. <laughs> you mean other private organizations or half private or most of these organizations which we spoke about tonight, pretty much all of the international organizations are more or less controlled by private citizens by private groups charities etc so this harkens back to the theme which we 
heard about first today about how the city of London, basically, uh, big finance is controlling everything through their uh, emissaries, their private people trying to gain control over the rest of the world. Again, we have to take back our sovereignty. That is what, what all of this tells me right now. And also, we have to take a much closer look at PCR testing, which we will do tomorrow in tomorrow's session. And, um, and maybe also look at all the NGOs, because uh, in, in WHO, there's the World Alliance of Hospitals, the World Alliance of the Alliances of Alliances. And a lot of <laughs> British people are, are in charge. and. You have to also know that a lot of military are there because the CDC in, in the US uh, was formerly military, and I think it still is, by the way. So um, we have to, I think, disentangle those gong, those Wongo, it's the world NGOs, mm -hmm. or the bingo, the business interested mm -hmm. NGOs, because there are the mechanisms where it's very difficult to, to find them, and they have a lot of power, more than we think. The people have to learn that they have to disconnect and look into look start grassroots democracy look into their regions and their communities they know best what's good for them um it is very late already um i know that deepali is a few hours ahead of us uh, three or four hours right deepali yes four and a half oh my god um um, it's been a very long day, and uh, unless there are any further questions, I think we should um, close this session for tonight. Yes, go ahead, Dexter, please. Yeah. I just want to talk about, uh, uh, Dr. Sylvia, you were mentioning uh, global health security, and I would like you to perhaps maybe just put it in perspective when it comes to the definition changes from the World Health Organization in 2009. Um, well, you mean that you refer to this pan, to the search pandemic. for the pandemic criteria? That's correct. Well, yes. yeah, my well, um, my, <laughs> my personal view is that they they just realized WHO realized they don't need a pandemic definition anymore because everything that is needed is, is a fake a public health emergency of international concern because they want to manufacture vaccines and it doesn't matter how the pandemic is defined in non-legal uh, documents. Uh, so they actually um, uh, alleviated um, the, the, the very high threshold because they realized they can uh, at any time make a public health emergency as long as international spread and as long as they have diagnostics. Uh, so they focused uh, no attention to this uh, theme, I think. And that's our problem. And, and also the lawyers are always looking for this pandemic definition, but it, it, it's, there are no legal consequences linked to the, the definition of a pandemic, but there's a huge uh, legal consequence if you proclaim, if the director general um, takes this authority and proclaims a public health emergency of international concern. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, does it explain perhaps why they used uh, the models of uh, Sir Ferguson to, uh, to increase the fear and uh, explain that there is a pandemic because uh, uh, with the epidemiology and mathematics that they used and that is not useful, it's wrongly used to, uh, to study the spread of the virus. They use this synthetic information from from these models, perhaps, because um, it's, it seems very strange that they use the models of Sir Ferguson that that doesn't work at all, and uh, that was uh, these models were uh, duplicated in other countries, like in France, for example, and we took uh, this for. Uh, granted, and uh, it's not um, <clears throat> based on experience and medicine at all. It's only um, mathematics, and uh, it's uh, it's it's we, we can't use that at all. But I, I would like to know if it's for this reason that who has um, um, used these models uh, to increase uh, uh, the fear of the pandemic and. Uh, and to mass manipulate. 
Uh, I don't know any specifics about it because actually they had everything they needed to proclaim a public health emergency and the, the national governments um, needed to to the population that they would go along I guess so they needed it for the population because there was also the, the first uh, fake declared in 2009 uh, where the vaccines were manufactured but nobody was threatened at least I was not threatened by this fake because there was no media releases uh, that threatened us but now they needed the population to stay at home during the lockdowns and to to get the vaccine in the end that's my personal explanation Astrid I don't know yes because yeah. from, from the, 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 the model of uh, Sir Ferguson uh, the only solution was vaccines and um, no treatment at all mm -hmm. only vaccines um, but I, I could just add that there are many definitions uh, of scientific definition. They have changed, not only pandemic. They have changed the definition of health professionals. It's everybody. They have changed data privacy. There is no data privacy anymore. Uh, they have uh, not made ethics. Uh, for example, in communication in the International Health Regulation uh, Implementation Course, and it is a, it's, it, it's, you have to do it, it's, it's to um, reassure people uh, reassure people that we don't know, we are looking for something, uh, you will be, uh, you, will, you, will, you will know what is going on and, and step by step you keep people informed and there it was fear right away. And, and not only this was a psychological operation for that fear, that constant fear with cases, with images, with uh, deaths that were not deaths because we know today there is not more mortality in 2020. But also with contradictions, it was said before, and this is in um, Melanie Klein psychology, you make psychotic people and children when you say, I love you, but I hate you, and you push, or you say, I love you, and I hate you uh, mm -hmm. at the same time with behavior. So they made a, a very um, crazy uh, non-sense of coherence, no control, no sense of control. It's also another concept in psychology. And they made people totally insecure, which diminishes their immunity by the way. What they also did psychologically, they took away all the religions and all the belief system. And this is something that keeps people up and they censored religion, they censored death, they, they, <laughs> they forbid the ritual of death, which is one of the most important ritual if you want to have a good uh, grief uh, development, um, I mean, uh, coherence and, and healing. So there are many things they have done, uh, not just um, you know, this manipulation. Uh, I don't know Sir Ferguson a bit. I think, there, and there, I could just add one more. They reversed completely the values. And this is a bit of the, um, this Melanie Klein psychotic, you know, it's, I, I call it the Hansel and Gretel um, syndrome <laughs> because uh, I love you, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to, you know, uh, I'll be ethical. We're going to treat you well with the vaccine and they're killing them. And this is, they have uh, absolutely abrogated ethics research um, guidelines that we developed in 2006 to 2009, and I was involved in that. So all the values is also a psychop. They have changed the values and the definitions. Uh, with regard for certain, to this is not about health. <laughs> the World uh, Health Disease Organization. Professor Ferguson, if I could just clarify, Professor Ferguson, in 2002, he modelled um, 50,000 deaths would happen in the UK from mad cow disease and he modelled it completely incorrectly where we saw the burning of all of our cattle for 150 deaths so he was very incorrect and, and we were very surprised in the UK when we'd found out that Neil Ferguson was responsible for the modelling of this pandemic because he was so incorrect in the last one. He also hit the headlines a number of times and had to resign from his uh, post in SAGE because he was caught breaking lockdown rules. I just wanted to add that about Professor Ferguson. So the big mm. question is, how Thank come you. he's still in office? That's a really good question um, and I can't answer that one, I'm afraid, but he shouldn't be. He shouldn't be. Conflict of interest. Yeah. Absolutely. Or a nepotism. I mean, the, the, the he, he works very closely with Saudi as well. Um, I forgot, I'll find out the name of, I, I can't actually read it to pronounce it, but he works very, Imperial College um, have the largest alumni of Chinese. Chinese. Um, when President Xi came on his state visit, 
Um, the only university that he visited was Imperial. Imperial have huge Chinese ties and they've also taken over a number of our hospitals so that we have now an Imperial NHS Trust. So Imperial, I mean, I could go on for hours about Imperial and Professor Alice Garst, who was, who's the president of Imperial, who gave a lecture based on 1984, George Orwell, 1984. So there's an awful lot going on at an Imperial and I could, do a, I could do a lot more about an Imperial, but Professor Ferguson was discredited back in 2002 uh, for mad cow disease and just wanted to throw that in. Thank you. It, it is it is astonishing indeed how many people who are completely incompetent at what they're doing. One of them being uh, the person who runs the EU Commission. She failed at every single job she's ever held. It's a, it's incredible how many completely incompetent people are kept in office, obviously by the people who put them there those super rich people who somehow seem to be fueled and uh, uh, kept alive through the city of London and its uh, fifth columns that seem to be everywhere in the world. We will have to take closer looks into all of these occurrences. Yep. Okay. I, I would just add one thing is we were talking of Mackenzie and uh, yeah. von der Leyen's uh, son is working for Mackenzie uh, and the son of Fabius in France is working for Mackenzie. And you know the nepotism, or yeah. it's, it's a term used in, in popes. <laughs> because they, yes, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's, 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 it's also has a problem when she was a uh, minister of defense in Germany, I yeah. think. And also when she was the secretary of, uh, uh, I think, families or something like that. She always had problems, but she was always kept in office. And it was already a problem with the McKenzie contract. Mm -hmm. That is uh, a major, I think uh, McKinsey is a major institution in all of this because we have learned from another expert that Bill Gates is using McKinsey in order to um, uh, make sure that his advisors become the advisors of, for example, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, all the other major political figures through McKinsey, through the network of McKinsey. Yeah, it's amazing that we have exactly the same messages two years ago in the shops and in the airports than now. Really? You know, wash your hands, put the mask. Yeah. I mean, in Europe, at least uh, for those who don't have those measures. Mm -hmm. But uh, and it's the same voice, and it, mm -hmm. it's it's like a marketing agency. Mm -hmm. It is. So this also should be analyzed if it's the same voice everywhere and you know, yeah, something we're, weird. We're looking into that as well. But tonight it's been a very long day and I know that Deepali needs some sleep. We all do. Uh, so unless there's any m more questions that need uh, urgently need to be answered, I think we should uh, close our session for today. And I really want to thank everyone. This has been extremely valuable. Thank you, Astrid. Thank you, Virginie. <laughs> thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Dexter and Anna and Deepali. And of course, thank you, Debbie. Thank you very, very much. Thank One you. big step yeah, forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. See you all tomorrow. Oder nicht?